Uh, councillors, welcome back. Are there any apologies? Councillor Landers. Um, Mr Chair, I advise that Councillor Cunningham will be absent today and I move that she be granted a leave of absence from the meeting. Second. Councillor Landers, would you like to move an apology for both today and tomorrow for Councillor Cunningham? Would that be easier? It will be easier. All right, would you just, just say and... Yep, so I move that she be um, granted yep. leave of absence for tomorrow as well. All right, and... Sorry, second. Uh, it's been moved by Councillor Landers, seconded by Councillor Hutton, that Councillor Cunningham be granted leave of absence from both today's meeting and tomorrow's periods. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Are there any other apologies? Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. Mr Chair, I move that the one resolution of rates and charges, including all provisions and appendices, as set out on pages 181 to 276, Two, the annual plan and budgeted financial statements are set out on pages 9 to 17, comprising of A, summary of recommendations, B, statement of income and expenditure, C, statement of income and expenditure, business and council providers, D, statement of financial position, E, statement of changes in equity, F, statement of cash flows, G, summary of recommendations, long-term financial forecasts, H, statement of financial ratios. In three, revenue policy and review statement are set out on pages 167 to 180, and four, schedules of fees and charges, the register of cost recovery fees, and associated delegations to the Chief Executive Office be noted for later debate and option. May I have a seconder? Second. It's been moved by the Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councillor Landers, that the resolution of rates and charges, including all provisions <coughs> and appendices, are set out on pages 181 to 276. The annual plan and budgeted financial statements are set out on pages 9 through 17, including the summary of recommendations, statement of income and expenditure, st statement of income and expenditure, businesses and council providers, statement of financial position, statement of changes in equity, statement of cash flows, summary of recommendations, long-term financial forecast, statement of financial ratios, and the revenue policy and revenue statement as set out on pages 167 to 180, the schedule of fees and charges, the register of cost recovery fees and associated delegations to the Chief Executive Officer. Be noted for later debate and adoption. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 The contrary, no. The ayes have it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Council is a presentation of the various programs and businesses of council providers will be in accordance with section 74 of the meetings local law 2001. And I would like to point out uh, that I have approved the chief executive officer's request for divisional managers and other relevant officers to be in the chamber as required. Can I please call upon councillor Murphy to present the transport for Brisbane program. <laughs> Mr Chair, I move that for the Transport for Brisbane program, one, that the services of the Council, the allocations for the operations and the projects and the total project expenditure as set out on pages 18 to 28 for the years 2021 to 2022 through to 2024-25 and the allocations for the projects, uh, sorry, and the allocations for the operations and project for the service 1.2.1.2 provide ferry services and maintenance for the year 2025 to 2026 through to 2030 to 31 as set out on page 283 so far as they relate to program one be adopted. Seconded. It's a move by Councillor Murphy, seconded by Councillor Owen, that the Transport for Brisbane program and the services of Council, the allocations for the operations of the projects and total project expenditures set out on pages 18 to 28 for the years 2021, 22 through to 2024, 25, and the allocations for the operation and project for services 1.2.1.2 provide ferry services and maintenance for the years 2025 through 26 through to 2030 31 as set out on pages 283 so far as they relate to program one be adopted is there any debate councillor murphy you have 15 minutes mr chair i stand here today incredibly proud to deliver program one transport for brisbane budget for 2021 to 2022 now brisbane is continuing to grow and evolve with every year that passes our city is taking a new shape with the completion of new infrastructure. And the people of our city are changing too. As a result of coronavirus, we've welcomed new residents from interstate who've chosen to call Brisbane their new home. More and more people are embracing clean and green forms of travel like e-scooters and e-bikes, or cycling, walking and public transport. 
The Schrinna Council is leading the charge on initiatives and infrastructure that will create a better Brisbane for all. The Program 1 budget for 2021 to 2022 is a $520 million investment that will keep Brisbane moving, an investment that will future-proof our city for years to come and prepare us to host the Brisbane Olympic Games in 2032. This budget continues the Schrinner Council's focus on active transport. It delivers the single biggest investment in active transport in our city's history, with the delivery of two new green bridges. As well as that, it provides a record investment in public transport that will expand travel options, enhance the city's bus and ferry networks, and gear up our city for the game-changing Brisbane Metro. And Metro is all about connectivity. The Metro vehicles will operate along dedicated busways from Eight Mile Plains to Roma Street and the Royal Brisbane and Women's Hospital to the University of Queensland. It will target bottlenecks and provide reliable turn-up-and-go services along our city's most popular routes. And it will reduce congestion and free up the bus network, boosting the capacity of the bus bu busway by up to 22,000 people per hour. Metro is about innovation. All-electric, trackless trams, the first of their kind in the Southern Hemisphere. They'll have zero tailpipe emissions, passenger information displays, onboard charging and Wi-Fi, and the capacity to carry over 150 passengers. They'll be powered by 132 kilowatt hour lithium titanate batteries, driving two traction motors, each of 190 kilowatts of power and 2,500 newton metres of torque. Chair, they're so fast that we had to slow them down. <laughs> and speaking of fast, they flash charge in just under six minutes. Chair Metro is about the future. With Brisbane's population continuing to grow, we don't just want Brisbane Metro, we need it. We need to continually expand the city's public transport capacity, and this is what Metro will achieve. In the wake of coronavirus, this project will support 2,600 jobs, including 500 in the financial year ahead. In 2020-21, Brisbane Move Consortium commenced the design phase of the project's major infrastructure works. We completed the Peel Street, Gray Street and Stanley Place intersection upgrade and are days away from finishing the sewer gravity and rising main relocation works as part of early works packages in South Brisbane. Mr Chair, the new budget includes a $218 million investment in the Brisbane Metro project. Later this year, we'll start work to bore the tunnel underneath Adelaide Street, which will provide a dedicated connection between Victoria Bridge and the Inner Northern Busway and the King George Square Station. We'll also get underway with construction later this year at the Metro Depot in Rochdale, work that will support up to 170 jobs over two years. Construction of the Countess Street end of uh, route charging facility will start and the program of South Brisbane Early Works will finish. The pilot vehicle will arrive on our shores in early to mid-2022 and will then commence testing of the vehicle here in Brisbane. We'll continue work to finalise the designs for the Cultural Centre Station, Victoria Bridge, North Quay and other key infrastructure charging sites. Chair, there's never been a more exciting time for public transport in Brisbane and Brisbane Metro is part of our city's transition to become a public transport powerhouse. Yeah. Now, there's nothing more iconic to our city than the Brisbane River and we stand united here in this chamber in our love for the brown snake. It also divides our city north and south. That's why the Lord Mayor set out a 10-year vision for five new green bridges, to link communities and businesses, to connect people to public transport, to allow them to access river walks and bikeways that would otherwise be tens of kilometres apart. Next year alone, the Schrinner Council will invest $60 million to start construction of the first two bridges in this 10-year program, the Kangaroo Point Green Bridge and the Breakfast Creek Green Bridge. Now, this is a real investment that will see construction commence in the 2021 to 22 financial year. Excitingly, the Kangaroo Point Green Bridge also has an opportunity to incorporate a commercial offering, which could see a new restaurant, cafe or event space with one of the most unique vantage points in our city. The budget also progresses business cases for Tawong and St Lucia to West End Green Bridges after extensive community consultation identified the preferred alignments. We know that completed business cases allow us to pursue funding at state and federal levels, and given our strong track record of attracting grant funding, we're confident we'll achieve this. These green bridges won't just be iconic infrastructure for our city, but they'll also help ease congestion, cut commute times and support economic activity, including the urban freight task.
While we're working on new ways for people to cross the Brisbane River, we're also investing in infrastructure that allows them to travel along the river. More than $70 million over four years of this budget will be invested in upgrading our network of ferry terminals to make sure that they're accessible for all, that they're modern and safe, and that they can keep up with the demands of a growing city. This year, uh, we'll be completing a ferry terminal to allow more people to enjoy themselves at one of this administration's iconic <laughs> developments, Howard Smith Wharves. Another visitor hotspot along the river is South Bank. That's right, Lord Mayor. Uh, one of the busiest ferry terminals that's been hardworking since 1996. And as you walk along Victoria Bridge, you can see the barges at work to remove the old terminals and make room for the new ones. The upgrade will see a consolidation of the two terminals into one modern terminal, up to the job of being accessible and safe for all, and handling the crowds which board and disembark South Bank each day. Local suppliers have been subcontracted to fabricate both terminals, with a total of 105 local jobs su supported throughout the project. The pontoon, the gangways, the elevated walkway structures are being fabricated locally in Carroll Park. Uh, and Hemant by Sun Engineering, Transblast and Precast Concrete. There's more good news in this budget. Um, in the upcoming year, we'll see construction start for upgrades to Mowbray Park and Dockside Terminals. And I know that the community have been keen to see these terminals back in action, and this budget will make that possible. In addition to new and improved ferry terminals, it's equally important piece of the puzzle uh, being the vessels themselves. We're well underway with our city cat replacement strategy, Chair, and we have now three next generation city cats on the water, Yugara, Neville Bonner and Me Engine 2. Our 22 modern and sleek double-decker double -decker city cats are progressively replacing older generation one vessels, two of which were replaced in 2020 to 21. Construction of City Cat 25 is underway as we speak and will be ready to launch on the river in the second half of 2021. We're also expecting CityCat 26 to launch in the next financial year and to start construction on CityCat 27. What's more, these vessels are built right here in Brisbane. Oz Ships in Murray is making them, and we're extremely proud of that fact. Brisbane knowledge and know-how is going into each and every next generation CityCat. Now, the City Cats are Brisbane icons, Chair, but it's the monohull ferries that have an even richer history on our river. We're excited to be restoring three of the much-loved monohull ferries and returning them to the river so that they can continue to serve ferry patrons for many years to come. After careful consideration of the business case, we've made the decision to restore the steel-hulled ferry Calparin <clears throat> and two of the wooden-hulled ferries John Oxley and either Lucinda or Bulimba. Just over $4 million across two years will fund the restoration work, with one ferry expected to be restored in the next financial year. Restoring a monohull is similar to fixing up a vintage vehicle or a historic building. It will take time and careful management. We look forward to these three vessels operating alongside the Kitty Cat fleet in the coming years. Mr Chair, while Metro, the new City Cats and Ferry Restoration are certainly the main attractions in this new budget, our investment in public transport goes far beyond just these highlights. We're proud to be delivering $154 million in public transport subsidy this year that will enable Brisbane residents to use buses and ferries, helping to take cars off the road. The Blue City Glider and the Maroon City Gliders have carried almost 35 million passengers since they commenced, and we look forward to continuing these popular services in the coming years. To expand our bus network, we're also now starting planning work for the potential new city glider service, the Gold City Glider, which would link Hamilton to Woolloongabba via Fortitude Valley and the CBD. And we hope to see the state government support the business case and jointly fund the service. Another highlight in the bus space chair includes our 12-month electric bus trial, which has just launched on the City Loop service and will inform future bus procurement, which will kick off later this year. We're also very glad to be continuing our free off-peak travel for seniors on both buses and ferries to support our most mature go-card users to move around the city and to connect with family and friends. Finally, we'll be getting underway with a ferry network review next month to identify ways that we can improve the ferry network in line with the community's needs and where growth patterns are happening. The first round of citywide consultation will occur in July followed by a second round in August, September 2021, which will inform potential changes to the network. Chair, while I earlier spoke about our City Shaping Green Bridges program, the record spend on active transport continues in this budget. 
uh, and it extends to suburban links and bikeways all across Brisbane. The Active Transport Infrastructure Fund will progress bikeway connections at Kedrenbrook Road in Wilston, at Hanlon Park in Greenslopes, at Yoakum Street in Holland Park West and Hidden World Playground to Bill Brown Reserve in Fitzgibbon. This budget will see the Wakerley Bikeway delivered in partnership with the Federal Government as part of the Chelsea Road and Rickett Road intersection upgrade. And while we know that it's so important to provide safe and efficient active transport infrastructure to get people to mode switch, behaviour change policies are also critical. Active school travel will continue its excellent work and I encourage all councillors to get involved with their local schools and support the community in active travel initiatives. We're aiming to see at least a 10% increase in active travel as a result of schools taking up the program. Implementation of our world first e-mobility strategy will continue as we welcome in the next phase of the scheme with 800 e-bikes joining the now 2,000 e-scooters in July. A focus on safety, accessibility, mobility, agility and infrastructure is the key uh, to making this a success and changing the way we move around our city. So, Mr Chair, I, as I conclude my remarks, it's clear um, with this budget that the Shrina Council is focused on delivering modern public transport services and supporting and encouraging a shift to public and active transport. We show it, Chair, not through words, but actions, and our record investment in this space is there for all to see in this budget. It's part of a legacy of this administration, from Campbell Newman, who pioneered TransApex, to Graham Quirk, who led the way with Metro, and now Lord Mayor Schrinner, who's blazing the path with e-mobility and green bridges. One of the great strengths of this council since 2004 has been to take the community with us on the journey, whether it was through new tunnels, into new forms of public transport, or as it will be in 2023, across new green bridges. We know that we only have the power to deliver on our election commitments because of the strong support within the community that this administration has to keep up its record of transport innovation. From Brisbane Metro to the modern ferry network, our five green bridges to suburban bikeway links, our priorities are abundantly clear. Before I wrap up, there's just a few people I would like to thank. Program one is a big, uh, and complex budget, and many people have worked to make this investment a reality. I'd like to thank Jeff Beck, the Transport for Brisbane Divisional Manager, and Scott Stewart, the Brisbane Infrastructure Divisional Manager, and their budget team, including Marie Gales, Stephen Hammer, Sue Phillips, and Robert Lee. I'd also like to thank the hardworking staff in corporate finance, uh, the finance chair, Councillor Allen, and the staff in the Lord Mayor's office who've worked to help in preparation of this budget. Thank you also uh, to my advisors, Nelson and Georgia, for their efforts to prepare for the budget and to provide numerous workflow improvements. Chair, I believe I'm almost out of time. I want to say that this budget represents a modern, progressive plan for transport in Brisbane, and I'm very proud to commend it to the Chamber. Yeah. Further speakers? Councillor Johnston. Cool. I'll go first. Excellent. Um, thank you so much. I rise to speak on uh, Program 1. Um, look, it was illuminating uh, listening to Councillor Murphy uh, talk about the active and public transport uh, agenda of our city <coughs> at the information request uh, on Monday afternoon. And there are a few things that I would like to uh, put on the record uh, about this government's failure failure to properly resource uh, and build the necessary infrastructure for public and active transport in uh, Brisbane. Uh, firstly, as we know from Councillor Murphy himself, there are only 18 new footpaths being built um, under Council's capital program uh, this year. Now, that's what Councillor Murphy clearly said in answer to the questions on the information uh, papers. Uh, and uh, there's uh, $1.6 million being allocated to the Safer Pathways to School program. Now, he was clearly asked, is that it? Are there others? He clearly said, no, there are not. So there are 18 new footpaths, new footpaths being built. 18 new footpaths being built. Point of order, Chair. Councillors. Point of order, Chair. Yeah. Will Councillor Johnson take Councillor, the question? Uh, no. Point of order, Councillor oh. Murphy. Oh. All right. Councillors, that's enough. That's enough, everybody. Please allow the councillor to be heard. Uh, am I allowed to talk about other programs, Mr Chairman, because I'd be very happy to. 
No, you can only speak about Program 1 and Thank during you. Program 1. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And I will talk about all the programs. Um, but let me be clear. The, the chairperson in charge of public and active transport in his portfolio in Program 1, out of a $3.6 billion budget, is building 18 footpaths at a total value of $1.6 million. That is disgraceful. Um, there is a massive deficit of new footpaths uh, in the city, and there is a massive problem uh, with the remediation of footpaths, but that is in another program, and I will get to it there. Um, so uh, I am very concerned that Council's not investing enough. There is one, it's a miracle, there is one in Tennyson Ward, um, which hopefully will go along Waratah Street to Graceville State School. If the Waratah Street residents don't want it, there are several other options leading to the back of the school where it would be really important. So I look forward to seeing that delivered. Uh, we also, I also asked questions about the Metro, and uh, certainly um, I was very concerned to hear that the review of the bus services timetable, which uh, has been flagged uh, as having massive changes and cuts <laughs> under the Brisbane Metro program, uh, that is ongoing. That was the answer we got from Councillor Murphy uh, at information sessions. It will be ongoing. Uh, so, look, I'll just say this. Um, if you are making uh, some sort of planning decisions behind the, uh, behind the scenes, you're talking to TransLink behind the scenes about what bus services are going to be cut or what bus services are going to be truncated as part of the Metro uh, overall program, tell us. Tell our community. The last time that Council did a review of the bus network in 2011, um, they botched it. And I lost bus services in my ward. The 101 was cut, the 102 was cut, the frequency of the 104 was cut, and the frequency of the one going over Highgate Hill, whose number I can't remember, was cut uh, back as well. So I am very concerned, based on the track record of this administration, um, that we will see massive changes to um, bus services in suburban areas as a result of the Metro project. And this administration is undertaking ongoing work about this and not telling the community what they are doing. In my view, that is inappropriate. They need to be having an open discussion with our community about bus services, because there is something good in this program, and that certainly is supporting, continuing to support off-peak travel uh, for seniors on our buses and ferries. Um, and that is a good program. It's a very good initiative. I mean, I think they should have the courage to just maybe make it free for the seniors altogether, but um, off-peak is a very good start. But I can tell you the people who will be most adversely impacted by changes to the bus network uh, are, the, um, uh, are the seniors uh, who rely on buses to uh, get to and from uh, their appointments, their services, uh, and all of the initiatives um, that they uh, have to get to. So I'm very concerned about that. I'm also concerned about last year's um, program as well. So far, Council has failed to deliver on the budgeted item in my area, which was for a refuge uh, at, um, on Avenue at Chelmer. I've been asking for months from the officers. They've indicated to me that it's going to cost a little bit more than it would be uh, that was budgeted, which was $120 million. This is for a precast bit of concrete in the road and two ramps. Um, but apparently there are a lot of services that are impacted. I, again, I don't know how when we're just building a little bit of concrete ramps. and So anyway, um, they indicated they needed more money. I've got no idea if that's in the budget. It's not listed again. Um, if that project has been cut, it's been on the waiting list for over a decade, I'd say 12 years. Um, and it is desperately needed to improve links to schools. Uh, sorry, two train stations. Um, so uh, there is a great failure, I think, of this administration uh, when it comes to delivering active transport for our uh, community. Now, the other concern, of course, is um, the lack of uh, zebra crossings, wombat crossings, which I know something Queensland Walks really strongly supports. They are such a good idea. We are seeing councils around Australia roll them out and yet this administration is scared to put them in. And these are raised crossings with a zebra on them. They are a fantastic piece of infrastructure for pedestrians, and we should be putting them in around the city. I've got multiple locations uh, where they would be useful 
uh, in my ward. And I am certainly uh, calling on the administration to put more in. Uh, there is very little in this, in this budget for Tennyson Ward. Um, there's one footpath, there's zero bikeways, zero shared paths, zero green bridges, zero public private uh, transport, zero city cat, zero gold glider. Um, and the gold glider, of course, shouldn't just stop at Wool and Gabba, it should be extended to Annerley or Fairfield. Annerley has the busiest bus route, uh, apart from the one to the University of Queensland, the 100. It is chockers all the time, and the gold glider should go to at least Annerley, um, and it should look at Fairfield um, as an alternative but certainly um, providing additional glider services to Annerley, which is just that one suburb further on than Woolloongabba, uh, would be worthwhile. But as, as usual, this administration has failed um, to fund the necessary um, infrastructure for uh, public and active transport in my ward, so I move the following amendment. I move that Council allocates $750,000 within the Active Transport Infrastructure Fund, Service 1.1.3.1, providing active transport infrastructure to fund the following. A new refuge at the corner of Park Road and Verney Road East, Gravesville. A new pedestrian refuge on Doug Douglas Street, Oxley. A zebra crossing at the corner of Appel Street and Verney Road East, Gracewell, outside Gracewell Rail Station. And a green walk signal on the slip lane at the corner of Eckerbin Road and Ipswich Road, Annerley. Seconded. There's been an amendment proposed by Councillor Johnson, seconded by uh, Councillor Griffiths. Councillor Johnson, that was quite complicated. I trust there's a copy being provided. I've emailed it through. You've emailed it around. All right, and thank And I have you. one for you if you thank want you. to. Thank you. That's much appreciated. All right, um, please uh, speak to the amendment. All right. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> so, um, yet again this year, the administration has failed um, the residents of Tennyson Ward. Uh, there are 10 suburbs in Tennyson Ward. Uh, Chelmer, Graceville, Sherwood, Corinda, Oxley, uh, Tennyson, Fairfield, Yoronga, Yorongpilly and Annerley, and I do share a couple of those suburbs with other councillors. Um, I asked a lot of questions about the Active Transport Fund uh, during the information sessions, and we did eke a little bit of information out of uh, Councillor Murphy um, about that expenditure. And one of the things that he stated uh, the second time I asked him about it was uh, that there was $1.2 million for the Indrapilly Bikeway in the Active Travel Fund. Well, that's actually not the case, as it turns out. Um, that program is separately listed in the budget. Uh, so the overruns on the Indrapilly Riverwalk are listed as an itemised project in 1.1.3.1. Uh, so there's at least $1.2 million in spare funding in the active uh, transport fund, according to Councillor Murphy. Uh, now, I believe that funding should be allocated to the following projects. A pedestrian refuge at the corner of Park Road and Verney Road uh, East, Graceful. This has been on the list since Jane Prentice was the councillor. It's been waiting now, I don't know, I've been here 13 years, uh, so it's been waiting a very long time. And I know that the lady on the corner who advocates for this rings the Lord Mayor every year, uh, and uh, he dutifully sends out a traffic network engineer to have a bit of a look, and nothing ever happens. Uh, so. It leads to a school. It's a big, wide intersection, and the kids have to cross the road to get to the school. It's a no-brainer, and it should be funded. It wouldn't cost very much, uh, and uh, I believe it should be funded in this budget. The second one is a new pedestrian refuge on o Douglas Street, Oxley. Now, this is the border of my ward with Jamboree, uh, and um, as I was campaigning last year, uh, I came across residents who really wanted to improve uh, pedestrian mobility across Englefield Road and Douglas Street in Oxley. They're both very busy roads and there's a huge amount of development happening uh, out in that area. So, as all councillors would know, a petition came through this place uh, calling for additional pedestrian infrastructure. This would be the first of several that I think I'm, I'm happy to do one at a time. Um, it would be of benefit to both uh, Tennyson Ward residents in Oxley and Jamboree Ward residents in Oxley. Um, we've got a lot of new families and people with prams out there, so it would be really fantastic. Third one is a zebra crossing outside Graceful Rail Station. Now, this one has been through council as well, uh, and it is waiting, 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 waiting. Um, council did give me a plan um, which took away the drop-off zone uh, where everybody drops their children off uh, to go to school. Um, so this council uh, put the wrong plan forward for the community. 
The alternative is clear. It is easy to do. It's a shortest cross across the road. We need some ramps. Um, it, it will have a minimal impact on parking, and it provides the most direct route for all of the children from Graceville State School and Christ the King to cross the road from the train station and get to their schools. It would also provide safer access for residents who live all around the district because everyone uses the underpass at this station to cross from uh, the western side of Honour Avenue to the uh, eastern side of Honour Avenue. It's a no-brainer, again. My objectives, which I think are fairly straightforward, are let's improve um, pedestrian access to public transport. I think it's a pretty good strategy. If I was in charge, that is where we would be putting our money. We need to put it where people are going to school, to work, to the shops. I don't think that's a hard thing to do. Um, I don't think that putting in zebra crossings is a hard thing to do. Everybody says, oh, they're too dangerous. That's because this council has taken them out everywhere. If they went back in everywhere, there would be a much higher awareness uh, of, what is, um, of what is needed for pedestrian safety. Finally, a green walk signal on the slip lane on the corner of Eckerbin Road and Ipswich Road, Annerley. Um, this was one of the projects that residents identified as part of Move Safe. I'm sure all the councillors here remember Move Safe. It used to be um, one of the walkability programs that council had. They killed it last year and they've moved it. It doesn't exist as its own program anymore and it's been buried under footpaths for seniors. But we know there are no footpaths for seniors because the only new footpaths in this program are the safer pathways to school. So let's be clear, Move Safe was killed off by this administration last year and their explanation was, we're going to fund it as part of our overall support for seniors. Where is it? Where is it, uh, Mr Chairman to Councillor Murphy? There is no funding specifically identified for seniors, footpaths and mobility in this budget. Disappear. None. That's been cut too. Disappear. So this is a critically important spot for a green walk signal. Yeah, yeah. The rest of the intersection is signalised with a green walk crossing, but the slip lane is not. And cars come off Ipswich Road into Eckerbin Road at a great pace and it is dangerous for pedestrians. Now, this is actually in Maruka Ward, which did used to be Tennyson Ward, but it's right on the border. I know this is something that Councillor Griffiths has been campaigning for as well. I know this is something that he sees as very important for his pedestrians, and I'm sure he'll say something about it uh, as well. Um, but this is an intersection that Council has identified as a problem. This is an, uh, an intersection that the community has identified as a problem. And this is an intersection that deserves this council's support to be properly signalised so people can safely cross the road. In this intersection, uh, sorry, in this junction, Annerley Junction, two people have died crossing the road um, in recent years. And yes, there's pedestrian error that happens, but we must provide safe infrastructure to enable people to cross arterial roads. And the fact that at the intersection of a suburban road and an arterial road, there is not a safe crossing point is ridiculous. So, um, Councillor Murphy clearly uh, has a little bit of money left in this budget. I believe he should be allocating it to these four projects. Um, the pedestrian refuge at the corny, corner of uh, Park Road and Fernie Road East Graceville to assist students safely get to a very good active travel school, Graceville State School, a new pedestrian refuge on Douglas Street, Oxley, to benefit both Jamboree Ward and Tennyson Ward residents, a zebra crossing on the corner of Appel Street and Verney Road East Graceville, outside Graceville Rail Station, to benefit absolutely everybody and improve access to public transport and to two schools who are great active travel schools, Graceville and Christ the King. And finally, a green walk signal on the slip lane at the corner of Eckerbin Road and Ipswich Road, Annerley, um, to ensure there is a safe crossing point for the residents of Annerley who deserve our support to be able to safely cross arterial roads. I certainly hope that all councillors will be supporting the amendment. Further speakers on the amendment? Anyone? Councillor Griffiths. Uh, yes, thank you. I just rise to support this amendment. I think um, Councillor Johnson is showing uh, her strength in representing her community by putting these amendments up. 
and the fact that um, she is such an active campaigner in her community is well known and well recognised, uh, particularly um, uh, by the residents and with the vote that she receives in that electorate. But in particular, I want to speak about the corner of Eckerman Road and Ipswich Road, which has only just come into my electorate um, um, since the uh, last election. But certainly it's one, uh, one of those points, one of those crossing points that's near the uh, Annalee Shopping Centre. It's used not only by seniors, but by many, many residents and um, is a, a, a very unsafe crossing point uh, for residents to cross um, Eckerman Road. So I absolutely support uh, this motion and I absolutely support the need for lights in this slip lane to make sure that we're actually building on the great work that really um, Councillor Johnston has done uh, with the uh, TMR Minister in reducing the speed along Ipswich Road. And the reason we're able to reduce the speed along Ipswich Road from 60 to 50 was because of the number of pedestrians uh, crossing Ipswich Road. So, um, yes, yeah, so I, I think this is vital for the administration to support, and I would really um, call on all councillors to see this as a worthy cause that is uh, not political. It's actually about delivering the best, um, the best outcome for residents. Thank you. Further speakers to the amendment? Any further speakers? Councillor Johnston. Well, thank you so much. Uh, so uh, also, before you begin, um, right reply on amendments is five minutes as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'll just put on the record for those listening um, and those who may see this transcript at a later point. Um, so often the Lord Mayor stands up in this place and he says, tell us your agenda, you have no agenda, and th there'll be a lot of criticism that goes on. Every year I move um, amendments to the budget. Every year I put forward um, the program that I think, uh, based on the feedback I've had from residents, uh, would be of benefit to Tennyson Water and to adjoining suburbs uh, where we share common interests. Every year they vote down these amendments, every year. Um, and in this case, um, not a single one, not a single one of the uh, LNP councillors has had the courage to stand up and say why they don't support better pedestrian access for residents, why they don't support a zebra crossing, why they don't support um, safer pathways to school for children, and why they don't support a green walk signal on an arterial road. Not a peep. Not a peep. Do you know, I think that shows weakness by this administration. The arrogance, thank you, Councillor Cumming. They don't actually want to have a debate about what the best infrastructure for our city is. They don't want to have a debate about what is important in Tennyson Ward. All they want to do is say nothing, hide behind their majority, and then vote down critically important safety initiatives for Tennyson Ward. And let's be clear, these are pretty small things. They're not very big. Um, there's a little bit of money here for some zebra crossings, some refuges and a green walk signal. Every single day that I am here, I'm going to campaign for better pedestrian safety. And I've been doing that for a very long time. Um, two of the top 10 suburbs in Move Safe were in Tennyson Ward. They were Graceville and Annalee. You may have forgotten, you may have forgotten Move Safe, but I have not forgotten Move Safe. That was an absolutely fascinating bit of research that asked our community where they need safer crossing points, and our community spoke up in droves. While I am their councillor, I will fight for those projects to be delivered. I will call out the cowardice of those on the other side who refuse to debate the issues. Um, and I'm sure that Councillor Murphy will stand up in his reply today and attack me, um, or the Lord Mayor will stand up and attack me. That is the only refuge they have. Yeah, not a pedestrian the refuge. The not a pedestrian. He's doing it now. Not a pedestrian refuge. Oh, yeah. Personal oh, attacks yeah. by the Lord right, Mayor. Point Councillors, uh, point of order to Councillor Griffiths. Yeah, point of order, Councillor Griffiths. I can't hear the Councillor speak. I was, I was, when, you, when you moved, I was calling the Chamber to, uh, to calm. Now, Councillors, please allow the Councillor to be heard in silence. Councillor Johnston. Yeah, so while Councillor Adams is shouting at me, she's then shouting at Councillor Griffiths, get your hearing checked. Why didn't you stand up and debate the issue, Mr Chairman? 
There's 20 of them over there. Any one of them could have stood up and said, no, nah, these are terrible projects. We're not going to support them. The deputy mayor didn't have the guts to do it. The lord mayor didn't have the guts to do it. And the chairperson of this portfolio didn't have the guts to do it. What they will do is, in about 10 minutes, stand up and have a red-hot go at me. That's the only playbook that they've got. Meanwhile, I'll stand in this chamber and fight for the infrastructure under this budget that should be delivered for tennis and ward residents. I'm going to continue to do it. These four projects are critically important in my ward. They are well supported by the community. They benefit two adjoining wards and they should be supported. We'll now uh, put the amendment. All those in favour of the amendment, please say aye. aye. Those against, please say no. no. The noes have it. Division. Division called by Councillor Seconded. Johnston and Councillor Griffiths. Please ring the bells. Councillors, uh, all councillors present are uh, present for. Uh, so we'll now move to a vote. All those in favour of the amendment, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. And those against, please say no and raise your hand. Aye. Clerks, please read the result when you're ready. Mr Chair, the noes have it. The voting being five in favour and 17 against. The noes have it. Uh, we will now return to the substantive debate. Are there any further speakers on the substantive debate? Councillor Owen. Thank you, Mr Chair. I rise to speak in support of Program 1, Transport for Brisbane. And can I commence by saying a very special thank you to the 2,418 bus drivers from the seven bus depots across our city, who serve the residents and visitors to Brisbane day in, day out, for the role that they play in ensuring people get to and from their destinations in a safe and reliable manner. Yeah. I'd like to start by addressing Program 1.2, Public Transport. And I'd just like to reflect on Council's vision which is to see more Brisbane residents and visitors choosing to move around our city via bus and ferry services rather than private vehicles. Now, it's important to reflect on this because when you consider that up to the 28th of May, our free seniors trips that we have offered this financial year totaled two million. 875,467 trips. Now that is so many of our lovely seniors who live in our city, who have supported our city for so many ways, in so many ways for so many years. It is supporting those seniors back for their contribution. So that is an important part of this program. It is very much an integral part of what the Schrinner Council is about, recognising those seniors who have contributed through their lives. Yeah. And whilst we're on the topic of seniors, I'd like to address the very important seniors in my ward that live in the Stretton Gardens retirement community. Now, when the Stretton Gardens retirement community was built, as part of the consultation process, we engage with other stakeholders, which includes public um, transport providers, including TransLink. And so when that community was built, there was a bus stop that was put out the front on Illawina Street. Now, importantly, those residents have been waiting for TransLink to activate services for that bus stop. So whilst we as Brisbane City Council can do as much as we can do by providing the buses, by providing the bus drivers and providing the subsidy, TransLink have to approve the route extension and they have failed to do so. 
Now, the residents at Stretton Gardens undertook a petition many years ago. We go back to 2017. And unfortunately, the state Labor government have failed them. They have failed to put in place what they promised. And I'm not about just making statements in this place. I will quote you from what was conveyed to them in writing. And it relates to a letter issued by the Depu former Deputy Premier in the State Labor Government, and it was dated the 26th of October 2017, which says, Translink is now in the process of building a new bus turnaround facility, which will enable the 130 route to service the Stretton Gardens bus stop. The process of undertaking a business case, detailed design and construction is likely to take a minimum of 18 months. After this process is completed, the 130 bus will make use of the Stretton Gardens bus stop." Point unquote. of order. Point, Point of order. order. Uh, Councillor Cumming. Uh, Mr Chairman, I just, just want some clarification. That this, it's all, uh, is it OK for Councillor Owen to be speaking on this matter, which doesn't appear specifically in the budget at all? You know, so, so anyone could talk on any, sort of, right, any sort of transport issue no, 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 whatsoever. No, 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 for a speech, you just, you, you're asking Yes, yeah, so I'm just asking you for clarification on right. that point. Yeah. So I'll ask uh, Councillor Owen, uh, please ensure that your comments are, in, are relevant to the matter at hand and thank, the program area one. Thank you, one. Mr Chair. And I will make the relevance absolutely abundantly clear for those on the opposite side. It relates to 1.2.2. Um, providing high quality bus services which are accessible and modern. So because of the failure of the state Labor government to deliver this bus turnaround, the residents of the Stretton Gardens cannot access the bus stop, which is right outside their residential village. So when we look at the timeline, 27th of October 2017, oh, it's supposed to take about 18 months. Well, let, that takes us forward to the 27th of April 2019, which is approximately two years and two months ago, which is how long they have failed to deliver this project. So they've had three years and 20 months since that letter stated they were going to deliver it. So it is now overdue two years and two months. That is not acceptable for the residents of the Stretton Gardens retirement community. And I call on the State Labor Government today to fast track this because in the, on page 48 of the Transport and Roads Investment Project this year that was delivered in their budget, they have failed to fast track it and it needs to be done. And I will not resolve from standing up for my residents to make sure this is a priority. Those elderly residents need this service, they need it now, and the state Labor government needs to get on with it. <laughs> we have done everything that is necessary to ensure that this project will be supported, and they need to get on board down in George Street. Now, I would like to move on to 1.1, active transport. And this is something that I hold very dear, particularly around schools. And, and I note that Councillor Johnston is sitting on the other side of the chamber disputing that. And Councillor Johnston, I will, through you, Mr Chair, those on the other side are being very disrespectful because I have put on the record in this place that after returning from an extended family reunion in 2013, that I, there was a family member who was lost as a result at a school crossing. So don't you dare question my capacity to stand up for school students and safety, because I will do that every day of the week. And I would like to say to the Transport for Brisbane officers 
who have been working with me very diligently to support school bus services in my ward, particularly in relation to the, ext the extension of the Pallara bus service that this year went into the Pallara Stocklands estate, and as from the 12th of July, we'll be extending into Heathwood Avenues, Heathwood Rise, Sanctuary Pocket and Chain of Ponds. I'd like to say to those officers, thank you for your understanding and support of the growth through that area of my ward. It is important we do what we can to reduce congestion around schools, to enhance the safety of the students in their trips to schools, and importantly, to make sure that the parents have the knowledge that when the children are on our buses, they have a safe journey to and from school. I think it's very important as well that as part of this program, we have safer pathways to schools. And this financial year, we have seen the footpath extension for the Stretton State College students. And that has been applauded by many in the community as being an enhanced capacity for student safety around that very, very important intersection. I think it's also important to state now as well that we need TransLink to come on board to provide public bus transport services from Pallara to connect with shopping centres Councillor and Owen, your time has train expired. stations. Thank Further you. speakers, Councillor Cassidy. Oh, thanks very much, Chair. I rise to speak on Program 1. And wasn't that a fun and ironical speech from Councillor Owen just now talking about public transport? And let's not forget, this is the council that broke the record for misusing cab charge vouchers yeah, yeah, yeah. here in Brisbane, Chair. The biggest cab, the biggest cab user in this oh, council, oh, Chair. Sorry. Isn't it ironical? What Isn't it ironical? Well, Chair, this program Program, Program 1, uh, tells us the story of this administration in nine short pages. It's all announcement and no substance. Uh, it has fundamentally abandoned our suburbs and it has abandoned Brisbane manufacturing. And much like the rest of the budget and all the other um, programs, uh, it is riddled with failure and neglect. A failure to properly plan and deliver major projects and the neglect of our suburbs. Because of this mismanagement, Chair, ratepayers are paying more and more and they're getting less and less for it. Now, the two centrepieces of Adrian Schrinner's election in 2020 and this budget before us today are the five green bridges that uh, he promised us and the so-called Metro. Uh, but this budget has laid bare what a sham both of those things are. As we approach 2023, we uh, should see the Metro bus project fully complete. That was this Lord Mayor's commitment to the people of Brisbane five long years ago after all. Well, we now find out that according to the LNP, 2023 is a soft launch of the Metro. Uh, well, it is sounding softer and softer as the years drag on, Chair. There is $540 million left on this project between 2023 and 2025, uh, and that's without the now inevitable cost blowouts and delays, uh, with Adrian Schrinner declaring he wants another redesign at the Cultural Centre busway station. But Councillor Murphy uh, very helpfully confirmed that uh, the LNP has done no work on that redesign, and they have absolutely no idea how much it is going to cost. But don't worry, everyone, we're going to have a soft opening in 2023. Now, we were promised a subway system that would rival Paris or Tokyo, uh, and after three redesigns, what will we be left with? 60, 60, more redesigns, probably, a few more to come, but 60 overseas-made buses going up and down an existing busway. Very underwhelming, Lord Mayor. This project is now eating up 85 per cent of the capital budget in this program, uh, and it is the suburbs that are going to suffer for this, Chair. There still has been no proper explanation as to why we need these European-made buses instead of sourcing locally-made buses. 
The claimed increased capacity on the busway will not come from 60 banana buses. It will come from the other changes to the busway in this project. So it seems the only reason that we're getting these European-made buses and snubbing local manufacturing is because Adrian Schrinner wanted to have something that looked a little bit like, a little bit like the subway that he promised Brisbane five years ago, except their buses running on a busway. So I don't understand why the Lord Mayor is so ashamed to call it what it is. And on the Metro Buses Chair, it was revealed in the information sessions that these 60 overseas-made Metro buses are costing ratepayers $252 million. That is $4.2 million a bus. You could have had 250 locally-made articulated buses for that budget. Uh, and the Metro will see a massive bus network review, which will mean hundreds of services from the south side and the north side will be disrupted, yeah. so Adrian Schrinner can pretend that he's built something. It's becoming abundantly clear, Chair, that this project is going to take longer than needed, cost more than expected and deliver less than promised. That is the tale of Councillor Schrinner, after all. But I think something much worse is brewing in the Green Bridges program, Chair. I want to put clearly on the record here today uh, that Labor supports Green Bridges, generally. The last administration to build a Green Bridge was the Sawley Labor administration, and that bridge, that Green Bridge, now carries millions of bus passengers to and from UQ each year. I, imagine that, a real Green Bridge, Councillor Griffiths. Imagine that, a bridge connecting Brisbane that truly busts congestion. Now, the day Councillor Schrinner was selected to replace Graham Quirk, he wanted to break free from his predecessor and announce something new and something flashy that could get him on TV. He declared he would build five five said green bridges. Now fast forward to June 2021 and we know that the Kangaroo Point pedestrian bridge and the bikeway extension at Breakfast Creek will be built and that's about it. Councillor Murphy made the extraordinary admission during the information session uh, that uh, the Lord Mayor would not proceed with the other three bridges without extra money from the state and federal government. But but the LNP hadn't yet bothered asking anyone for it. The Green Bridges program is eating up 82% of all active transport funding, and now it looks like those bridges are falling into the river before our very eyes. We know that no planning went into the location, design or real needs for these bridges, and that was also confirmed by Councillor Murphy recently when he said the council bureaucracy had absolutely nothing to do with the planning of these bridges before the LNP announced them. So we've seen this fast from Adrian Schrinner going out to the community, building up expectation for these two West End bridges that have apparently now been locked in with no plan as to how they can be funded. Uh, I don't know at any point whether this was disclosed in those glossy brochures I've had a look through. I can't remember seeing uh, that or in those media conferences or all the TV appearances that the Lord Mayor made. I don't know if anyone remembers the Lord Mayor standing up and saying, we're going to build these bridges, maybe, if we can get some money from somewhere else, and if not, you don't get them. I don't recall the Lord Mayor disclosing that to the residents of Brisbane at any time, at any point, that these bridges would not proceed without extra funding. How embarrassing. How embarrassing for this administration. Now, before a business case is even complete for these West End bridges, the LNP have come up with a figure in this budget for revenue, which is quite interesting, that they're seemingly getting from a helpful little magic pudding, we assume, because no question has been asked of any other level of government for that funding. So Councillor Murphy has now confirmed that the $88 million in revenue that appears in this Green Bridges budget is simply made up. It is made up revenue. Now, Chair, they used to just waste money on cost blowouts and poorly planned projects. Now they're actually putting fake revenue into a budget to prop up the bottom line. The people of Brisbane deserve much better than this. The hard-working council officers who spend their days mopping up uh, these LNP disasters deserve so much better than this. And I say to those officers listening, there is a better way. We feel for you and we feel your pain. And to all those residents out in the suburbs uh, living uh, on those 6,254 streets with no footpaths, we also feel your pain. And that's 40% of all streets in Brisbane. Out of this $3.6 billion budget, 
there is just $1.6 million being spent on new footpaths and capital funding. Now, there is no way for this Lord Mayor to spin his way out of this one. I know he tried to, uh, on radio yesterday, tried to mop up after Councillor Murphy's admission. But Councillor Murphy confirmed in the information session, as Councillor Johnston has already said, that 18, there is only 18 new footpaths to be constructed this year under the capital budget, under that Safer Paths to Schools program. So if there are if there are other footpaths to be funded from capital this year, I challenge the Lord Mayor and Councillor Murphy to show us the list. Just show us the list of footpaths that will be constructed this year under the capital budget. Uh, we know that they don't have that and it's not funded. Uh, but if they're claiming that there is extra money they need to front up and show it, uh, their neglect for our suburbs knows no bounds. Uh, we know the neglect of our suburbs knows no bounds, and we launched, Labor launched a comprehensive mobility strategy over a year ago, which outlined the need for more investment in suburban footpaths, bikeway connections and genuine green bridges. We consulted with cycling groups, with Queensland Walks, with the RACQ, and we were all in furious agreement that more investment needed to be made to connect our communities out in the suburbs. Uh, but what we get from the LNP, just 18 new footpaths, and there are 185 suburbs in Brisbane. This is some sort of sick joke on the people of Brisbane. And the LNP are also uh, uh, perpetrating uh, something terrible here in Brisbane in terms of manufacturing. Despite a 30-year partnership at Council building local buses, uh, they have shut down manufacturing here in Brisbane. It's clear that the LNP are more interested in our buses carrying ads around for multinational corporations than carrying passengers or supporting local jobs. The LNP chair have fundamentally shown they don't care about our workers and they don't care about our suburbs. Uh, and I'd like to move an amendment uh, on this program, <coughs> Chair. I move that in Program 1, Transport for Brisbane be amended as follows. That Council reallocate, reallocates $2 million from advertising and marketing expenses in this program to a new project called New Footpath Construction under Service 1.1.3.1, providing active transport infrastructure for the locations which are of highest priority on the forward list of Council's new footpath construction schedule. Seconded. I'll just email uh, that through now, Chair. Thank you. An amendment has been proposed by Councillor Cassidy, seconded by Councillor Griffiths. I believe it's been distributed uh, imminently. Uh, Councillor Cassidy, you have 10 minutes uh, to the amendment, please. Oh, thanks, very, thanks very much, Chair. Point of order, uh, Chair. Point of order. Um, just to the competence of this motion, um, there needs to be clearly identified within uh, the motion what service and where in the budget program the money is being moved from to be reallocated to, I believe. I'm You're just right. seeking your guidance as to whether this is competent, given Councillor Cassidy has just sort of said marketing communications, and that's actually not in the budget program. Allow me a moment. Um, it's not explicit that, that uh, what we would require would for Councillor Cassidy to identify what portion of the budget is advertising and marketing expense. Uh, for the purpose of public debate, we'll allow it. 
Councillor Cassidy, 10 minutes, please. Well, thank you, Chair. And I, I won't need to take 10 minutes because I'm pretty sure our views on this are very well known to those uh, in the chamber. It's extremely simple. Uh, what we are saying is that instead of, instead of the LNP using ratepayers' money on political advertising, uh, what the residents of Brisbane want to see is more basic services, uh, like footpaths being built. If you don't realise that residents would rather see their hard-earned rates spent on basic services in our suburbs instead of that political advertising, then no LNP councillor deserves to be in this place. Uh, and it's as simple as that. Uh, the, the LNP uh, have, through this budget and through their underinvestment uh, in our suburbs, shown that they fundamentally don't care about the suburbs. Now, the Lord Mayor can get all of the talking points out to caucus members and make sure that in all his tweets and social media posts he uses the word suburbs a lot. Uh, we, we, we know he does that, but that's just rhetoric. Uh, Councillor Murphy talked about actions and actions speaking louder than rhetoric. Well, uh, the, the reality is in this budget there's just 18 new footpaths being built uh, across 185 suburbs of Brisbane, and that is suburban neglect. There's nothing more basic uh, than making sure our suburbs and our communities are well connected. And you cannot, you cannot tell the people of Brisbane particularly those that live on those uh, more than 6,200 streets that don't have any concrete footpath at all, that you're for them. You can't say you're for the suburbs when uh, you starve them of funding. Uh, when, when we went and consulted the Brisbane community uh, when we launched our mobility plan and we spoke to the RACQ and Queensland Walks and Space for Cycling and other cycling groups, uh, the most important piece of feedback we got is that more investment needed to be made in the suburbs and making them more walkable and more connected. And this, this amendment goes some way to doing that, D not the silver bullet, of course, Chair, but what it does is allocates more money for new footpath construction. Now, I know the Lord Mayor went out and tried to mop up after Councillor Murphy's uh, little faux pas in, in confirming to us that, that only 18 new footpaths would be constructed this year and suggested that councillors have uh, SEF funding to use on that. Uh, but then, on the other hand, the Lord Mayor writes to local councils and says, I've been requested uh, to yes. provide a new toilet in the park. Can you pay for that out of the SEF funding? Yes. Uh, and now they're saying, and community, community leasing's coming in, I was saying, can you fund some of the, these upgrades to community clubs out of SEF oh, yes. funding, like solar power and other things and new fences at footy clubs, because there's not enough money. So the Lord Mayor can't go out and say, oh, there's a big bucket of money for footpaths and SEF funding, when he is requesting every local councillor dip into that for every other thing that he's not funding in the suburbs chair so at, at best at best uh, his rhetoric about being for the suburbs is disingenuous uh, at worst uh, at worst it is a complete and utter mistruth chair um, we know that that the LNP are more interested in flashy inner city projects than getting on with the basics uh, in our community we, we see that through the allocation of funding in this program in the budget they have failed, the LNP have failed to deliver uh, projects on time uh, and on budget and what that means is residents continue to pay more in their rates and they're getting less and less in terms of basic services. So it's a very, a very simple amendment. Uh, if, if the LNP councillors on that side of the chamber actually believe their rhetoric about being for the suburbs, uh, they will reallocate advertising and communications funding out of this program area and dedicate that to building new footpaths, Chair. Further speakers to the amendment. Further speakers to the amendment. Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes. Um, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Councillor Murphy, for putting forward this amendment. I think it is a very good one. Uh, I appreciate that uh, Labor have supported uh, my amendment. Er oh, what did I say? Sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> I think that was wishful thinking, wasn't it? Yeah, wishful thinking. I am Councils so sorry. Councillor, back on topic. My apologies. Councillor, back on topic, please. Thank you, Councillor Cassidy, for putting forward this amendment. It is a good one. Um, I do hope that Councillor Murphy will support it. Um, there is no question that this administration spends a huge amount of money on putting out glossy brochures, uh, paying for Facebook advertising. Uh, and uh, paying for ads on TV, which are, are continuing. Um, in my view, this money can be put into footpaths, uh, and that would be a much better investment um, in our community. Uh, I certainly know that $2 million won't buy a lot of footpaths. We might get 20 or 30 out of that. 
Um, so that might mean one extra footpath for each ward around Brisbane, and I think that would be a good outcome or a good starting point for the city. Um, and I will just put on the record again uh, that um, Brisbane has done uh, a great piece of work called Move Safe, and that identified where there are um, concerns in our community about our pedestrian safety. And this administration has provided no funding for it. Um, they've provided uh, only limited funding in this budget for pathways to schools. And I know that the Lord Mayor tried yesterday to uh, claim we had all this other money to spend. Um, if he'd have actually listened to my interview, he would have heard me discuss how it all worked, uh, including the Suburban Enhancement Fund. Now, that fund, unfortunately, um, used to be just for uh, footpath and park projects. Um, now we have to fund road upgrades, um, fixing footpaths, um, apparently community leasing, which I was told we couldn't use it on, but now community leasing, and major infrastructure like toilets. So this administration is simply asking councillors to do more and more uh, with limited funding, limited funding but is not putting the money in the capital budget into these areas. So this is the sneaky sleight of hand that is going on. They keep saying publicly to everyone, oh, but your local councillor has money. We've barely got enough to fund, I always split mine half and half, I might get three or four footpaths if I'm lucky. A footpath can cost anywhere between fifty dollars and $250,000 out of $500,000. And we heard um, you know, from uh, Councillor Marks that it's not actually even $567,000 is in the budget. $46,000 of that is corporate overhead. So starting from the beginning, we've just got over $500,000. So every time this administration says there is this money, there's actually not that amount. Um, number two, uh, number two, we have to use that money to fund things across a whole range of infrastructure. So this is a great first step. I support the amendment. Thank you for putting it forward. Further speakers to the amendment? Any further speakers? Councillor Cassidy, your response to the amendment, you have five minutes. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. There are 6,254 streets in Brisbane that don't have a footpath, that don't have a concrete footpath. Yeah. Uh, that means anyone uh, who wants to get out and about in their community and stay connected, and we saw that last year, that people, uh, uh, people um, uh, really showed their love for their community uh, and their neighbours and wanted to stay local and stay connected. Uh, there are 6,254 streets in Brisbane that have no footpath. That's 40 per cent of all of our suburban streets don't have the most basic the most basic of facilities uh, and services, all the while, all the while, uh, this Lord Mayor and LNP administration would rather spend money on their political advertising. Uh, they'd rather, they'd rather uh, lock away all this future money in this so-called Green Bridges uh, project that we now know is coming apart at the seams, Chair. Uh, so, despite their rhetoric, the people of Brisbane uh, now know and have on the record that they would rather spend uh, their money, this is the LNP, would rather spend ratepayers' money on political advertising than basic services in our community. I now put the amendment. All those in favour of the amendment, please say aye. Aye. Those against, please say no. Aye. The noes have it. Division. Division, Division called by uh, Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Cook, I think. Uh, please ring the bells. Councillors, on, on the amendment, all those in favour, please say aye and raise your hands. Aye. And those against, please say no and raise your hands. 
Clerks, please read the result when you're ready. Mr Chair, the noes have it. The voting being six in favour and 17 against. The noes have it. Are there any further speakers to the substantive matter? Mackay, uh, Councillor Mackay. Thanks, Wines. I mean, Chair. <laughs> I rise to speak about Program 1, Service 1.1.3.1, providing active transport infrastructure specifically. And I want to start to talk about the Green Bridges and the Lord Mayor's pet project that we see before us in the budget today. I started as the councillor for Walter Taylor just after the Lord Mayor and uh, just after he had announced his plan for five green bridges to go across our wonderful Brisbane River. And this will be a legacy for our Lord Mayor because in the years to come, when I have a, a grown up daughter, she'll be able to get around the city with a connected method of transport. And I just wonder, even if she'll be learning to drive when she's 18, or will she focus on active transport, such as what the Schrinner Council is delivering for St Lucia and for Tawong? So why are we doing these green bridges? Well, Chair, you'll have to indulge me. This is only my third budget debate, and I'm a little confused because I just heard Councillor Cassidy say he spoke to Queensland Walks and they said they want more infrastructure to be connected to have a walkable city, and I think he said, to activate our spaces. Well, I find it very hard to believe that that's not exactly what these green bridges are doing. To take the green bridge from Tawong to West End, to take the green bridge from St Lucia to West End, these are activating our communities, these are connecting different parts of our beautiful city. Today I wear the St Lucia Bowls Club, Club pin and that reminds me that the St Lucia Bowls Club will be one of the very many community assets that will benefit from such bridges as the one from St Lucia to West End. Not only will they be able to bring in new players, they'll be able to take their players to West End for competitions across the city without needing to drive. Who knows? In 10 years, everyone will have an electric bike. No doubt they'll be able to use our e-mobility strategy to at least rent an electric bike. What a great initiative for our city. I've been a member of the South Brisbane Sailing Club for 31 years. That's right across the river from Tawong, just near where the Greenbridge will land from the old ABC site. That will make a big difference for a small community club like the South Brisbane Sailing Club. You know, we're out there sailing 12-foot dinghies. I don't have a lot of time to do that anymore but it will allow people from the, technically the north side of the river to travel across the river to more easily access the South Brisbane Sailing Club. And it will allow people to connect across our city without needing to drive. And that, I think, is a very important factor. And there are 100 suburbs that stretch across the city that have riverfront access. In fact, there are more than 100. So if we're providing infrastructure for the future like these green bridges, that can only be a good thing. We can only be providing more connectivity for the people of Brisbane. Now, Chair, I need you to cast your mind back, if you will. Do you remember what you were doing the week before Christmas in 2006? Well, let me remind you, Chair, I think you and I spent a lovely day together at the opening of the Eleanor Chanel Green Bridge. You may not remember that, but that was an initiative of Lord Mayor Campbell Newman. And I'll just put it on record, that's the same guy who introduced Brisbane to curbside collection. So I'm thrilled that people in this house support his initiative so well. What a wonderful legacy he left. And that was the beginning of a Green Bridge program built one road. But we have a green bridge that goes from the south to the north. It's a bit confusing considering St Lucia's on the south side of the river, but it's on the north side of the city. We wrap our heads around that little geographical complexity another time. But Campbell Newman opened that bridge. But it is disappointing, of course, 
that the Leader of the Opposition forgot about one of the Labor Lord Mayors, Tim Quinn. Oh, he came after Lord Mayor Jim Sawley, but before Campbell Newman. But anyway, we cast our mind back to talk about Greenbridge Foundations, because these bridges will be a long-lasting and remarkable legacy of Lord Mayor Schrinner. We know full well that the Lord Mayor has ruled out the Tawong and St Lucia bridges accommodating buses, a message that came through loud and clear in the first round of community consultation. And that lasted from a period from 11 November to 6 December 2019 to raise awareness about the Green Bridges program, to gain feedback on proposed alignments and to collect feedback from residents and stakeholders to guide the next stage of planning on the other Green Bridges. These are the bridges that Brisbane residents will use for years to come. Every time they cross the bridge, they'll know the bridge was delivered by the Schrinner Council. Indeed, everyone in this chamber knows this is a key project of Lord Mayor Adrian Schrinner. Everyone in Brisbane knows the Green Bridges are a key project of Lord Mayor Adrian Schrinner. Except, if I cast your mind back one more time, to the last state election. Do you remember how the state member from Maywa seems to live in fantasy land when it comes to these bridges? Did you see his signs, Chair? Delivering for the west side. Funding secured for green bridges. <laughs> Councillor Murphy, uh, Chair, through you, has Councillor Murphy popped around to pick up the check yet? For the record, the member of Maywa did not even write a letter of support for the St Lucia Green Bridge. So organising the funding for the Schrinner Council's bridge does come as a lovely surprise. Did he deliver the bridges as he claimed? No. Did he deliver the funding for the bridges as he claims? No. Did he even write a letter of support for a St Lucia Bridge? No. And to make it worse, the me member for Maywa has not even clarified his position. Does he support a St Lucia Green Bridge? We don't know. I hope he's not getting splinters from sitting on the fence. These bridges are about for and because of the people of Brisbane. These are green bridges because they will deliver world-class public and active transport options. We have participated in community consultation about the alignment options for the St Lucia and the Tuong bridges. More than 6,000 people participated in these consultation sessions, overwhelmingly, they chose or they indicated their support for a bridge option from ABC site, now the Consolidated Properties, over to West End and for a bridge from Guyatt Park to West End. I cannot wait to see the preliminary designs and the business case for the Tawong and St Lucia Green Bridges. Can I move to uh, speak quickly about the Indrapilly River Walk? To define a bridge, I was, I was just wondering, maybe the Lord Mayor can roll out six green bridges. Does the River Walk count as a bridge? I looked up a definition. It is a structure carrying a road or path over an obstacle. Well, I can tell you now, the Brisbane River provides plenty of obstacles, and that is why the fifth green bridge, here it is in the wonderful suburb of Indrapilly, to replace the very dangerous cycle route that was Radnor Street. Because it's so dangerous along there that uh, people choose to go up and over a very steep hill rather than ride along that treacherous cliff face. But now, with a 790 metre long, five metre wide, world class bikeway along the Brisbane River, we have brought world-class public and active transport infrastructure to the suburbs. What a wonderful asset for our suburb. The viewing platforms at Sunset are fantastic. We have a new pedestrian crossing on Radnor Street. And as my uh, colleague, Councillor Hutton, was saying to me just this morning, gee, that's good for the people of Indrapilly to be able to cross Radnor Street safely to get up Foxton Street, because I'm all about pedestrian safety Councillor Murphy is all about pedestrian safety and the Schrinner Council is all about delivering infrastructure for the people of Brisbane for better public and active transport. Of course, the, um, the Indrapilly Canoe Club at the end of the Indrapilly Riverwalk is getting a new shed and some upgrades. 
Um, consultation started for the Indrapilly River Walk back in 2018. Construction started on April 6, and we had a wonderful launch party just a few weeks ago. And wasn't it great? We had all of the local schools there. Ambrose Tracy had their brass band down to celebrate the fact that 88 holes were Councillor bored. Mackay, your time has expired. Are there any further speakers? Councillor Strunk. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. I rise to speak on Program 1 uh, across the program. Um, and, uh, Mr Chair, uh, after reading through Transport for Brisbane, uh, my thoughts haven't changed from the previous year's debate when I said I think it should be... I think it should be renamed Transport, Transport for Some Parts of Brisbane. Yeah. Mr Chair, Forest Lake Ward doesn't seem to be part of Program 1, Transport for Brisbane. In this budget, we might as well be in another city, as there seems to be very little that my residents will benefit from. Metro, electric bus program are great examples where few of my residents will benefit. There is no program funding for Forest Lake Ward this year in Program 1 that I can disseminate. Mr. Chair, this is indicative of the lack of investment that ratepayers in my neck of the woods have to endure with ever-increasing rates, charges, above what Council experiences in cost increases and this year, it is, it is great for, with the example of a 3.7% increase in rates in my ward, uh, which is virtually double CPI. This council doesn't think twice about putting their sticky fingers into the pocket of ratepayers to support their ever-increasing desire to spend ratepayer money on projects that residents didn't ask for and in some cases don't need, like Netra. Mr. Chair, residents continue to ask me why does a huge majority of their rates dollars get invested in transport projects that don't have any benefits for them? After all, the money is coming out of their pockets. So who is Metro benefiting? Well, not the residents of the Forest Lake Ward. It won't add one more service, increase frequency, or seating capacity of existing services, and, shouldn't, and I shouldn't be surprised if after Metro is up and running that there will be a reduction or elimination of routes or frequency of service as happened with the last review in 2013 under the Newman government with a very compliant Brisbane City Council. Metro will expand the service to residents living on the north and the south. But once again, if you live in the west or the east, your service for the most part is not improving. So we're spending hundreds of millions of dollars that won't improve congestion or traveling time coming for transport activities in my ward and many other of the 180 suburbs right across the city. And Chair, this project is um, is really a, a project that really, as, as the Leader of the Opposition pointed out, isn't covered in the budget, even in the forward estimates, and that's something that uh, is not uncommon with this administration. Now I would like to move on to city cats, kitty cats, and uh, monohull ferries. Well, what a stuff up in, of the maintenance program of our historic mono halls, and this has been going on for the last two decades with this administration. We find out at estimates that the report by the experts say that only four of the nine are salvageable. Mr. Chair, I call upon, I call, I call this really public asset vandalism, and this administration should be ashamed, not proud, should be ashamed. In, in the corporate world, they'd be sacked. Now, Mr. Chair, let's look again at the Lord Mayor's 2020 campaign promise for five green bridges. 
I call pedestrian bridges really because a green bridge does have some public transport aspects, especially buses. Yep. These bridges will, will be beneficial for residents and cyclists in, in those suburbs that they are connected to, but won't enhance our public transport and bus service out where I live. Mr. Chair, there's not even funding for this in the budget and in the forward estimates. Mr. Chair, looking at this year's budget, we on this side think that the Lower Mayor is up to his old tricks, announcing a project with little or no planning or costing. Then later, as we have seen, say that the funding, the funding of the 500 millions is what Business City Council, but in order to achieve the promise, the state and the federal governments will have to chip in. Mr. Chair, we'd be lucky to really get five green bridges. Um, I think we're probably more apt to get two, um, at least in the next, this term and probably the next term. Mr. Chair, did, we, uh, did the Lord Mayor ask the other levels of government to stump up the difference in the money? Well, clearly the answer is no, and we find, that we find ourselves once again dealing with an LMP administration not doing their homework, like with the Metro and with other projects requiring other sources of funding. Let's promise, let's promise a project or projects, and then when the funding isn't available, we'll just blame the other levels of government. Mr. Chair, the, L the LMP administration has a trust problem with the residents of Brisbane. They don't trust them to spend their hard-earned rates on what they want and need, and transfer for Brisbane is an indicator of this. They don't trust them not to cut much-needed services like curbside collection. They don't trust them in, a meaning in meaningful consultation. They certainly don't trust them to invest money on road infrastructure and traffic safety improvements. Now, this budget is really all about self-promotion for the Lord Mayor and his administration. At every turn, there seems to be another flyer, there seems to be another ad on YouTube, there seems to be all sorts of marketing going on, but not one spade of dirt has been turned um, and they're probably, I, I've lost track how many millions they've already spent on marketing and promotion and advertising, but I'm sure it's many millions of dollars and we haven't seen anything of the Metro. We hear about it being manufactured over in Switzerland. We see pictures. Uh, officers haven't even gone across because of COVID-19, of course, to actually inspect what's actually being built for this administration. Now, I just want to finalize or, or uh, conclude my comments on footpaths. And I do this, uh, I wasn't going to say anything about footpaths because there's many here that will talk about the footpaths, but I had a phone call when I was driving in this morning from a, a lady that's been a friend for probably 30 or 40 years, well, 30 years at least, and uh, she's in the uh, PA hospital um, and she's um, undergoing some treatments. But she, she rides one of these um, uh, mobility scooters, right, uh, for most of uh, her mobility or getting around. And she asked me to uh, let this chamber know that the footpaths in front of the PA hospital, um, out where she lives in Parkinson, um, and especially she wanted me to mention the footpaths uh, around the lake at Parkinson. Uh, isn't really up to a standard that she feels safe uh, in order to c convey herself around the lake and or, or uh, even to go across from the PA over to the shops. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I know the yes. councillor for Callanvale got up and spoke uh, uh, very passionately uh, about, uh, about how she looks after her constituents. So I said to Eleanor, I will asked the councillor if she was with us today, which she is, and of course she probably would always be here, um, 
subject to any sickness, that uh, for to challenge her to do something about the footpaths uh, around the uh, Parkinson uh, Lake. Uh, it's not really, uh, it's not suitable for uh, people with mobility issues, especially if you're in a conveyance uh, like a mobility scooter. And also the footpaths that lead from her place at Parkinson up to the shops, uh, which is a fair distance away, so she's, uh, she's uh, very brave. Your time I don't has think expired. I would do it. Point of order, Chair. Point of order to you, Councillor Landers. Mr Chair, I move that Council now adjourn for morning tea for 15 minutes, which commences only when all councillors have left the meeting. Second it. It's been moved by Councillor Landers, seconded by Councillor Hutton, that this Council now adjourn for the purpose of morning tea for a period of 15 minutes, commencing when all councillors have vacated the chamber and the doors have been locked. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. And those against no, the ayes have it. Councillors, we have quorum. We will now proceed uh, to further substantive debate. Councillor Huang. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. I rise to speak in support of uh, Program 1 of the 2021-22 Budget on Transport for Brisbane. I will start with a, pro with a project that is close to my heart, and that is Brisbane Metro. Mr Chair, Brisbane Metro is a game changer for Brisbane's public transport network, and this is agreed by all sides of politics and it is a symbol of progress for Brisbane as a new world city. It was fascinating to listen to Council Strunk earlier about the metro only benefit residents on the north and south of Brisbane. If this logic holds, we don't need, we don't need water transport. What does Ferry got to do with McGregor Ward? <laughs> or McDowell Ward? Yeah, so we support, yes. We, we, support, we support projects of citywide importance. That's why it is the budget That's here. Right. Yeah. The, a transport project of this scale, as the law mayor has rightly pointed out, that in other states should, should be delivered by the state government, not by the local government. Honestly, I cannot imagine what Brisbane would look like if it wasn't for the good governance of the successive LMP administrations. Just think the opportunities wasted and squandered by the state labour governments and the lack of investment in the state's capital, where the most significant growth are coming from. The figure revealed by the Korean Mail on 28th May this year tells us that the state's investment in Brisbane is on average only 1355 per head, compared to central Queensland, where the state spent 4732 per head. We are significantly disadvantaged by the short-sighted and politically driven state Labour government. Fortunately, the people of Brisbane are discerning. That is why they have re-elected a team led by Lord Mayor Adrian Schreiner, a team with vision, passion and leadership to continue the great legacies built up by the successive LMP administrations, to continue to work hard for the people of Brisbane. <laughs> Mr. Chair, the Srinagar Council is not only working hard for the people of Brisbane, but we are heading to, in the right direction and making the right decision to future-proof our city and make the Brisbane of tomorrow even better than the Brisbane is of today. Brisbane Metro is the best example of such a vision and leadership demonstrated by the Srinagar Council. Mr. Chair, Brisbane Metro is not only the world-class public transport system the people of Brisbane deserve. The old electric feature and the trackless system is first of its kind in the world, and Brisbane is leading the way with this cutting edge technology to showcase our resolve in delivering a clean, green, and sustainable public transport system that will be the envy of the world. Mr. Chair, the Brisbane Metro will deliver an all electric, high capacity, turn up and go public transport system designed to link the city to the suburbs. The Metro will operate along dedicated busways from ML Plains to Roma Street and Royal Brisbane and, we Brisbane and Women's Hospital to University of Queensland. The Metro is designed to address congestion bottlenecks and meet the demand for frequent and reliable travel to the inner city, providing capacity for future growth. Not only will Metro help reduce congestion, 
Traveling on the metro will be incredibly simple with turn up and go services that run 24 hours per day, even on the weekend, no timetables needed. The all electric vehicles will have zero tailpipe emissions to support a cleaner and greener Brisbane. Subject to approvals, the first fully electric high capacity metro vehicle will commence operation from 2023 with completion of stage one by 2024. Mr. Chair, in 2020-21, we have made a number of milestone achievements on Brisbane Metro. Firstly, we have awarded, awarded the collaborative partnership contract to Brisbane Move, that is a consortium of econ Oh, it's difficult for me to pronounce this word. <laughs> A-C-C-I-O-N-A? A-C-O-N-A. A-C-O-N-A. An Arab. Sorry, yeah. It's an acronym that's difficult for me to pronounce. <laughs> to deliver the major infrastructure components of the project. And then we have awarded the design and construct Brisbane Metro Depot contract to ADCO Constructions. And we also implemented the go between bridge toll relief scheme following the closure of Victoria Bridge to uh, general traffic. And we have also launched a digital visitor information center. And in 2021-22, we are looking at making further achievements. Firstly, the Adelaide Street Tunnel. It will be finalized, the design and start construction on the tunnel underneath Adelaide Street. And that the new tunnel will provide a dedicated connection for metro and bus services between Victoria Bridge and existing Inner Northern Busway and King George Square Station. It will allow high frequency metro services to be introduced and reduce the number of buses traveling at surface level on Adelaide Street, helping to improve the environment for pedestrians and retailers. And at the Cultural Center Station, we will finalize the design. Brisbane Metro will deliver an upgraded cultural center station with significant public room improvements on Melbourne Street and Great Street, including a world-class gateway to the cultural forecourt. Cycling connections along Melbourne Street and Great Street will be improved, as well as pedestrian amenity and safety in the cultural center precinct and along Melbourne and Great Street. As for Metro Depot, we will finalize design and commence work on the on-site. The Metro Depot will provide storage and maintenance charging infrastructure and operation facilities for the fleet of Metro vehicles. The Depot will be delivered by 2023 and will support up to 170 local jobs throughout the two year design and construction phase. And as for pilot vehicle, you will the arrive the arrival of the pilot vehicle in early 2022 with testing of the vehicles to follow. And that the manufacturing of the pilot vehicle will progress and that the pilot vehicle itself will arrive in Brisbane for testing in early 2022. Mr. Chair, once completed, the McGregor Ward and our city will benefit enormously from this important infrastructure. If you look on the map of our city, you will see Brisbane Metro is just like an artery linking the south of Brisbane to the north of Brisbane. This high capacity turn up and go system will transfuse the blood, the lifeline of our city, that is our people from suburbs to our, to our city and vice versa. In the morning, it will pump the workforce from suburbs into our CBD without clogging up. And in the evening, it will get people, people home quicker and safer. Mr. Chair, the McGregor Ward, home of the Metro Depot and two stations, including the terminal station of Amal Plains, will benefit from this world-class system. Mr. Chair, one of, one of the most important features of transport network is connection. The two stations in McGregor Ward are Upper Margaret, well, normally known as Garden City and Amal Plains, which is the terminal station for the metro. These two stations are located at the junction of Gateway, Southeast Freeway, Castles Road, Mangrovet Kapalaba Road, and Logan Road. The area has been identified as one of Brisbane's global precincts with strong potential for employment, business, education, technology, and investment opportunities. With Brisbane Metro having the depot and two stations located in this precinct, the metro will benefit from the precinct, and the precinct will benefit from the metro. Yes. With peak hour services running every three minutes, we will give residents and visitors more travel options while using clean and green 
energy that will future-proof our city. Mr. Chair, I would like to conclude by expressing my excitement of the commencing of Metro Depot construction. Mr. Chair, the Metro Depot in Rochdale will be one of the biggest in the country at approximately 10 hectares in size. It will house the most advanced technology due not only to the metro vehicles, but also the combination of high and low voltage charging infrastructure that will sit both beneath the ground and on the surface for the award-winning metro vehicle. The depot will achieve sorry, a sorry, five- Councillor Wang, councillors, there's just a <clears throat> lot of secondary conversations going on. If you'd like to have a chat to each other, please do so in the corridor. Councillor Wang. Thank you. The depot will achieve a five-star green star rating. Green Star is, as we know, a comprehensive voluntary environmental rating system which assesses and the sustainability attributes of a project through a range of impact categories. The depot will construct it at School Road, Rochdale Road, and provide two access points to the Southeast Busway, which is adjacent to the site. Mr. Chair, I have, I have to commend the Shunai administration for the vision, leadership, and resolve in delivering the people of Brisbane a world-class public and active transport network. I commend the program to the Chamber. Further speakers, Councillor Griffiths. Uh, yes, thanks, uh, Mr. Chair, and I rise to speak on program one, Transport for Brisbane. And Mr. Chair, this is the LNP's strategic program. This is the program that they hang their hats on and the one that they have sold their re-election on, yet this is the program that they've failed on um, and failed dismally on. Here we hear about the Metro and we hear about five new green bridges. We can't work out whether it's five, four or three, but there's new green bridges for the city. Mr Chair, this is not in the LNP's DNA at all. And it was interesting to hear before the Councillor McKay, Mackay uh, talk about green bridges in relation to uh, the green bridge that goes over to the university. I was uh, in council at that time, and it was actually Council, uh, Councillor Newman, the Lord Mayor, who tried to stop that green bridge. It had been approved by an LMP administration, and it was put out to survey not once, but twice to see if residents would oppose it. And residents supported it. Residents supported that Green Bridge. And that Green Bridge actually holds and contains buses. Yes. It actually is a proper Green Bridge. And the other thing that is not in their DNA is city cats. And we've seen the horrendous way they've treated the city cat program uh, over the last year the cuts they've made to city cats, the shambles that is city cats. Well, let's be reminded, it was the LNP who were against city cats coming to the city. The LNP voted against them. They were against them. So for this miraculous turnaround to say that we are for green bridges that don't carry buses, and we are for city cats, but we're cutting stops, is just horrendous. So let's, let's keep the record straight with regards to that. Now, the second point, the, the other point I want to make is that we had the chairperson stand up and say, this is our modern progressive plan. Wow, this is our modern progressive plan. Well, it's not a modern progressive plan for the suburbs. It's a modern progressive plan for the inner city because that's where this money is being spent. We're seeing five new green bridges in the inner city. $500 million on this pet project, and none of them carry buses. And then we're seeing over $1 billion being spent on Metro. And once again, that is for tunnels in the inner city. It is not for delivery in the suburbs. There's no car parking along these metro stops. Uh, most, of the, most of the metro now will involve catching two buses into and out of the city. Yep. It's a scam that has been, been perpetrated on the people of Brisbane and they do not realise the massive changes that are coming. And my understanding was, in terms of bad practice, how to drive people away from public transport, you make them catch multiple buses to a destination. So this is, this is a sham 
what this LNP is doing. It's an absolute sham, and then it is just reinforced by the fact that the bus bill is being done in China. So we have, we have, this, whole, we have this whole process of saying we're supporting buy local, but then we go and we purchase from China. The residents of Brisbane are horrified with this program. They are horrified. Sure, you might be uh, pleasing people in the inner city, but the people in the suburbs where this program matters, where it delivers, they are not seeing the benefits. And the biggest, probably the biggest thing for me that highlights that is the 18 footpaths. The 18 footpaths, we're only building for a, a budget of $3.4 billion, we're only building 18 new footpaths in capital. And I can say that I spent half my SIF funny, funding on building footpaths, and that's five footpaths I get to build each year from a list of over 60. And I know, as other councillors who are in the suburbs know, and just recently I was approached by a lady and her husband who, who both use mobile scooters. They, they were requesting more footpaths, more maintenance. They actually showed me a picture of a footpath um, where the light pole is in the middle of the footpath so their scooters actually can't get past. The crazy scenarios we have with regards to footpaths is just appalling. I have disability groups that can't get footpaths. They're in industrial areas. I have seniors who've fallen who can't get footpaths. Schools are requesting footpaths. We don't have footpaths on major roads such as uh, Bow Desert Road. And then that's not even talking about the, the failure of maintaining those footpaths. Now, I'm happy for Councillor Murphy to come out and meet with me, and I'll get these residents together, and he can have a chat to them and explain why they're not getting enough footpaths. I'm happy to have that meeting, Councillor Murphy. I'm happy for the Lord Mayor to come to that meeting too. Because those people would like to directly tell you that they don't want more green bridges. They tell me they don't want more green bridges. They want some money on footpaths. They want money spent in the suburbs. But probably the, one of the most uh, disappointing things, and it came through an email, uh, actually just pre-budget, I've had a, um, a gentleman who's been lobbying for a, um, a shelter shed for some residents as part of the disability access program because we have a no number of seniors who use this. And the reply I had back from the, the officer on the 18th was, unfortunately, the budget for this financial year has been exhausted due to increases in costs and design and construction. And then the clangor, as for the 21-22 budget for bus stop upgrades work, this has been significantly reduced and we are unable to confirm whether we will be able to deliver this at all. This is what the LNP is delivering in the suburbs. No. Nothing. It's delivering poor services, it's delivering fo poor footpaths, and it's concentrating on this big cell, big bang, inner city sugar hit for, for resources and for infrastructure while ignoring our suburbs. And I can only say that from one of the poorest, one of the wards that represents poorer communities in our city, we are failing. We are failing in what we deliver for those communities. And I will continue, as will the, the, this side of the chamber, to hold the administration to account with their poor performance for the delivery of active transport in our city. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. Further speakers, Councillor McLaughlin. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I rise to speak on Program One, and in particular, the allocations at 1.2.2.2, the City Glider Services. And let me start with the announcement in regard to the uh, Gold City Glider, um, Mr. Chair. Investing in and building a business case for a potential new City Glider service linking Hamilton to Woolloongabba is welcomed by Hamilton Ward residents, and is particularly pleasing for me personally. I've been advocating for such a link since 2007, the year after, the year after I was first elected as the councillor for Hamilton. A, a Hamilton to Woolloongabba connection was included as a target service to be provided 
subject to upgraded roadway capacity in the Mass Transit Investigation Task Force that the Lord Mayor asked me to chair in 2007. Uh, the work of the task force led directly to the introduction of what is now called the Blue City Glider Service, linking Tenerife to West End through the city. In regard to a Hamilton to Gabba connection, the task force took into account the then recently announced decision of the BD Bly governments to create a priority development area in North Shore Hamilton with a projected population of 15 to 20,000 residents and thousands of daytime jobs in the precinct. And when asked how people are going to get there and get out of there every day, the government had no solutions. No concern or care for what was going to happen to the road network without the provision of public transport. Now, the Transport Minister of the day, to his credit, Paul Lucas, for a while flew the flag for a heavy rail connection extension from the Doomben line, but he had no support from his Cabinet. There were vague commitments for the construction of two new CityCat terminals, which remain on the EDQ books, by the way, uh, but which would do nothing in reality to move the numbers of people who would need to rely on public transport to get to and from this high-growth area. Uh, Mr Chair, the Mass Transit Investigation Task Force knew back then that a Hamilton to Woolloongabba service would become necessary as that priority development area developed, but only after an investment in roadway infrastructure. And we've got it now, Mr Chair, we've got it now. The delivery under budget of the Kingsford Smith Drive upgrade, the award-winning KSD upgrade, has delivered the additional roadway capacity to now allow planning for a Hamilton to Woolloongabba city glider service. What will be called the Gold City Glider has always been considered necessary in the expansion of City Glider services, but was always dependent on the provision of critically needed road infrastructure upgrades. Now, there was a time when half-decent opposition leaders in this place knew this. First, Milton Dick, then Shane Sutton. They knew that as soon as Paul Lucas's heavy rail option died on the vine, the only way to deliver public transport options to and from the Hamilton priority development area would be along Kingston Smith Drive. They were political professionals. They backed the KSD upgrade because they knew it was necessary to accommodate the Hamilton priority development targets set by the state government. Just get on with it, they said. Just get on with it, they told us. Those smarts were lost to the ALP when the amateurs took over and they did a 180 on their party's previous support. Mr Chair, history now tells us what Brisbane residents thought of the Labor Party's latter-day position on Kingsley Smith Drive. Their numbers in this place get smaller and smaller every election. Last election, they spent a cool million or more targeting KSD works as their key attack line, only to get exactly nowhere. All the time, wise heads, the professionals in their party, like Paul Lucas, like Milton Dick, like Shay Sutton, knew precisely why the KSD infrastructure upgrade was vital to provide for the public transport needs to service the state's priority development area. The allocation of funding for the business case for the Gold Coast City Glider is the direct, the direct consequence of the planning started in 2007 and the commitment of Lord Mayors Newman, Quirk and Schrinner to deliver infrastructure needed to accommodate our city's growth. I'm sure the state government will come to the party. In fact, the Department of Transport and Main Roads has written to Council just recently about, quote, a passenger transport planning study between the Hamilton North Shore area and Bowen Hills, requesting Council to participate. Of course we will. Of course we will. TMR knows that it's only possible, though, following the completion of the KSD widening. Mr Chair, the first city glider service provided under 1.2.2.2, born from the 2007 task force, continues to be extraordinarily popular. The service that begins in Councillor Howard's ward, connects through my ward before moving through to Councillor Shree's ward and then returns, is expanding. We'll see new articulated buses rolling out in the second half of 2021 under this service. The 18 bigger buses are longer and carry an extra 40 passengers. Since starting, over 25 and a half million passengers have used the Blue City Glider service. 1.6 million passengers completed around 81,000 trips from July 2020 to the end of May 2021, a fantastic achievement for which we can give thanks to the vision of the then Lord Mayor Campbell Newman, delivered under service 1.2.2.2 and now improved by Lord Mayor Adrian Schrinner. Uh, Mr Chair, I also want to speak briefly on 1.1.3.1, the Green Bridges Program. 
and in particular the Breakfast Creek Green Bridge. I've talked earlier about the visionary Lord Mayors Newman and Quirk and their commitment to building city infrastructure. We see it again here now with the vision of Lord Mayor Adrian Schrinner to deliver new bridges for our city. I'm excited about the natural extension of the hugely popular Loris Bonnie Riverwalk with the Breakfast Creek Green Bridge to connect Albion to Newstead with a modern DDA compliant bikeway and footpath creating a functional active transport link across Breakfast Creek which will feed into the always improving active transport links through to the city. I commend the Chair of the Program, Councillor Murphy, and his team for the great work they're doing on behalf of our residents and visitors to deliver public and active transport for our city. <laughs> Further speakers, Councillor Cook. Ooh, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, I rise to speak on Program 1. OK, so we might start with green bridges. Um, let's take a step back in time uh, to when these green bridges were first announced by the Lord Mayor. It was uh, the big, as has been described here, a pet project and a legacy for Lord Mayor Adrian Schrinner. Uh, Councillor Mackay uh, went to great lengths to explain how important this project was for the Mayor and how it was the thing that would define him as a mayor. Fa fast forward to, to today, um, we are years on from that commitment. We have now found out that they were never fully funded. There was never the money there to build five green bridges. Just, just a slight, slight, slight mistake there from, from the mayor in his uh, ah, few hundred million who, 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 who really needs the details when it comes to green bridges. Um, but most interesting about this is that it's very clear now um, that this pet project and legacy for this Lord Mayor was nothing more than a vanity project. It was nothing more than duping the people in, of this city into thinking they were going to get more and more and more, but then delivering less and less and less. On the other hand, we'll jack up your rates, we'll charge you more and more and more, and give you less and less and less. We will promise to deliver five green bridges and then end up delivering two, maybe three. We'll see how we go, if we get money. If we get money from other levels of government, which we have had no commitment to receive. Today, 12 months on uh, from the last budget, where we thought we were going to see uh, five green bridges, we've had petitions in my local area calling for the fifth green bridge to be allocated east of the Story Bridge. Thousands, well, over a thousand people have signed that petition calling for a green bridge for the eastern suburbs. Recently, I did a poll on this exact same issue. We had over 3,000 people respond to that poll calling for a green bridge in the eastern suburbs. Now, today, in the budget, we have seen that it's unlikely there will be a fifth green bridge. There's no commitment to location, there's no commitment to funding. Uh, when we raised this, when we petitioned, when we called the LNP administration out to deliver for the eastern suburbs, what do they do? Their go-to call card, blame the state government, there's a secret report. This is the state government's fault. If they want it, they should fund it. Mr Chair, um, once again, trying to hide, duck and weave from the people of this city around their complete and utter failure to deliver. This is all about, and was always about, getting publicity and not actually delivering. Which brings me to fairies. The shameful story of this city's fairies. So, last year, after the election, not long after the election, we see an announcement. 5 p.m. on a Friday, fairies, monohull fairies, danger, disaster, rip them off the water, cancelled, cancelled. No consultation, no no notice at all to the people in my suburbs who rely on these services. At the time, the Lord Mayor came out and claimed uh, that I was, you know, whipping up hysteria. It was scaremongering. 
Look out. You know, Councillor Cook, she's always trying to find a way to, you know, just say something that's going to make us sound like we're doing something wrong. I will bring them back. That's what he said. I will bring them back. I'll bring those fairies back. I promise I'll bring them back. Here we are, uh, 12 months later, and in this budget, we're seeing the return. Well, sorry, no, we're not seeing the return. We're seeing a commitment to funding, some funding. We don't know how much it's going to cost. It could cost more. Even when the announcement was made, it could cost more uh, to deliver these three ferries back to the water. Three of nine. It's embarrassing. It's embarrassing that this LNP administration does not have the ability to properly maintain basic public transport in this city. It is Adrian Schrinner and the LNP that left those ferries to rot. This is not about pointing the finger at anyone else except for at them. 67% of all ferry monoholes have been cut. They're not coming back, but the announcement that we see out of this budget is, I'm repairing ferries, I'm bringing back services after you cut all of them in the first place. The people of this city aren't silly. They know what's going on. They know who's cutting their services. The people of Norman Park know who's cutting their services. The Norman Park Ferry Terminal last year decommissioned. No services for that suburb. What was a two minute trip across the river is now over 45 minutes via car or bus. More congestion. Thousands of cars back onto Wynnum Road alone. If the Lord Mayor had even bothered to turn up to the meeting with those residents, over 350 of them, or Councillor Murphy had bothered to turn up to that meeting, he would have heard, both of them would have heard firsthand from those residents the direct impact this has had on them. They would have heard from Norman Park resident Luke, who is legally blind. He came to our ferry ra rally uh, two, three weeks ago now. He came to that rally because he is so upset about the cutting of this service. He lives a few doors down from the ferry and he told his story at that rally about the impact this has had on him. He has now had his mode of public transport that he can use cut. He can't get now across to the river, the other side of the river, for his shopping, uh, for his doctor's appointments. That was his only form of public transport that he could use. And he said to us, this was even more of a slap in the face because DDA compliance is relied upon as the reason that not only it needs to be upgraded, but the cost of that is the reason it can't be delivered. That is just shameful, Mr Chair. Absolutely shameful that the most vulnerable people some of the most vulnerable people in our city now have no access to public transport under Adrian Schrinner. How embarrassing. Basic public services, public transport services in this city are failing to be delivered. But yet we see increases in funding to things like living in Brisbane newsletters. He chooses self-promotion over the people of this city every single time. He chooses pet projects and legacy over the people of this city every single time. This is not a budget for the suburbs. This is a budget for Adrian Schrinner's self-promotion and nothing else. This is wrong and we will continue to fight for the people of this city and particularly the people in the suburbs who just want basic services, yeah, yeah. public transport, footpaths, yeah, yeah. basic transport and basic services that are all about connectivity. Mr Chair, um, I would like to move an amendment to the budget, which will be emailed through now. And the amendment is this. 
that Council reallocates $2 million from advertising and marketing expenses in this program to a new project called Upgrade Norman Park Ferry Terminal under Service 1.2.1.1, Enhance the Ferry Infrastructure Network. Seconded. Uh, Councillor Cook, I received advice during the break that uh, for a amendment to be valid during the debate, an item has to be identified within the program area, not a general item, but a specific item. And therefore, I will... Um, look, I will allow this one, because I did not provide you this information beforehand. However, uh, future amendments will have to identify the item within the program itself, not another program. Thank you. Councillor Cook. Uh, so there's an amendment proposed by Councillor Cook, seconded by Councillor Cassidy. Um, as I said, the, uh, the information that I have just provided to you will be provided to all councillors uh, in the near future. Um, Councillor Cook, you've provided that electronically to the clerks. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr Chair. And whilst you're providing that explanation about um, what needed to happen with this amendment, and we'll take that advice on notice, um, on the other side of the chamber, Councillor Murphy sat there laughing, giggling to himself about this amendment. He thinks it's funny. The Chair of Public and Active Transport in this city thinks it's funny to cut public transport services, and then he thinks it's funny when this side of the yeah, chamber point of order stands to you, up... Councillor Murphy. Um, claim to be misrepresented. No, uh, you'll be when, called upon at the end of the, uh, the uh, presentation. Councillor When Cook. this side of the chamber stands up to stick up for their local area and stick up for the people of this city, he thinks that that's a joke. He thinks it's a joke. He thinks it's funny Can that Cook, on his Councillor watch... Cook, can I ask you to, um, to uh, move to the substance of the amendment, please? He thinks it's funny that on his watch we have seen nine monoholes ripped from the water. We've seen a complete lack of maintenance for those services. We've seen the decommissioning of the Norman Park Ferry Terminal on his watch. He's been the chair of public and active transport whilst these cuts have been made. Adrian Schrinner has been the mayor of this city while those cuts have been made. It's in the LNP's DNA. Cuts, cuts, cuts. Whilst racking up rates across the city and cutting the services. This amendment will mean that the residents of Norman Park have a ferry service. Currently, they have none. The administration has said, that's OK, go to the next terminal. The next terminal is not an easy walk. It is not easily accessible for those residents who live in Norman Park. This administration says, don't worry, you've got other, you've got other bus stops. Just catch a bus. What was a two-minute journey is now over 45 minutes by bus. <coughs> Residents, like I said, like Luke, who is legally blind, cannot understand why this terminal, which needed a disability compliance upgrade, would be cut, would be cut, not upgraded, cut. So this amendment is calling for a specific project to be created to upgrade Norman Park Ferry Terminal. We know the cost is roughly $7 million, although questions have been asked by the locals around that costing, but we know that we think it's around $7 million. We think that $2 million reallocated from this Lord Mayor's shameful advertising and marketing into genuine community services and public transport is a good place to start. Get the planning underway and deliver for these residents of Norman Park who have been left, quite frankly, high and dry by this LNP administration. Further speakers to the, further speakers to the amendment? The amendment, Councillor Cassidy. Uh, yeah, sure, Chair. I was absolutely sure that um, Councillor Murphy would get up then because he was uh, so offended at the suggestion that he was giggling away. Uh, and we all saw that. We all saw that. Oh, sorry, you're, you're correct, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor Cassidy. Could you just uh, give me a moment? Councillor Murphy, you had a misrepresentation. Yes, Chair. No, I, I wasn't giggling away. What um, Councillor Cook suggested I was, I was sharing a joke with Councillor Allen, actually. 
Councillor Cassidy. Well, they all, they all think public transport cuts are a joke over there, uh, don't they? Uh, the Lord Mayor's own oh, point of order goodness. to you. Uh, claim to be misrepresented. To you, Councillor Adams. No, claim to be you're, misrepresented. You'll be called upon at the end. Uh, yeah, Cassidy. the Deputy Mayor has point, spoken point on this item. <clears throat> point of order, Councillor Johnston. Yes, uh, Mr Chairman. Just to be clear, um, the misrepresentation, as I understand it, is where a part of a person's speech has been misunderstood. Councillor um, Adams has not spoken in the debate today, so I'm not sure how she can be misrepresented yeah, no. under the rules. OK, thank you. I will consider it while Councillor Cassidy is speaking. Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. The, the, this administration, the LNP knew knew that this ferry terminal needed to be upgraded. Uh, they knew uh, that there had to be a program for DDA compliance, just like they knew every bus stop in Brisbane had to be upgraded, and we've heard earlier from Councillor Griffiths, but that program's been gutted. So they've known for a long time that the Norman Park ferry terminal needed to be upgraded to meet DDA compliance. They also knew uh, that when they announced, when the Lord Mayor went out and announced that all the monohull ferries would be back, that this would be a temporary closure. Uh, that was, that's what was said to the community uh, after that dead of night uh, decision to, to pull those boats uh, from the river. Uh, we were told that the Kitty Cats would be a temporary addition to the river uh, while the, the, the nine monohull ferries were repaired. And yet we find out today in the, in the budget and in the information sessions over the last week that now on Councillor Murphy's watch and Adrian Schrinner's watch, uh, that only three of those publicly owned boats will be returning to the river. Uh, Councillor Murphy refused to tell us what the ongoing cost of hiring those kitty cats uh, would be for the people of Brisbane and refused to say whether we would need them in the long term. Well, all of that money, if they hadn't mismanaged uh, the maintenance of those ferries, those monohull ferries, could have been used up to upgrade the Norman Park ferry terminal. Now, the, the community out there, I've been out there with Councillor Cook and listened to that community. They're not calling for a whiz-bang city cat terminal. They're not calling uh, for, for every service under the sun to come past that, that ferry terminal. What they want is a service. They want a public transport service. Uh, it is a public transport service that the public pays for. They all pay rates, we all pay rates and pool them together to provide those services in suburbs right around Brisbane. But again, what we're seeing <coughs> is suburbs missing out. Uh, the suburbs are missing out. I want to use the Lord Mayor's own words. He said this, uh, he said this in, uh, in, in some media comments uh, around his budget on Budget Day on Wednesday last week. He said, if we don't invest in public transport and we don't get people back onto public transport services, congestion will kill Brisbane. Well, the Lord Mayor's own political decision and Councillor Murphy's own political decision in this budget to remove public transport services from suburbs and Councillor Cook's ward uh, is, in his own words, going to kill Brisbane. That's his own words, Chair. Uh, so this is a very sensible amendment to get the ball rolling. Uh, what the, the cost that Councillor Murphy quoted was for a new city cat terminal. Uh, we know that to provide, to provide services to that community, that's not needed. That, that's not needed. And they know, they know uh, what is actually needed. But uh, again, these secret decisions are being made behind closed doors and they won't come clean with the people of Brisbane. Uh, and our suburbs are missing out. We're seeing record high rates, Chair. Residents are being forced to pay more and more and more and get less and less and less in our suburbs. Uh, Councillor Adams, in, re on, in response to the uh, claim to be misrepresented, Section 52.1. Oh, sorry. So I was just saying, in section 52.1, uh, a councillor may make a personal explanation to, in relation to some material part of the councillor's former speech made during the course of the current meeting. And I apologise, but because there is no former speech, I cannot call upon you. Are there any further speakers uh, to the amendment? Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes, um, just very briefly. Um, I think if that $2 million had gone onto footpaths, this might be a little bit more problematic uh, to support. Um, but as the LNP voted against that, um, we know that they are investing a huge amount in, um, uh, in uh, marketing and communications, and I'd be very happy to see that money go on supporting public transport in an area where the residents have been calling for it to be fixed up, replaced, um, and would do good uh, in our transport network. So I support the amendment. Further speakers to the amendment? Any, f any further speakers? Councillor Cook. You have five minutes in response. Thank you, Mr Chair. I'll be brief. Um, 
What we are going to see um, today, I suspect, given that there have been not one, not one member of the LNP who is willing to stand up and defend their position when it comes to the Norman Park Ferry. It's a real uh, indicator and a real uh, reflection on people's character when they're happy to say things behind closed doors, make decisions that impact the people of this city without explanation, leave letters in their mailbox telling them that their services have been cut effective immediately, um, then their opportunity to get up in this place where we all come and defend those decisions, they're not willing to do that. The chair of public and active transport is not willing to stand up and speak to this amendment. He's happy to have a joke with his mate next to him, but he's not happy to stand up and say why and explain his position. He's not happy to do it here. He's not happy to do it at public meetings. He's now refusing to meet with residents who asked to meet with him on this issue. It just says everything you really need to know about this LNP administration. Arrogant, Arrogant out of touch, not doing what's in the best interests of the, this, the people of this city. All they care about is themselves. All they care about, and through this motion it's very clear, is not real allocating money from advertising and marketing themselves to genuine services like public transport and like upgrading the Norman Park Ferry Terminal, that really says all you need to know about this administration. I'm proud to go back to my community and say that we tried again. They're not going to stop fighting. They're not going to give up on the Norman Park Ferry Terminal and nor will the Labor Party. Mr Chair, I encourage all members of the Chamber to think very carefully about how they vote on this motion. I encourage the Chair of Public and Active Transport, Ryan Murphy, to think very carefully about he, how he will vote on this motion because ultimately how he votes in this motion will say everything that everyone needs to know about his approach to public and active transport in this city. So, Mr Chair, um, we will be supporting this motion and I hope to see members of the other side support it too and confirm their commitment to delivering public transport for the city. Thank you. I'll now put the amendment. All those in favour of the amendment, please say aye. Aye. Those against, please say no. No. The noes have it. Division. Division. Division called by Councillor Cook and Councillor Cassidy. Please ring the bells. Councillors, all those in favour of the amendment, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Those against, please say no and raise your hand. No. Clerks, please read the result when you're ready. Mr Chair, the noes have it. The voting being six in favour and 16 against. The noes have it. We'll proceed to substantive uh, debate. Are there any further speakers? Councillor Adaman. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, I rise to speak about Program 1, Transport for, uh, for Brisbane, and commend the Schwinner Council's public and active transport initiatives, of which there are many. First, I want to place on record my appreciation for the opportunity to serve on the Public and Active Transport Committee. This is a very act, uh, important and exciting time for Brisbane as we roll out an array of public transport and public safety initiatives and embrace new leading-edge technologies in the delivery of these services. 
Credit must go to the Public and Active Transport Committee Chair, Councillor Murphy, whose knowledge, passion and enthusiasm for overseeing the implementation of these services is there for all to see. He is helping lay the groundwork to ensure Brisbane is well and truly prepared to meet the public transport challenges of the future, and in particular for the Olympic Games in 2032, should we be fortunate enough to be granted hosting rights next month. The evidence is there in black and white in the 21-22 Schrinner Council's budget. Front and centre is our signature project, the Brisbane Metro, which will deliver an all-electric, high-capacity, turn-up-and-go public transport system designed to link the city to the suburbs. It's all about delivering key bikeways, facilities and links through the Active Transport Infrastructure Fund. It's about being the world leader in rolling out the e-mobility to meet the demand of a growing number of people embracing this new form of travel. It's about creating a pedestrian and cyclist friendly CBD. It's about rolling out a trial of electric buses which not only provide a smoother, comfortable ride but contribute to a cleaner city through zero tailpipe emissions and reduced operational noise. It's about a green bridge program and next generation city cats, to name just a few of the Schrinner Council's commitments. Chair, in the time available to me today, I, would, I want to address the public transport issues and challenges that residents face in the Pullenvale ward that I represent. A question I often hear is, what's in it for us with these new services? My answer is, a lot. As an example, the Metro will have a knock-on effect, whether it's through provision of more regular and efficient services to the suburbs. This in turn will hopefully lead to more people using public transport and less driving cars on congested roads such as the Western Freeway and Mogul Road. But more on that soon. Chair, the first initiative I want to speak about is the personalised public transport program, which was established back in 2005. Black and white cabs are contracted to work with Council to deliver this service, which involves taking passengers to nearby transport hubs where they can connect with the existing Translink bus and or rail services. Three of the eight PPT services in Brisbane are in the Pullenvale ward. This is due in part to the sparseness of my ward where Translink have deemed it not economic to provide a full PT service to the western parts. As a result, PPTs go a long way to filling that void. The Karana Downs and Brookfield PPTs are well supported and funded again in this year's next year's budget. I thank the Schrinner Council for that. Last year, at the request of a large number of residents in the Belbari and Mogul areas, I advocated for a PPT service there and was successful in securing a trial. It's fair to say that this service to date has not been as popular as the other two, but I believe that can change. So I'm pleased that additional funds were provided in the budget for an extension of that trial. The reason I believe patronage can improve is based on the opening of the new Mogul Village shopping centre last week. This centre is the first major infrastructure project of its type in that area for about 45 years and has already been embraced and supported strongly by the local community. I believe that with the proposed realignment of the route to include the new shopping centre and the Mogul State School across the road, we will see improved patronage on this service. But as I've said to the local community many times, we must ultimately use it to ensure we don't lose it. Uh, Chair, it's no secret that I have a large number of senior residents in my ward. They have paid their taxes and worked hard over many years. It's an important that we recognise and reward them for their contribution to the city. Yeah, yeah. Which is why the Schrinner Council was proud to introduce the free off-peak travel for seniors initiative in October 2019. Not only does this service help get people out of, out of cars and onto ferries and buses, it provides real social and economic benefits for Brisbane's elderly population. Free off-peak travel helps our seniors move around the city, connect with family and friends, participate in more leisure opportunities and make the most of what Brisbane has to offer. The Schwinner Council entirely funds the cost of this initiative and the benefits are not insignificant. Seniors are able to travel free on our ferries Monday to Friday between 7, 8, 7 p.m. and 6 a.m. and 8.30 a.m. and 3.30 p.m. and all day on public holidays. That fall on a weekday. 
They are also able to travel for free on our buses Monday to Friday between 7pm and 6am and 8.30am and 3.30pm as well as on weekends and public holidays. Another important initiative in my ward is the Safer Paths to Schools program. This delivers safer connections for students to walk, scoot and cycle to school through safer pathways and missing footpaths on streets linking to local primary and high schools. Last year, the, uh, the Schrinner Council provided funds for a missing footpath near the Mogul State School. And I know that was appreciated by Principal Nathan Freeman, his school council and PNC. And in 21-22, I'm pleased that Chapel Hill State School, a school with which my family has had a strong association with over many years, is one of 15 schools that will benefit from this program. And I'm guessing Principal Stuart Jones will be just as enthusiastic about this when I give him the good news. Uh, Mr. Sh uh, Mr Chair, I share Councillor Mackay's excitement that the Schrinner Council, in conjunction with the Morrison Federal Government, has committed funding to the 21-22 budget to make the Indrapilly Roundabout Project a reality. It's no secret that traffic congestion, particularly on Mogul Road, is one of the biggest issues for residents in the western suburbs. I've no doubt that the solution for the Indrapilly Roundabout despite it being in the neighbouring Walter Taylor Ward, will have a positive impact for many motorists in my community who use Mogul Road to and from work every day. The commitment by the federal and local government LNP administrations is in stark contrast to that of the state Labor government at the Kenmore Roundabout, four kilometres further along Mogul Road. If the state was genuinely serious about traffic congestion in the western suburbs, they would have come up with a much better solution for the roundabout, such as an overpass similar to Windrapilly, rather than cheap option utilising traffic lights, uh, traffic lights only. And I've lost my page. Just bear with me. Um, the state's measly contribution of $12.5 million after being dragged kicking and screaming to the table by the federal government was never going to be enough to fix the problem. TMR officials have even admitted privately that their solution using traffic lights only, uh, would, only would lead to greater congestion rather than improving it. So they should not have been surprised at the level of opposition received from the local community and business groups during the recent public consultation. The community basically told them to sharpen their pencil and open their purse strings a little more and look at a solution similar to what is proposed at Indrapilly. But I'm not holding my breath. Uh, Chair, in conclusion, the Schrinner Council has a vision for Brisbane to see that more of the residents and visitors choose to move around the city via bus and ferry rather than private vehicles. This administration is committed to growing Brisbane's transport network and services into the future. And at the end of the day, world-class public transport means fewer cars on the road and more sub, uh, services for the suburbs, which can only be a good thing. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Toomey. Thank you, Chair. I rise to speak on Program 1, Transport for Brisbane, and I thank Councillor Murphy for the opportunity to speak on such an important program for our city and its future. Mr Chairman, we've heard Labor talk today about the Monohull Ferries, so let's take a look at their record. Under Labor's watch, the residents of Brisbane witnessed one of Brisbane's largest public transport disasters when one-fifth of our city's public transport infrastructure went up in smoke. In today's terms, in today's terms, the loss would be equivalent to 275 buses, five city cats and one kitty cat removed from the network. In contrast, this Schrinner Council is building a diverse, modern public transport focused on moving people across our great city and is now ranked in the top 10 of the world's most livable cities. We have an e-mobility strategy to support and guide new and progressive methods of transport for residents and visitors. Transport for Brisbane's commercial and contract service managers operate the agreements to ensure the alignment with the community's feedback during the development of that strategy. We will soon see the introduction of 800, 800 electric bikes and 2,000 e-scooters to provide more options 
for getting around our city. Mr Chairman, the Shrinner Council is investing and delivering bikeways, shared pathways and links through the Active Transport Infrastructure Fund. This fund continues to invest in our suburbs and I'm very grateful for the suburban connections to schools, public transport and shopping centres this fund has provided across the northwest corner. Green bridges will change the way we move around our beloved city. I was truly honoured to join school captains of the Fernie Grove State School and Principal Brett Shackleton, along with Lord Mayor Adrian Schrinner to officially open the first green bridge of this council's administration over Cedar Creek and Fernie Grove. Now, while this modest bridge doesn't span hundreds of metres across a river or provide a connection to thousands of residents to access the suburbs, it does have the same effect on the community as the Kangaroo Point or Breakfast Creek Bridge will have. They all provide a much needed connection between where we live and where we need to be. Green bridges make it easier to walk, ride a bike or use some other form of personal mobility device to get away from traffic. Safer paths to schools programs has changed the way many students access the Fernie Grove State School in the suburb of Fernie Grove. The school's active travel increased so dramatically, the PNC built a new bike cage to accommodate the additional students riding to school. I'm very supportive of creating safer paths to school program, and I encourage those schools who are beneficiaries of the program this year to take advantage of the additional infrastructure the Shrinner Council is putting into place for our students. Mr Chairman, many residents in my ward and yours access the city for work and play. In fact, I know residents in my ward cycled to the city have been able to do so crossing no major roads for years passing through your ward. I can foresee an increase in bicycle movements through our ward, increasing as our city becomes more and more pedestrian and cycle friendly. We make bold changes to improve walking, cycling, e-wheeling in this city uh, to make it more accessible for workers and residents and also visitors. I look forward to seeing our city deliver and tying in the Adelaide Street vision between Edward Street and North Quay with progress of the Brisbane Metro for our residents and visitors to enjoy. Mr Chairman, one of the more obscure requests I've received in my office as a result of a Google misrepresenting Inogra Creek for the Brisbane River, Councillor McLaughlin, I received a request for a city cat service from Walton Bridge to the city. Now, while I know it's very difficult for the city to build a ferry terminal in the gap, it did give me cause to reflect on how good our ferry terminals are. And they are the start and end of over 5.4 million journeys. These terminals are all along our river, are the interface between our city and our suburbs, cultural areas and places of recreation and play. For visitors, this is the very first introduction to the Shriner Council's unique CityCat service and ensuring our terminals are well maintained, easily accessed to gangways and have additional seating to enjoy river vistas. This is vital for the best experience on the river. We are enhancing and improving our ferry terminals all the time with an enhanced look and feel, better signage and flood resilient gangways. And I take pride in taking visitors to this city on the river to show off what we actually have. Mr Chairman, with more city cats on the river than the Cat Cuddle Cafe at Red Hill, uh, we are delivering a world-class service that is getting better and better. Our fleet of 22 city cats has expanded with the addition of the next generation city cat, or I like to refer them as a pampered cat. Why pampered? Well, they've got larger decks, they've got better viewing, the stern has additional seating for bikes and luggage, pampered. There is an upper deck and better views from there. Improved viewing areas for mobility scooters and wheelchairs. USB charging ports 
hearing loops, large tables and seatings, and it's all built locally. Our cats are keeping our shipwrights busy, building skills and knowledge locally, a great outcome for our tradies. Mr Chair, when I first arrived to Brisbane in the Sawley era, uh, you needed to climb into and out of a bus. The air conditioning was a combination of fresh air mixed with burnt diesel that came through the sliding glass window. You remember those? They used to get yeah, stuck. Yep. And the seats were as sticky as an inner city pub during summer. <laughs> How things have changed. Mr Chairman, it was a Liberal administration that began the modernising of our bus fleet. The bus fleet we have today is 1,250 strong, with low floors, easy access, air conditioning that doesn't involve diesel, and on the odd balmy day, it's a fantastic way to get to work. And now we have USB charging ports for the Instagram set. Today, our buses carry more than 8 million passengers across our city each year. The bus fleet has continued to evolve along with our residents, visitors and our city's needs. We have progressively been converting our buses from standard diesel to natural gas to the latest Euro 6 low emission diesel technology that is more environmentally friendly than a natural gas powered engine. The Srinik Council's trial of fully electric rigid buses is an evolutionary step for the buses in this city and I share my excitement for the city's future with my residents. Mr Chairman, I'll finish where I started. The Srinik Council is lighting a bright future for mobility in this city, a future that will burn brighter than any administration before it. We are pushing ahead with mass transport options that will deliver benefits to the suburbs for decades to come. We are providing choice and flexibility for all, not just the able. We are reducing our transport carbon footprint and ensure, ensuring the air is more clear tomorrow than it is today. We are ensuring transport in Brisbane continues to evolve to provide the best options for our residents and visitors to move around our great city and experience in a world-class comfort. The Srinik Council is making the Brisbane of tomorrow even better than the Brisbane of today, and I commend the program to the Chamber. Further speakers? Further speakers? Councillor Cumming. Thank you, Mr Chair. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, I'll just be uh, brief. Uh, I won't go back uh, to what uh, the type of reminiscence of uh, Councillor Toomey. And uh, next, I thought he was going to talk. Next, next, I thought he was going to he was going to talk about horse-drawn carriages. That'd be the next thing he'd be on. To. <laughs> so uh, yes, in, in relation to Program One Transport for Brisbane, look. From the start, Brisbane Metro has been a con job. A metro is an underground rail system. Brisbane Metro is not a metro. Uh, met the metro will benefit people predominantly on the southern outskirts of Brisbane. That's where the, sort of the terminus is. And I believe many of them will be from Logan City, actually. And uh, so, uh, yeah, spending a lot of uh, Brisbane ratepayer money to benefit re residents of Logan City. The second main uh, route from uh, Royal Brisbane Hospital to UQ will be of great benefit to a very select group, and that would be UQ medicine students. And uh, so they'll be great beneficiaries as well. The project's been poorly planned from the start. It's already amounted a cost blow up of 300 million. Not a single shovel has hit the ground. The budget's all about self-promotion. It's not a budget for the suburbs. And in the entire Transport for Brisbane program spend is on a poorly planned inner city project to get, and, and Logan City projects to get this Lord Mayor's face on TV. Now, the green bridges, well, dear, oh dear, they are very much a second best. As we all know, the only fair dinkum green bridge in Brisbane is the Eleanor Chanel Bridge from Dutton Park to the University of Queensland. It's fair dinkum because it includes the mass transport option of buses. And I've got to say, it's been a great success uh, for, for university students from my ward who catch the train 
uh, up into the inner city and then get the bus or uh, walk across the bridge to, to university and it saved them uh, half an hour and a more each way on their trips to, to UQ. And uh, my uh, older son also used that uh, facility when he went to university. Uh, the, uh, the bridges uh, that only include cycles are by definition, definition, in my view, not fair dinkum green bridges. Also, riding cycles in Brisbane, I'm, I'm concerned about this, it's, it can be quite a dangerous activity and, uh, uh, and uh, I fear for uh, cyclists who uh, go riding along, mixing with motor vehicles and uh, especially when we've got the Lord Mayor at one stage, I don't know if he's still got this, that view that uh, it, helmets shouldn't be compulsory uh, because uh, I think that is very foolish behaviour for anyone not to wear a helmet uh, uh, when they're riding their cycle in Brisbane. Uh, the uh, Brisbane Metro, it's already, when you look at the funding item, it's already sp split into three. It's got Brisbane Metro Capital, Brisbane Metro Operational Expenses, Transport to Brisbane, Brisbane Metro Stage 2. It's sort of like a, one of those animals that, you know, you, get, you chop off a bit and another bit sp sprouts out sort of thing, uh, one of those things. And it's, uh, and it's gobbling up more and more money, more and more money every year. And by, by year four, it'll be $480 million, $480 million that it's gobbling up and uh, still there'll be nothing, nothing on the road. So uh, it's a... Uh, as I said, it's a con job and it, uh, it's not uh, anything that this administration should be in any way, uh, any way uh, proud of because it's been a failure to date and it'll be a very limited benefit in future. Further speakers? Any further speakers? Uh, Councillor Murphy, would you care to respond? Thank you very much, Chair, and I thank uh, all those thank who participated in the debate on Program 1. I um, want to thank particularly uh, Councillor Owen, Councillor Huang, uh, Councillor Adaman uh, and Councillor Toomey uh, for your well-considered contribution to the debate. And I could see the glint in Councillor McLaughlin's eye um, when he started talking about the long-awaited gold city glider. Um, Chair, look, as I've said, the next financial year will see over half a billion dollars invested in the city's public transport network and uh, our active travel networks. Um, over the last week and today, we've heard uh, from Councillor Cassidy in his budget reply um, a lot of personal attacks, a lot of trivial tantrums um, and plain mistruths, and um, especially on footpaths, and I'll get to that a little bit later. Um, we know that Labor has different priorities than the Schrinner Council, but it's very disappointing that today they have failed to engage in any meaningful debate about policy or to present any alternative plan for our city. What's the saying, Chair? Disappointed, but not surprised. Um, according to Councillor Cassidy, the Srinagar Council doesn't see public transport as a priority. And yet it's our council that's delivering record investment in buses, in ferries, in metro, but apparently it's us who don't prioritise public transport. He talked about a $100,000 cut to public transport planning. He proved yet again that he doesn't know how to read a budget book because um, our investment in public, training, uh, pub public transport planning through the forward estimates is not only in the Gold City Glider, uh, what we've also allocated, but there's an, a huge amount in the Brisbane Metro forward planning uh, for the network. And that grows through the forward estimates, Chair, to a quarter of a billion dollars, the largest investment in public and active transport of any council in the country. Now, uh, on Brisbane Metro, Councillor Cassidy repeats again and again and again um, that not a single shovel has hit the ground on Brisbane Metro. Um, and if he walked across Victoria Bridge, he would have seen, Chair, the four intersections we've upgraded for Metro, the tunnel boring that's happening under Grey Street, the uh, works that are happening further south in Rochdale. And it's true, Chair, um, and I could table these uh, so that Councillor Cassidy has a copy. It's true that we don't use shovels or um, spades, as Councillor Strunk said, to dig these things. We use excavators. Um, but I could tell you certainly that ground has been broken on Brisbane Metro and ground uh, will continue to be broken on Brisbane Metro in the coming year. 
Um, and, you know, particularly, Chair, I don't think he'll be able to miss this one because I know he doesn't get out of the northeastern suburbs much, but construction is coming right to Adelaide Street. Right here, we'll be mining a tunnel underneath Adelaide Street, so he won't even need to go far to see the dirt being dug. Now, um, he talked about communications, Chair. Now, we know that projects like Brisbane Metro need to be well communicated to Brisbane residents. Metro will change the way that 78 million people commute annually around Brisbane. And so any uh, responsible council would consult and would communicate those changes. Councillor Cassie likes to suggest that um, we're being reckless in our approach for communications for Metro. And in the last week, we've seen the $1.6 million figure waved around again. But actually, we're incredibly proud to be spreading the word about Metro. It's our responsibility to do so. And we're going to talk about Brisbane Metro a lot more in the coming year. We're going to make sure every person in this city knows about Brisbane Metro. The reality is, Chair, that the people of the City of Brisbane have never trusted this Labor team to deliver infrastructure projects. And it's no wonder why. They don't have a single day of experience in managing Australia's largest local government. Every mo motion that they've moved today has been incompetent. Um, Councillor Cassidy still has a lot of learning to do when it comes to delivering city-changing infrastructure projects, Chair. And I hope he isn't taking notes from his mates in George Street. He talks about blowouts. Well, Cross River Rail is shaping up to be one hell of a blowout. So much so that the federal government wouldn't even look twice at this project because the business case didn't stack up. We've seen another $1.4 billion in blowouts, and that's before they've ordered extra trains, signalling and rail yard works to be tacked on the back. Gold Coast Light Rail Stage 3 is blown out by $709 million to $1.044 billion, just a cheeky 47 per cent cost blowout. And Labor have pushed back construction of the Centenary Bridge to 2022, yet again. Metro is nothing like Labor's projects, Chair, and thank goodness for that. Now, where we've needed to change Brisbane Metro to ensure that it performs, we have done so. And where we think that additional projects should be delivered for the long term future benefit of Brisbane residents, like the Underground Cultural Centre Station, we'll continue talking about it. Now, let's not forget the only reason for delays in respect of design of the Cultural Centre is due to the Labor State Government. Um, so it's hilarious to sit here and hear the Labor opposition attack their own State Government for the delays that they caused on our project. Chair, um, on to ferries, we know that they have no concept of delivering public transport services that are value for money. And Councillor Cassidy and Cook stated again today that we cut public transport services. They're talking about the Norman Park Ferry, of course, which Councillor Cook continues to say should be up and running. This is the lowest patronised ferry service in history, um, which was cancelled twice previously by the Labor Party, back when Labor actually stood for something. Um, it was used by less than one person per trip, and this was the most common sense change to remove it, to deliver value for money uh, for ratepayers, something that Labor has opposed the entire way. If they can't support this change, you know they won't support any change that we make to the network. It's all about politics for them. It's not about people, despite what Councillor Cook said, or our customers. Chair, it was the Labor Party who scrapped Brisbane's tram network, as Councillor Toomey alluded to, and we've been playing catch-up ever since. They have no credibility on investing in extra public transport services. We heard um, Councillor Cook talk about the nine ferries. She says um, we let them rot. Now, this is the same Councillor Cook who jumped on radio right after we took them off the river and demanded that we put them back because it was uh, a light bulb missing or maybe a rope was uh, out of place. Um, who was she taking her talking points from then? The Maritime Union of Australia. And uh, how she's changed her tune since then, Chair. What an absolute mess they are over there. And they're asking us to put them in charge of the city. Um, she also said repeatedly that we weren't being upfront about the $7.6 million upgrade required to upgrade the Norman Park Terminal. But now she's finally changed her mind and decided that that is an accurate figure. But then incompetently she came in here and she asked for $2 million to complete the upgrade for some reason. Um, Chair, you cannot, you cannot put them in charge of Australia's largest local government. We've been really clear that public transport needs to have sustainable patronage numbers. And the Norman Park Ferry has never, ever met the bar for that. 
And of course, Chair, who could forget uh, the dog whistling that's happened the last few months on the electric bus trial led by the Leader of the Opposition? Uh, that's also getting very, very tiresome. Ranting about jobs uh, from Beijing is something we would expect from the Leader of One Nation, not the Leader of the Labor Party in this place. And we know. Chair, that if we were taking uh, auditions for which councillor would be the best councillor to be Pauline Hanson, then Councillor Cassidy already has his audition tape ready. He just has to go to YouTube and look up the last few council meetings because he's done a very good job of that. We're actually very proud to be pushing the boundaries, to be testing uh, new technology for a cleaner and greener fleet. And we won't apologise for these ambitions because if Councillor Cassidy had any integrity, he would come in here and he would apologise to the proud Australians who have been working with nine local suppliers to get the e-bus trial up and running, and also to the workers of the Brisbane-based company VDI who have been working to fit it out for us. Um, but of course, it's not only buses where this Leader of the Opposition misleads Brisbane residents. Today we heard the absolute furfies that he was telling about footpaths. Now, while in Program 1, I'm very proud to be able to deliver better connections to schools with an extra $1.6 million for safer paths to school, Cassidy knows full well that the bulk of our footpath investment has moved to Program 6. I'm sure Councillor Marks will elaborate, uh, but this budget sees an increased pool of funding available to deliver new and upgraded footpaths, more than $45 million. This includes nearly $15 million from the Suburban Enhancement Fund, where each of us in this chamber have the ability to identify and add to footpaths that are needed in our wards. He said the other day that we'll only deliver 18 footpaths this year, and yet last year, with a similar amount of footpath funding in Safer Paths to School in Program 1, do you know how many footpaths were delivered across Brisbane? 280. 280 new footpaths. So who's telling the truth? The Labor Party trying to make a political point? Or the reality that we delivered 280 footpaths across the city? And it is our budget. It's not your budget taking your interjection, Councillor Johnson. That's ratepayers' money to deliver footpaths. You're not a hero for building footpaths in your wards. Um, so, Chair, either Labor councillors aren't going to deliver any footpaths this coming year, and we'll, 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 we'll have a look at that and we'll see what happens. Uh, I'm sure the surveys will be landing as soon as the new financial year rolls out. Or Councillor Cassidy should apologise for scaring Murphy, Brisbane residents. Time has I won't hold my breath. All right. Uh, all, uh, there's no further debate. I will now put the motion for the adoption of the Transport for Brisbane program. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. No division called. We will now proceed to... We will now proceed to Infrastructure for Brisbane. Councillor McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr Chair. I move that for the Infrastructure for Brisbane program, the services of Council, the allocations for the operations and the projects and total expenditure as set out on pages 29 to 40 for the years 2021 to 2022 through to 2024 to 2025 and the allocation for the Council contribution to develop a constructed works project for the year 2025 to 2026 through to 2026 to 2027 as set out on page 284, so far as they relate to Program 2, be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor McLaughlin, seconded by Councillor Huang, that the Infrastructure for Brisbane Program, the services of Council, the allocations for the operations and the projects and total project expenditure are set out on pages 29 to 40 for the years 2021 through 22, through to 2024-25, and the allocation for the Council contributions to, to develop a constructed works project for the year 2025-26 through to 26-27 as set out on page 284. So far as they relate to Program 2, be adopted. Is there any debate? Thank Council you, Mr McLaughlin. Chair. Before beginning my speech on the program, I'd like to quickly address some of the questions on notice that I took from the budget information session, just to clear up some of those questions. Councillor Griffiths asked about the difference in revenue between 2021 and 21-22 in 2.2 parking management on page 29 of the budget. The 2020-2021 the, the published budget book showed an estimated revenue for that year of 29.9 million 
and there is a proposed revenue of $40.3 million for the 21-22 year. The difference is due to a revenue reduction booked in 2021 with less use of on-street parking and in parking stations driven by COVID restrictions, lower off-street parking fees last year initiated to attract people back into the city and fewer people coming to, to the city at the height of the COVID response. More people are returning to the city now with the number of predicted to return back to pre-COVID levels this financial year, increasing predicted parking revenues. Councillor Griffiths also asked about the progress of an L a LATM, Luckily a Traffic Management Project in the Woodley Precinct in Maruka, listed in the 2020-21. Uh, the Woodley Street Precinct was funded for planning and design last financial year. Funded planning and design projects are not automatically constructed the following year, as was the case here, or be on the list for future budget consideration. Councillor Griffiths also asked, about a, asked a question regarding the funding that has been received from the state and federal governments in Program 2. In round terms, we've booked $7.5 million from the state and $94 million from the federal government. Councillor Johnson asked for a full list of signalised intersections being installed in Brisbane in the next financial year. Now, not all traffic lights uh, delivered in Brisbane over the coming 12 months will be installed by council, some are by others. Uh, new signalised intersections proposed for council delivery in the 21-22 budget include the following. Norris Road and Barber Road at Bracken Ridge, Norris Road and Pritchard Street in Bracken Ridge, Monia Road and Bellwood Street, 17 Mile Rocks, Chelsea Road and Rickett Road, Bransom, Boundary Street and Skepper Street, Ellen Grove, Inaugural Road, Moran Street, Lloyd Street, Alderley, Fig Tree Pocket Road at Kenmore. Uh, new signalised pedestrian crossings in 21-22 will be uh, in Inaugura at Pickering Street, in Kangaroo Point on River Terrace and in East Brisbane at Wellington Street. Councillor Johnson also asked where the funding for SAM signs was located in the budget. This is detailed in service 2.1.4.1, manage the network. There have been no change to how this is being managed this financial year. <laughs> Councillor Cassidy asked about the Aberdeen Parade LATM project. Funding of 189,000 was allocated in the 1920 financial year in service 2.1.2.2 to commence LATM planning, design and community consultation for Aberdeen Parade, uh, the Aberdeen Parade precinct in Boondle. The construction estimate for the project is over $500,000. Funding has not been allocated for construction this financial year, but Aberdeen Parade parking enhancements have been funded for design this year under service 2.1.2.2, road construction minor traffic density. Councillor Cassidy also asked, about, asked for clarification about the traffic management plan listed for St Patrick's College. 137,000 in funding is allocated for St Patrick's College Shorncliffe within the traffic management plan improvements. This proposal included the design, consultation and construction of pedestrian crossing improvements on Signal Row at Yunda Street to improve pedestrian safety, access and connectivity between St Patrick's College and Shorncliffe State School and the drop-off and pick-up area on Signal Row to the east of Yunda Street. Mr Chair, um, I now begin my consideration of the budget speech. Um, Mr Chair, the 2021-2022 Program 2 budget will continue to deliver the crucial infrastructure required to keep our city moving, support local jobs, uh, and stimulate our rapidly growing economy. Yeah. Brisbane is, is the fastest growing capital city in the country. The Schrinner Council is committed to ensuring Brisbane remains livable and accessible for residents and visitors while providing the support our businesses need to prosper. We say it in the introduction to the program in the budget book, Mr Chair, I mean it. Efficient transport networks are needed to deliver economic, social and environmental benefits to reduce the cost of providing goods and services while improving amenity, convenience and safety of the network. Yes, yes. This time last year, the whole country was suffering the worst of COVID-19, managing the health and economic impacts of a pandemic that we all had to learn how to manage. A reminder that last year we were all virtually meeting, including in these budget debates, as the uh, Lord Mayor said in his budget speech last week, there was no manual on how to deal with such an event, but we, ha we have got through the worst of the impacts of the virus. Investment in infrastructure remains key to our city's economic health, with more than $1.2 billion going towards infrastructure citywide and nearly 40% of the city's budget going towards roads and transport initiatives. Mr Chair, the Schrinner Council will continue to deliver the basics for our city and invest in our suburbs. In the 21-22 budget, 86% of spending will be in Brisbane suburbs. The Schrinner Council is absolutely dedicated every day to building a better Brisbane. 
included in Program 2 investments in infrastructure delivery that is not always the most obvious but is required to ensure we keep our city moving and well maintained. The Suburban Works Program tells the story of bridge and culvert works, of renewal and maintenance of retaining walls, of boardwalks and of underground duct and fibre works. Mr Chair, it would not be possible for Council to fund its full suite of infrastructure delivery without the support and cooperation of other levels of government. I'd particularly like to acknowledge the commitment of the Commonwealth through programs such as the Urban Congestion Fund and the Local Roads and Community Infrastructure Program and others, uh, and the State Government through the Transport Infrastructure Development Scheme. I'd also like to acknowledge the hard work of council officers who know every dollar of the funding opportunities available to council and make sure those levels of government see the value add from their contributions. One of the keys to being in a position to take advantage of federal and state funding is having a program of works ready to go. To that end, the budget allocation at 2.1.1.1, plan and design the network, is crucial. As the fastest growing capital city in the country, Council is always looking towards the future and setting out how we can further improve our infrastructure network to better serve uh, residents in coming years. In the 21-22 budget, we've allocated a serious investment of more than $10 million towards the network plan and design operation and investment in the future of our growing network. Included in this program will be $282,000 for cor corridor planning, $880,000 for transport planning studies and $3.5 million to facilitate Council's ongoing investment in planning the future network of our city. Over $3.5 million will be invested in preliminary road designs in locations across Brisbane, locations such as Leroy Road, Acacia Ridge, where the existing road corridor will be impacted by high levels of population growth expected due to the nearby developments in Pallara. Other examples of corridors, corridors where planning has been funded include Hamilton Road in Chermside, the Hurston Road corridor and Swan Road in Turinga. It's crucial that Council invests in long-term planning like this to ensure that we can continue to deliver the vital connections between our suburbs. This planning will go towards our investment in works, both big and small. This work informs our discussions with the federal and state governments about their support for our road network improvements. The works undertaken in 2.1.1.1 in planning and design lead directly through to works underway at 2.1.2.5 in our Better Roads for Brisbane program. Supported by our partnership between the Commonwealth and Council, more than $100 million is allocated this year towards projects which are going to improve safety, reduce congestion, reduce travel time and improve road functionality. Included in, the, in this list, of course, will be transformational suburban upgrades like that at the Indrapilly Roundabout, the Newman and Wecker Road intersection and the Rochdale and Priestdale Road intersection being built in conjunction with Logan City Council, the Chelsea and Rickett Road intersection at Ransom, Hoyland Street, Bald Hills, Bracken Ridge, Norris Road, Bracken Ridge and Beams Road in Castledome. In conjunction, Mr Chair, with the projects outlined in Program 1 to build safer connections for students walking or cycling to school, Council is committed to creating a safer environment around schools, which is why we're funding $719,000 towards a continued investment in the SAM for Schools program. Additionally, $926,000 will go towards our safe school travel infrastructure with new investments in locations like Jindalee State School, Lords Hill College in Hawthorne, Moreton Bay College, Manly West, Newmarket State School and Runcorn State School. We'll also be funding further traffic management plan improvements for schools to the tune of $416,000, which will improve safety for students travelling to and from school through intersection improvements in pedestrian refuges and crossings. At Build the Transport Network at 2.1.2.1, this program will build key major road projects in the city, intersections where upgrades are required to improve our network to keep pace with the needs of a growing capital city. The need for works has been identified at Gardner Road and at Hamilton and Stabe Road. Council is also committed to improving open level crossings like the Lindham Open Level Crossing, where all three levels of government are working together to deliver a long-term upgrade that will substantially improve safety outcomes for residents in Brisbane's eastern suburbs. Our traffic reduction initiatives at 2.1.2.3 help to deliver Council's goal to get residents home, residents home quicker and safer. 
22 congestion busting projects right across the city from Anala Avenue, Anala, to Wynnum Road, Morningside, to Robinson Road West, uh, to Robinson Road West at Gbung, to Mogul Road, Turinga, will be supported by a nearly three and a half million dollar investment. Additionally, our major traffic intersection improvements will be supported by a further $34.8 million investment with intersections like Fig Tree Pocket and Kenmore Road and Fig Tree Pocket, Monia Road and Bellwood Street, Darra, and the Cambridge Road, Melville Terrace and Arnold Street intersection in Manly, all being funded this year. With a nearly $1 million investment, signal modifications will also be, provide ways to make signalised intersections work as best they can without needing significant intersection rebuilds. The Gresham Street Bridge upgrade will continue to be supported with $15.8 million this year and, uh, two, and nearly $2.9 million will be spent on improving our major road network. Under maintain and improve the network at 2.1.3.1, Council looks at the best way to ensure the most effective delivery of infrastructure and considers whole of life costs of assets. In this program, we focus on the renewal, maintenance and improvement of roads, bridges, culverts, line marking, signs and traffic signals, retaining walls and public lighting to ensure all our existing council assets are operating at their capacity. $9.7 million is being invested in maintaining and improving the extremely popular riverside boardwalks and investment in promoting the natural asset that is our river, used by res residents not just from across the city but the whole southeast corner. Over $31.6 million will be invested in the continuing rehabilitation and reconstruction of existing bridges and culverts. These works will include works on the uh, Brickyard Road Bridge in Virginia, replacements of tower lighting on the Eleanor Chanel Bridge between Dutton Park and UQ, as well as significant, and a significant investment in the Story Bridge restoration project. Importantly, Council will, of course, be investing significantly in the basic works that are expected of a local government. This year, we'll be investing $766,000 towards energy, efficient, energy efficient lighting, saving power and money in the long term. Over $7.8 million will go to curb and channel reconstruction and $90 million continues our record road resurfacing project. Some 411 roads will be resurfaced across the city in the coming financial year, part of the Shrina Council's $360 million commitment to smoother suburban streets in Brisbane, which uh, benefits all wards across the whole city. Mr Chair, we need to keep our city moving and support local jobs to stimulate our growing economy. We need efficient transport networks to help deliver economic, social and economic benefits to help reduce the cost of providing goods and services while improving the amenity, convenience and safety of our network. The expenditures in Program 2 as a cornerstone of the, the, the Shrina Council budget are all directed at these outcomes. Thank you to our traffic engineers for all your hard work, to Scott Stewart, Marie Gales and your teams, to Robert Lee, Steve and Dominic in my office. Thank you to all you have done to help prepare the 21-22 uh, budget for Program 2 and the program of works and projects to be delivered in the, in the new financial year. Thank you, Mr Chair. Further speakers? Point of order, Point Chair. Of order, Councillor Landers. Mr Chair, I move that Council now adjourn for lunch for one hour, which commences only when all councillors have left the meeting. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Landers, seconded by Councillor Hutton, that this Council now adjourn for the purpose of lunch for a period of one hour, commencing when all councillors have vacated the chamber and the doors have been locked. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Those against, please say no. The ayes have it. Uh, welcome back, councillors. We're now, um, as I said before uh, the break, there was uh, legal advice being sought about the nature of the amendment motions that had been proposed this morning. There will be a piece of advice circulated electronically to all councillors that will respond to that and address some of the questions. Effectively, it boils down to, and I'll read it now. Accordingly, while not expressly a requirement of the meetings local law, in order to ensure that all councillors are aware of exactly what they are voting for at the end of each program, it is my recommendation that the outcome or service line for, for where the money is coming from and to should be identified in the amendment motion signed uh, by the Chief Legal Counsel. That will be distributed to all councillors. Uh, further speakers on uh, program area two. Councillor Johnston. 
Yes, thank you. I rise to speak on uh, Program 2, Infrastructure for Brisbane. Um, and I should say infrastructure for Brisbane except uh, Tennyson Ward. Um, and I'd just like to start with the basics uh, because um, this is one part of council that you think there'd just be a little modicum of fairness in terms of the allocation of funding. And that's this year the $90 million uh, that's allocated towards uh, resurfacing streets in Brisbane. Um, so we did hear from Councillor McLaughlin, uh, 411 streets being resurfaced. Does anybody want to take a guess how many in Tennyson Ward? Oh, no, there's more than zero, Councillor Strunk. It's not that bad. Anybody else want to have a guess? One? No, it's not one. It's ten. Ten. So there are ten streets in uh, Tennyson Ward that are being funded with $90 million in revenue. Um, and one of them happens to be, um, you know, a very big arterial road. Um, so I think that's probably they've gone, oh, we can't give her too much money, so we'll cut the number of projects back. But that means that many suburban streets uh, are still missing out. Uh, so there's a really significant underinvestment in um, suburban resurfacing in Tennyson Ward this year. There's also an extremely severe, um, generally, underinvestment in Kerbin Channel. Um, and uh, there are, there's just the one project uh, from about 55, I think it is, uh, in Tennyson Ward. So, um, we're just not seeing the level of investment that's needed and the curb and channels crumbling uh, everywhere. Uh, there's really not a lot else in this uh, for Tennyson Ward. Um, there is uh, a little bit of work on the bridge, um, fixing the staircase and uh, um, uh, certainly uh, fixing some joints in the bridge itself, which is standard repair works. Um, there's no traffic calming. Uh, for residents in my area, um, it, it's it's a very significant underinvestment. Uh, there is, interestingly enough, $150,000 for a Walter Taylor Bridge pre-feasibility study. Now, <clears throat> there's a problem with this. Council's already done the pre-feasibility study. That was announced secretly. He didn't tell anybody, me. Um, the public that he was doing a pre-feasibility study a year ago and the Lord Mayor when he was asked in the media earlier this year was said that council was doing a feasibility study. Yet when you look in the budget, council's doing a second pre-feasibility study. So I don't know whether this is a typo in this book, um, whether they're going to pretend the pre-feasibility study they've already done is this pre-feasibility study or whether, as the Lord Mayor publicly stated, Council was doing a feasibility study, um, because what he has publicly said is not what's in the budget book. So I look forward to some explanation about that. What I do know about uh, $150,000 is um, that's what I spend on building a new playground. So I can see that they're not uh, clear uh, about this. And I'm also aware that uh, uh, Councillor Mackay will be very opposed to any kind of duplication of this bridge. So I really just don't think that, uh, that the LNP is serious in any way, shape or form about this. And they're re-announcing something that they've already done and trying to dress it up as something new. And again, he's another chairperson of the LNP hanging the Lord Mayor out to dry. Are you guys not aware of what he says? Do you not? You know, I thought it's the same media team that looks after all of you. So the Lord Mayor's gone out and publicly says, yes, we're doing a feasibility study. Council McLaughlin comes along behind him and goes, no, no, we're doing a pre-feasibility study. It's the second pre-feasibility study. So look, get your lines right. Um, you know, my community um, is very concerned about uh, what might happen with the bridge and its impact on traffic uh, in our area. Um, and these mixed messages from the Lord Mayor and Council McLaughlin are not acceptable. Um, I am aware that they have already done a pre-feasibility study. They are keeping this pre-feasibility study secret. They will not release it. I have been warned if I release it, I'll be in trouble. Uh, so I don't know why um, that this has to be such a secret. Um, what happens with the bridge uh, and what happens with Oxley Road is of significant concern to my community. And the fact that this administration is keeping it secret is not appropriate. I'm publicly calling on the Lord Mayor to clarify whether this is a second pre-feasibility study or this is the pre-feasibility or this is the feasibility study that he publicly promised earlier this year. 
I'm also calling on the Lord Mayor today to release the existing study that has been done so residents can see what this council is proposing and also to release the uh, document that will come with this, uh, with this study. I mean, it may be that this is just marketing. It may be, actually, this could be it. This, I could be onto it now. It might be that this $156,000 is just for a flyer to put out to tell people they've done the pre-feasibility study, which they did sort of 18 months ago. So what is it? What is it? These are not my words. They're the Lord Mayor's words. He went out and said there's a feasibility study being done. Now Councillor McLaughlin says it's only a pre-feasibility study. Get your lines right. It is not reasonable to treat the residents in this way. Um, I'm also very concerned um, that there are no intersection upgrades in here for Tennyson Ward. Uh, there are no local traffic calming projects in here for Tennyson Ward. There's not even any minor safety upgrades for Tennyson Ward in here. And there's hundreds and millions, or a billion dollars, I think, is, is spent on infrastructure. And there's 10 roads being resurfaced in Tennyson Ward. So as far as I'm concerned, um, that is not good enough. Uh, and I am uh, moving the following amendment which I've just emailed through. Um, I move that this council reallocates $120,000 from program service 2.1.1.1, plan and design the network operating expense to 2.1.2.2, improve local transport networks, local area traffic management, traffic calming, to a local area traffic management solution, traffic calming for Egmont Street, Sherwood, $120,000 and reallocates $150,000 from the same program, Program 2.1.1.1, plan and design the network emerging projects land acquisition to a new project, build the transport network, 2.1.2.1, to undertake design and planning for an intersection upgrade, including fully controlled turning lanes at Venner Road, Waterton Street and Ipswich Road, Annerley. Seconded. We have an amendment motion proposed by Councillor Johnston, uh, seconded by Councillor Griffiths. Councillor Johnston's advised that it has been uh, sent electronically and that's now being uh, sent to all councillors. Councillor Johnston, you have uh, 10 minutes on your amendment motion, please. Yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll keep this fairly brief. They are, they are self-explanatory. Um, every year there's about 10 local traffic calming projects that happen. I think there might be a bit less this year, actually. Um, the last time that any traffic calming was done in Tennyson Ward was 2009, so that's uh, 12 years ago. Uh, so 10 projects over 10 years or 11 years, that's 110 projects, 26 wards. You know, if you'd been reasonable about how you allocate funding around the city, um, you know, you might expect Tennyson Ward have got two or three or four even um, if it reflected a fair allocation of funding. Um, so what I'll say is that the neglect of traffic calming and traffic safety in my area is uh, quite significant. This um, uh, uh, LATM has been listed for at least that long, 2009. It's one of the first uh, that I did. We've had a petition come through this place more than a decade ago. Um, this street has been listed for uh, traffic calming in Council's program. Um, this area behind Sherwood State School is a significant rat run, so this is the street people turn off to avoid turning at the highly congested Sherwood Road, Ipswich Road intersection, and then they rat run through the back streets of Sherwood. Um, the traffic calming uh, process here would look at McCullough Street, Hall Street and Egmont Street uh, and Johnston Street. They all connect to each other, um, and certainly it would provide a huge amount of um, safety uh, in slowing traffic down around the back of Sherwood State School, uh, around a very busy parkland area, uh, and also help deter through traffic from using the back streets of Sherwood. Um, as I said, it's been on the list for more than 10 years and uh, it definitely needs to be funded. Uh, secondly, um, there's nearly $4 million allocated to emerging projects land acquisition. Now, all I'm suggesting is we allocate uh, a chunk of that to undertake not the work at this stage, I'm happy to do the design and planning because I would like to consult with the community, um, but we cannot continue to ignore the intersection of Venner Road, Waterton and Ipswich Road in Annerley. Um, it is an intersection on the border of Tennyson and Maruka wards. Um, it is a dangerous and highly congested intersection. 
It does not have proper turning lanes. It does not have green turning arrows. And it is critical that this council invests in the planning and design necessary to have a fully controlled intersection with dedicated turning lanes and dedicated turning arrows to improve safety at this intersection. Now, the only advice that I've been getting to date from uh, the officers, um, which I'm technically not allowed to tell anybody, uh, uh, is in secret documents that this council has and they will not release to the public. Um, they don't want to impact on Ipswich Road. That is the verbal advice that I get. They want to keep the 65,000 cars a day rolling through Ipswich Road, um, but that impacts on uh, residents who are trying to move from east to west, and there are only limited ways that residents can do that because there are low rail bridges in Tennyson Ward um, and other wards as well. But these are significant capacity constraints, uh, the rail line which runs through the area. So it's really important that we start planning now to upgrade this intersection to ensure that it is safer, more functional and less congested uh, for uh, residents from Annerley, Maruka, Tarragindi, Yoronga, uh, Fairfield, Yoronpili and beyond who all traverse this intersection on a daily basis. It is a, a very dangerous intersection. Cars have to pull right out into the centre of the intersection to see before turning. Um, there are just no turning lanes there at all, and there are no green arrows. Uh, so this would be a significant improvement, and the first step is to undertake a plan to undertake design and um, uh, planning and consultation uh, for the intersection upgrade, and that's just a mere $150,000 out of a budget of about $4 million um, that is uh, set aside for future uh, intersection and road projects. So I encourage all councillors uh, to support uh, this amendment. Further speakers to the amendment? Any further speakers? Councillor Johnston, five minutes to reply. Geez, if you have a debate in the woods and no one else debates in the woods, is it really a debate? Well, apparently not. <laughs> um, uh, look, again, um, and, and now the, the infrastructure chairman's just left the room. I mean, it's just, yeah, look, um, it's clear to me that this LNP administration no longer governs for all the wards in the city. Um, it is clear that they are governing for themselves and strategically for some Labor wards where they think there is political advantage in it for them. Um, wards like mine are just being neglected and forgotten. Um, these two projects are essential to improve the safety of uh, residents in Tennyson Ward and surrounding suburbs. One is a traffic calming project where residents have been waiting for well over a decade um, and where we've not had any traffic calming in Tennyson Ward for well over a decade. The second is to undertake planning and design for an intersection upgrade at a busy and dangerous intersection at Annerley um, that would significantly improve um, traffic safety for residents in uh, the Deputy Mayor's ward, my ward, and Councillor Griffith's ward. Um, you know, this intersection desperately needs uh, action. This intersection is the fundamental reason why a Brisbane resident um, was killed a couple of years ago. He was trying to cross Venner Road, and the cars were queued back down Venner Road for almost a kilometre. And as one car pulled out from the side street, hit another car coming down Venner Road, rolled and killed Dr Copeland. Um, the lack of action by this LNP administration on dealing with the root cause of that problem, um, which is the dysfunction of the Annerley Road, Waterton and Ipswich Road intersection, is shameful. Um, somebody has died and this administration has taken no action to fix it. Um, uh, this is such an incredibly important intersection upgrade, um, and as this council won't allocate the planning money, um, I am uh, putting the motion forward today. Um, let's be clear, uh, this administration actually, um, two years in a row, funded an intersection upgrade at Cracknell Road. They didn't deliver it the first year. They then increased the funding, and then they didn't deliver it the second year. Now, that's been cut as well. Um, that's actually in the LGIP, and they're not even doing that one. So let's be clear, even where these projects, they agree to them um, in their own strategic planning documents, they don't fund them. 
Um, this is an intersection that desperately needs to be upgraded to make it safer and to put turning lanes in to properly control the movement of traffic uh, for drivers that are heading east-west across Ipswich Road. It would benefit thousands and thousands of people every single day. It's such an important project, and I believe we should be getting the design and planning up and running. The fact that this administration haven't even got a minute to talk about it, not a minute, not a peep, not a word, um, not an explanation about why they don't support it. They're just silent. That's cowardice. That's cowardice. Um, if you are having a debate about how money should be spent in the city's budget, have the courage to stand up and debate the issues before us today. Um, but, you know, Councillor McLaughlin's happy to take his 30,000 gold pennies a year, um, but not actively engage in debate about the issues of importance in the community that I represent. That is just pathetic. We now put the amendment. All those in favour of the amendment, please say aye. Aye. Those against, please say no. Aye. The noes have it. Division. Division called by Councillor Second. Johnston and Councillor Griffiths. Please ring the bells. Councillors will proceed to a vote. All those in favour of the amendment, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. And those against, please say no and raise your hand. Aye. Clerks, please read the result. Clerks, please read the result uh, when you're ready. Mr Chair, the noes have it. The voting being six in favour and 17 against. The noes have it. We will return to substantive debate. Uh, further speakers? Councillor Landers. Thank you, Chair. I wish to speak in support of Program 2, Infrastructure for Brisbane, and I would like to thank the Chair, Councillor McLaughlin, for his work in delivering this Shuna Council budget. This absolutely is a budget for the suburbs. And over the last year, residents in my ward have received a series of road projects that are transforming our local area. The Shuna Council continues to tackle congestion hotspots in conjunction with the Morrison Federal Government through the Better Roads for Brisbane program and the Urban Construction Fund. This involves priority projects across the city where congestion and safety need to be addressed and it will tackle a number of sites in Brackenridge Ward. The Brackenridge Road, Hoyland Street and Strathpine Road corridor is an important east-west route linking the Moreton Bay area with the north, northern Brisbane suburbs of Bald Hills and Brackenridge over the Gympie Arterial Road. The Hoyland Street upgrade is the missing link in this corridor and will see the widening of the road from two lanes to four lanes in each direction, improving travel time and safety. It also encompasses upgrades to cyclist and pedestrian facilities, as well as better lighting. This project is progressing well and expected to be completed by the end of 2021. Another major ongoing project is the Norris and Barber Road intersection where the existing roundabout will be transformed into a signalised intersection, including two slip lanes. The intersection will provide reduced queuing and travel times for more than 19,000 vehicles per day. In addition to the intersection upgrade, we are installing a 2.5 metre shared pathway on the eastern side of Norris Road between Barber Road and the Brackenridge Plaza. To complement this project, which is well underway, this budget will see an additional project that will further enhance the safety of the Norris Road corridor. The project will upgrade Norris Road between Telegraph Road and Brackenridge Road. With this, with, um, this will improve the capacity of the corridor through the installation of new right turn pockets into local streets. 
There will be improvements to safety and capacity for active travel, particularly for pedestrian and cyclists at Pritchard Place intersection. And it will reduce delays and improve safety for vehicles entering and exiting Pritchard Place. Parents at Norris Road State School and students attending the Brackenridge TAFE will welcome this change, Chair, as the increased traffic on this corridor has made it very difficult to exit onto Norris Road during peak times. The improved safety for all road users is a major one, particularly vehicles attempting to turn right from Pritchard Place onto Norris Road and also for vehicles waiting to turn off Norris Road along the whole corridor. The budget will see the detailed design and land purchase completed and commencement of construction of Pritchard Place and Norris Road intersection. Chair, the Schrinner Council have been undertaking investigations and assessments to help inform the design for an upgrade of the Beams Road corridor from Lacey Road, Castledine to Hanford Road, Zilmia. I am happy to see that the funding for detailed design and early works are included in this budget. With the increased growth in this area, it is important that this is a priority project with the 19,000 vehicles currently using this corridor and heavy vehicles making up 5% of this traffic movement. This is predicted to increase to 26,000 vehicles per day by 2031. The Beams Road upgrade will reduce traffic congestion, improve safety and improve pedestrian and cyclist accessibility. Chair, during a five-year period from August 2015 to July 2020, there were 43 recorded crashes along this section of Beams Road, resulting in seven hospitalisations, six minor injuries and 30 medical treatments. 20 of these crashes were at intersections and 23 occurred mid-block. The upgrade will provide four traffic lanes along the corridor, widening of the culverts at Cabbage Tree Creek, safety improvements at various intersections between Lacey Road and Hanford Road, including signalising the intersection of Beams and Dorval Road, and installing a centre median strip. With the new EDQ major development project underway as part of the Castledine Urban Village project and the new Holy Spirit College set to open in 2022, the Shrina Council is committed to delivering better active transport with improved pedestrian and cycling facilities and accessibility. With main construction starting in 2022, we can only hope that the state government's promise to remove the open level crossing on this corridor will actually begin. Almost a year on from the Labor state member feeling the pressure and finally matching the promise made by the LNP candidate, there doesn't appear to be much action at this location. The Shrinner Council continues to allocate funding for contribution to the removal of open level crossings that are a high priority for Council. The removal of Beams Road level crossing will dramatically improve road safety and the road and rail system reliability by avoiding train and vehicle crashes. They also significantly reduce traffic congestion by eliminating the substantial delays imposed on road traffic by passing trains blocking the road, particularly during the morning and evening peak peak traffic flow periods. Under the major traffic improvements, the Dorval Road and As at Aspley and Rogan Road at Fitzgibbon upgrades will also make our community safer and provide improved active travel. The Dorval Road project will see the formalisation of the road between Cabbage Tree Creek and Kingfisher Recycling Centre. The scope of works will include widening and formalising the road shoulder installation of kerb and channelling and the provision of additional street parking. In Fitzgibbon, the northern verge of Rogan Road near Hidden World, Hidden World Playground will be formalised by providing a sealed shoulder kerb and channel. Formalised roadside parking and a right turn lane into Caribou Crescent. Residents are very excited about the 200 metre footpath that will provide improved safety connectivity and access to Hidden World Playground and the Fitzgibbon Dog Off Leash area and better connection with the Cabbage Tree Creek Bikeway. Together with the Morrison Government, we are working to get residents home quicker and safer. And I thank Luke Howarth, the Federal Member for Petrie, who worked hard to secure federal funding for these projects. 
Chair, continuing to make our community safer, and particularly our schools, the Safer Paths to School program will see improvements made on Norris Road, Brackenridge, outside the Norris Road State School, and will complement the Norris Road upgrade I mentioned earlier. The traffic reduction initiatives congestion busting projects will include another peak hour congestion spot at Dunsford Street and Murphy Road intersection in Zilmia. This budget will see the eastbound left turn lane lengthened back to Cray Street. And following consultation with local residents in November 2020, Council received support to proceed with upgrades to the Murphy Road and Robinson Road West intersection at Asway. This will see the extension of the right turn lane on Murphy Road into Robinson Road West for eastbound traffic. An upgrade to the traffic island to the south of the extended right turn lane. An extension of the no stopping conditions on Murphy Road south of Solar Street. These types of lower cost, high impact treatments are delivered as part of the Schroener Council's congestion busting um, projects program, which aims to improve network performance through reduced travel times, improved trip reliability and enhanced safety. The bridge and culvert construction program will include completion of investigation and detailed design into a proposed new creek crossing over Bald Hills Creek between Clarissa and Cavalier Close in Bracken Ridge, with constructions to commence and be completed in the 2022-23 financial year. Program 2 will also provide three curb and channel projects, Caruso Place at Bracken Ridge, Kuyar Street and Wilma at Aspley, and there are many roads listed for resurfacing in Zilmia, being in Fitzgibbon, in Bracken Ridge, and in Castle Dine and Bald Hills. Chair, this truly is an infrastructure building Schooner Council budget that support, supports suburban outcomes, and I commend this program to the Chamber. Yeah. Further speakers, Councillor Griffiths. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Mr Chair, and I rise to speak on program two. Um, uh, it was interesting to listen to Councillor Landers speak then, and uh, to fill up her whole 10 minutes listing projects in her electorate. Um, it would almost seem like LNP electorates have many, many projects and other electorates don't. Uh, it was also interesting uh, when I listened before to Councillor Johnston, and Councillor Johnston makes a very good point um, that her ward is definitely underfunded by this administration and has been for a number of years, particularly in infrastructure funding. And that is not only known by residents, but it is known and talked about by staff as well. And it is, um, it is appalling that because someone disagrees with your ideology or you have a falling out, that the uh, payback is that residents in that area lose out. And residents certainly aren't changing their vote because of that. So um, I think that that is uh, very disappointing. I note, noted when the Lord Mayor came to the chamber, made overtures to Councillor Johnson that things would change. Um, disappointingly, they don't seem to have. Uh, but let's look at the program itself. And uh, I think after the, the um, poor performance of program one in actually delivering anything for the suburbs and delivering 500 million for inner city green bridges and over 1 billion for new tunnels for the inner city, um, this project isn't much better either. And we keep hearing, I keep hearing this uh, magical figure uh, stated that 80% of the funding is going to the suburbs. 80% of the funding, well the funding, 86, oh it's going up to 86. <laughs> Let's get the right line. That's right, it's, it's going up. It's going up. Well, that that in a, that suburb, that obviously I've got a reaction. That uh, that suburb funding must be including West End and New Farm and all those inner city uh, areas where it's all being actually spent. Um, because I can't see how that amount of funding is going to the suburbs. And and I can tell you. Residents don't believe it. Residents out there don't believe it. Um, and all you've got to do, I'm happy if you want to come along with me to a public meeting, and you can tell them that 86% of the money is being spent out there because they don't believe it, they don't see it, they just keep seeing the advertising of inner city projects. 
Um, and unfortunately, that's a sad tale for residents. Um, but disappointingly, uh, this is a, uh, a budget, from my ward's perspective, uh, uh, that has a litany of non-deliverables. So, and I noticed uh, Councillor Johnson uh, spoke before about the failed intersection on the corner of Venner and Ipswich Road and Waterton Street. Um, that intersection is certainly one of the most stressed intersections in terms of safe uh, turns and in terms of the amount of traffic, the 65,000 vehicles a day it takes at Annerley. And it's certainly um, uh, a pr uh, something that both Councillor Johnson and I are committed to working on to draw attention to the state of Ipswich Road and the state of this intersection. Certainly, from the state's perspective, they're just state and federal government have finished spending money on the Ipswich motorway. And that has been a brilliant project that um, bring, brings, uh, funded through the federal government, yes, I agree with that, uh, brings, brings traffic in from Oxley uh, into Rockley. Unfortunately, once you hit where Brisbane City Council is responsible for the road, you hit potholes and you hit a road that's breaking up and you hit a road that's not performing. Uh, and that's disappointing because the federal government and state have delivered their bit and uh, then council has done its bit with Clem 7, but the missing piece in between, that missing section of Ipswich Road is actually our responsibility. And we have failed. We have failed and we continue to fail those residents in relation to that. And there is massive growth in the southern and southwestern suburbs, massive growth for our city and beyond us to Ipswich. So that narrow-minded thinking is not doing our city or the region any good. And I also note uh, Councillor Johnson also spoke about the cut of the Cracknell Road um, turning lane, on, um, Cracknell and Ipswich Road turning lane that was um, cut from last year's budget. 300,000 just cut, sliced, taken out for an important um, lane, for important lane work that actually helped with the, uh, the flow of traffic through Ipswich Road, but provide an, uh, a, a very safe turning lane, whereas um, traffic is now backed up down Ipswich Road and causes a backlog along the road. So I'm just pointed that that wasn't um, attempted to be resolved. There was... Um, no attempt from the chairperson to actually try and figure a way out through that. It was just cut. And uh, I think that is, um, and from my advice talking to transport officers, they were in support of that project. So I think that is a, r a real loss for the south side and for our city. Um, but there's also other areas where there are issues. And uh, disappointingly, um, Probably most disappointingly was uh, I haven't had a, a local traffic management plan for years and years. Uh, and we got one last year for Vendale Homestead and Weir Street. I worked with residents to ensure that that got up, got over the line in terms of consultation numbers. It's not always easy to get that to happen. But I note that in this budget, that has been cut. And it's also been cut um, in Councillor Cassidy's area as well. It's news to me that you can do the planning one year, then you don't deliver it the next year. Uh, and I put to the chairperson, I'll ask the chairperson through you, Mr Chair, um, can he tell me how many LMP projects that were planned last year aren't being delivered this year for the local traffic management program? Be very interested to know how many are sitting on the table there not being delivered. But more disappointing than that is the fact that we, um, we build up residents' expectations we're actually resurfacing that road this year. We're resurfacing uh, Vendale Avenue. So it would have been perfect to coordinate that project with the resurfacing of the road. But that's the logical reason for doing the project. Then there's the political reason for not doing the project. And I'm sure um, Councillor Casty has more to say about his project being cut in Deegan as well. I also note that uh, there's money, plenty of money splashing around supposedly for all our crossings, our, our rail crossings in Brisbane, just that nothing ever seems to happen. Nothing ever seems to get delivered. And uh, it's been, what, 17 years this LNP administration has been here, or LNP mayor, and only two have been delivered uh, by this LNP council. So there's many more to be delivered, uh, but we don't see the action happening with that. And certainly Cooper's Plains Crossing, 
is a key piece of infrastructure for the southern suburbs. It's uh, not only important in terms of it's not only important in terms of traffic, uh, but it's also important in terms of the development of inland rail and heavy vehicles that will be using the southern suburbs as well. And finally, uh, I'm probably the most disappointed about this because we have had briefings on this before. There are four pedestrian crossings in Brisbane that cross four lane roads. I have one of them at, at um, Salisbury. These are extremely dangerous, they're historic, they wouldn't be left in those locations. We wouldn't be allowed to put them in those locations now. But uh, the work, I understand, has been done on being able to make them safe. We just have not seen the funding allocated for this. And just in the last six months, I've had Queensland Police write to me about it and say, hey, do you realise, does Council realise how dangerous this uh, pedestrian crossing is across the four-lane road? So I would call on the Lord Mayor and the administration to reconsider prioritising these, because it's not only an issue in my ward, but in, at three other sites across the city. I'm actually uh, not sure of their locations, but I know they do exist. Um, disappointingly, this program really does fail to deliver for the suburbs, even though we have that percentage that's screamed out by the LNP, and I think that that is evident um, in, uh, in what we're seeing delivered with this program. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Owen. Thank you, Mr Chair, and I rise to support Program 2 Infrastructure for Brisbane. Infrastructure is something that, as a council, we are focused on, and I know that the Sharina Council, through this budget this year, is focused on delivering for the suburbs of our city. This infrastructure that is planned will make better suburbs across our city. I refer to 2.1.1.1 in the budget, and that is plan and design the network. For the councillors in this place that don't really go over to the south side, we have very important corridors. And, and look, we all are very parochial about our own um, wards and our own part of the city. And for many of us, we don't often venture to other wards because we are focused on delivering for our home turf. But we also do have very important strategic road corridors, and that is what this budget looks to deliver. Infrastructure that is going to enhance the capacity for people to travel quickly and efficiently through those corridors. And in particular, I'd, in this particular program, I'd like to reference um, Leroyd Road from Goodaham to Watson Road. Now, this is a very strategic east-west corridor that traverses from the Runcorn Ward across the border between the Callumvale and Maruka Wards and then goes towards the Forest Lake Ward. Now, this particular section between Goodaham and Watson Road also has the Oxley Creek going underneath it. So there are significant impacts when we have high flood events, and particularly in 2011, there were some issues with people being able to go east-west via Leroy Road, King Avenue, and then onto um, Inala Avenue. So what we are looking at here is to enhance that corridor, but also, added into the mix is that this is also a major corridor route now for the high growth area of not only Pallara but also Heathwood and Doolandella. So we have to look at the bigger picture here and that is what seems to be evading the consciousness of those on the other side of the chamber. We cannot be specific ward centric we have to look at things in a bigger picture perspective and we have to think about what is best for people all across the suburbs, not just in our own. Now, further on from this, we also have at 2.1.2.2 the reference to Sherbrooke Road and Camden Road. 
Now, this is, this is improving the local transport networks. And this is quite specific when it talks about transport is, and because in that Sherbrooke Road, Camden Road precinct, we have a very, very special bus depot, the Willowong Bus Depot. We also have our Willowong Resource Recovery Centre. So it is critical that particularly for those bin trucks that need to be moving very rapidly in and out of that precinct, for the buses that need to have efficiency across the network, we need to ensure that that area, that precinct, works effectively and efficiently so that they do not have any slowdown time. Because the longer that they have to sit in traffic, the less effective our service delivery is to the people of Brisbane. So it's not just about residential traffic, it's about the very important vital services that we deliver across our city for our residents. I'd also like to refer to 2.1.2.3, which is very, very important to many of my local residents because it relates to the Ritchie Road, Wadeville Street intersection, which is right outside the Polara State School. Now, unfortunately, between 2016 and 2020, the Electoral Commission chose to move Polara out of my ward, and then it came back in 2020. Ever since it has come back, I have been advocating across all divisions of council to fast track the upgrade and the design first, but obviously then subsequent to that, the upgrade of the Ritchie Road, Wadeville Street intersection. And I thank the Lord Mayor for including funding in this year's budget for the design work to proceed. It is very important that when we are dealing with a fast growth area, in particular where we have a primary school that was not expected to have more than 725 students by the year 2025, which already has over 865 students now. So if you extrapolate those figures out, it's probably going to have about 1,450 students by 2025. So the state government clearly got their figures wrong. It was a former Labor Premier that designated that the area of Polara should have six to 10,000 homes, but has the state government come up with any infrastructure? No. Has this Shrina Council come up with the infrastructure funding to start the progress of it? Yes. yes. And that is the difference. This Shrina Council is about putting into place the plans necessary to design the infrastructure needs and then following through with the important funding that is required. Amazing. Now, I know from talking to many, many residents that live in the Heathwood Polara area that they are concerned about the congestion that results at school drop-off and school pick-up time around the Polara State School. Now, we are doing what we can on this side of the chamber to alleviate that congestion, and that has been partly through two extensions of the 803 school bus route, one in January and one upcoming on the 12th of July, but also making sure that we are getting on with the job of delivering the intersection upgrade so that we can ensure that people can not only access that school safely and efficiently, but also travel through that precinct quickly and, and effectively and safely. It also is important that as part of that design, that major road network improvement design, that we will also be looking to consider an appropriate location for a safe school crossing. So there are significant numbers of people that ha have moved into the estate, which sits immediately across the road from the Polara State School. And we, as a Shrina Council, will be endeavouring to ensure 
that those children that are walking to school, partaking in active school travel, and their parents are able to cross that road safely. Just in relation to school safety as well, I would like to make reference to 2.1.2.4, which is the speed awareness monitors. Now, for those of you who haven't been past a, a Sam this week, you will notice that uh, Sam is cheering on for Queensland in the state of origin this weekend. <laughs> but importantly, Sams are there outside of our schools to make sure that people are recognising that they are in a school zone, that they need to slow down, and it's also activating our young students into a speed awareness so that they can say to their parents or to their carer, Sam says you're going too fast. He says slow down. And so this is why it's so important because from a younger person's perspective, that is actually resulting in travel behaviour change. And when we are talking about travel behaviour around schools, that is a good thing. So there is a lot in this infrastructure budget for the suburbs. And through you, Mr Chair, Councillor Griffiths says that in relation to the Coopers Plains rail crossing, that they don't see any action. Well, Councillor Griffiths, there's a reason for that. It's because your mates up in George Street, the state Labor government, haven't put up the funding. So again, I call on the state Labor government to get the wheels in motion. Put the... the Councillor Cassidy doesn't need to interject here because he's just trying to intimidate and bully me again, um, Mr Chair, but the fact of the matter remains their state Labor governments down, down in George Street haven't put up the money, haven't delivered what is necessary to put the improvements through for the Coopers Plains rail crossing. It's about time they did. Stop paying at lip service deliver for the residents of the city these sorts of projects that need it and stop relying on council to do the job of the state Labor government. Further speakers, Councillor Strunk. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I think I'll kick off with 2.1.2.3 um, uh, that uh, Councillor uh, Owen was uh, speaking about uh, in regards to upgrading uh, intersections. Um, I, I would love this council to actually uh, take care of a number of intersections in my ward or, or on the border of my ward um, that actually need the intersection upgrade now. Not some speculative uh, number of kids that are going to be at a school, but how about the Grand Avenue State School roundabout where there should have been a set of traffic lights installed there a decade ago? It was the second largest primary school in this state. Now, it's been outstripped by a couple of others uh, over that time, but it's still a major school in Brisbane, and these kids have to worry about a connective route called Woogaroo, which goes from Forest Lake Boulevard to Johnson Road, and the amount of trucks that come down that road is phenomenal. I used to live just off that road in Barrier Place. And I can tell you, uh, if you turned the TV off, you'd hear truck after truck after truck. And it, and it happened day and night. Now, when we did the extension or the opening of Boundary Road between Garden and, uh, and Carroll Park Industrial Estate, that was supposed to fix the problem. It did not. We wasted all that money trying to get trucks out of the Forest Lake suburb, literally suburb, um, to go through the industrial street and then down the Logan motorway. But no, the truck drivers will do what the truck drivers do. And if they're in the habit of driving down that road, they didn't change. So we waste, I think we wasted all that money on Boundary Road. It's a beautiful looking road now, but I don't see a lot of trucks using it. Um, when I'm there. Anyways, we needed a set of traffic lights there installed 
uh, a decade ago, and that did not happen. Now, we have a number of other intersections in my ward that, again, the problem is now. It's not three years from now or five years from now. It is now. And that is, Wilger uh, that is uh, Willowbury Way and Blunder Road. Now, I don't know what the traffic numbers are on Blunder Road, but I'd say it's probably between 30 and 40,000 cars a, a, a day, right? And the people of Duandala, the older section of Duandala that try to get out onto Blunder Road from Willowbury Way, really literally take the lives in their hands if they're turning right, because it's a four lane road. If they turn left, not so bad, but there's a problem even with that. We have the people coming out of the estate over in Duandala across the road, that didn't have any other way of getting towards Brisbane except turning left down Blunder Road and then doing a U-turn right in front of Willowbury Way where the people are trying to get out. So honestly, that is a road and an intersection that again should have had a set of traffic lights built and installed a decade ago. Because if we work out what the increase with the deviation that, was hap that happened, uh, when Councillor Owen was a uh, councillor there. Uh, it's a beautiful road now, but I tell you what, the amount of traffic is phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. Uh, now, there is, now there, I know that there has been a little bit of uh, work being done by council in that intersection uh, doing a count in recent weeks. I just hope, and all those residents of Duandella hope, that that may lead to a set of traffic lights in that intersection. Um, another, another intersection that, again, there's, there's a potential development that may happen on Pine and Orchardfield Road, and that may lead to that black spot being finally fixed uh, because, uh, because of land that is proposed to be handed over to Council for a turning lane. We just hope that that development happens to fix that. And again, this leads into an industrial estate. Um, there's so much traffic. There's so much development happening there in the Richlands area, both residential and industrial, right, but mostly residential, that it has, it has needed a set of lights at that intersection probably for 12 to 15 years. And I know the former councillor, um, Milton Dick, really pushed for that to happen. The council, council, this council in my time, has spent money on the scoping and also on the design but we didn't fund the intersection. If we move on to another service, uh, another service item, um, and that is uh, 2.1.3.1, uh, efficiency lighting. Um, I note uh, with, with some interest the, I believe, a small amount of money that's being invested here for efficiency lighting right across this huge city. Um, if we look at this year, it's 706,000. And, but in the forward years, we're looking at 440,000, 439, and 441. Now, um, I've, I've, I've been at least one presentation of this, uh, this uh, program uh, in committee, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a very, it's a very, it's not so much interesting, it's a very important program that this city should adopt. Uh, first of all, that it's better lighting, and secondly, it's a lot more efficient. But certainly the amount of money here isn't going to, and this is just not for changing bulbs, right? Because a lot of the lighting infrastructure um, has to be augmented or changed for the LED rollout. Um, we see that in our uh, sports parks. Um, uh, CJ Greenfield is a great example where uh, the, the lighting poles are fine, but the, uh, the extensions have to be all changed to uh, accept uh, the LED lighting. So I think we're really underinvesting in this area. Uh, it's, it's an important area because it's all about public safety at night time. We need to see where we're going. We need to see where we're walking. Uh, and I think we should have invested a lot more in this area. Um, now, curb and channeling, uh, 2.1.3.1. Again, $7.8 million this budget, curb and channeling. That wouldn't even cover curb and channeling for Freeman Road. <laughs> Um, or Boundary Road uh, in my ward. Um, I know Councillor Johnson said she was there uh, over the weekend in the event, or last night, thank you. I'll take that interjection. Uh, and uh, she was amazed at how much
turbine channeling we do not have. And this is an industrial area. Uh, it used to be rural farming, uh, but has, it's, has changed over the last couple of decades. And uh, with, all that, with all that infrastructure being built, uh, or I should say the um, commercial buildings being built, uh, we have not done the job that we needed to do to augment what the uh, developers did. They put cur curb and channel in, in front of their uh, facilities, but we never connected anything up. We just left it as it was, as a rural road. And we see the same thing happening in Government Road in Richlands. We've got more and more and more of those god-awful god townhouses going up. I mean, some are pretty good looking and others are just, honestly, I, I, it hurts me to look at them. Um, but we have so many uh, uh, going up along Government Road, and it's not a very long road, by the way. It's not probably even a kilometer long. And the road is still not curb and channeled. It's still the old rural road uh, that was, had been there supporting the uh, market gardens along that uh, for the last, I don't know how many, uh, probably 100 years, if not longer. Uh, so again, we're not, we're not investing enough in the <laughs> basics, the basics for what we need out in the suburbs, right? I mean, if you walk around, the, walk around the inner city suburbs, there's probably very little that's not curb and channeled. Uh, I mean, there's probably a little bit, but there's probably not much left to do. But I tell you what, out in the suburbs, especially those older suburbs, right, um, there is a ton of work that needs to be done, and we need to invest that in not investing all the ratepayers' money in the inner city suburbs for things like green bridges, which again, do not help anyone and unless you actually live and work or live in, in and around the inner city suburbs. Um, finally, um, I, I want to say I didn't get an answer back in regards to what happened to the $9 million for the upgrade of the road uh, in, uh, in Boundary Road between Blunder Road and, and, um, and uh, Kimberly Street at, uh, at, at uh, Dara, basically. Um, this was an upgrade that should have happened. Uh, it was in the LGIP, the new LGIP, it just disappeared. The um, upgrade of the Ipswich Motorway, it was part of that project. Uh, and um, what we're finding now is that, of course, the trucks are coming off that beautiful new road, uh, coming around down to a set of lights at Blunder Road and, uh, and, and Boundary Road, just across, the, uh, just across the intersection where it starts. And um, the poor golfers, I was down there the other day um, at the golf course with the, um, the state member for Oxley, and we were, make, we were doing a presentation uh, on, with the men's shed people uh, at Forest Lake. And honestly, the poor golfers Councilor talk Scott, about dodging traffic. Forgive me, uh, Councillor, your time has expired. Okay. Thank you. Uh, for the point, speakers. Point of order, Mr. Deputy Chair. Point of order, Councillor Johnson. How Thank are you, you this afternoon? I'm very well, thank you. How Good are you? Good to hear. I'm well, thank nice you. Nice to see you filling yeah. in today. Thank you. Uh, I do have a question, though. I've had the opportunity to read the advice from the Chief Legal Counselor, mm -hmm. uh, Mr James Langham, and I think he makes an excellent point. Um, the substance of that point is that it's important that all councillors are aware exactly of what they're voting for at the end of each program. Um, a number of the chairs have not been able to tell us what's in their budget uh, when we've asked questions during the information requests. So if we are to follow the Chief Legal um, Counsel's advice, which is we should know what's in the budget, uh, how are we going to do that when, for example, Councillor Howard and other councillors have not been able to tell us what's in the budget? I'll get some advice for you, Councillor Johnson, and come back to you. Further speakers, Councillor Huang. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Chair. I rise to speak in support of Program 2 of the 2021-22 budget for Program 2 infrastructure for Brisbane. Mr. Deputy Chair, it is difficult for me not to start this program without commending the Srina Council for continuing in to invest in the infrastructure of our city during the challenging year of um, 2020, uh, sorry, during the COVID-19 pandemic. As the lawmaker, lawmaker stated in his budget speech, it would have been easy to just shrug, shrug our shoulder last year and delay or postpone all these important projects and put them into the too hard basket. But instead, the lawmaker and the Srinagar Council team decided to go ahead 
with these important projects. So we are not only securing the jobs that can be created by these projects, but we are securing Brisbane's future. In this budget, Mr. Deputy Chair, 86%, that is 86%, because it is so important, I'll say one more time, 86 86%, 86 86%, that is $3.1 billion will be invested in our suburbs. That means more infrastructure will go into our suburbs. In my last address to this chamber, I spoke about the significant investment of the Metro Depot on School Road, Rochdale. And in this program, I'm going to talk about something that is only a couple hundred meters away, and that is the Rochdale Road and Priestdale Road intersection upgrade. Mr. Deputy Chair, the Rochdale Road and Priestdale Road intersection connects Brisbane and Logan City. It connects Rochdale in Brisbane and Rochdale South, Springwood and other Logan suburbs. This intersection has long been used by the traffic coming from Logan as a thoroughfare to the Gateway Motorway and Southeast Freeway. On top of that, there are five different schools within one kilometer of the intersection. The existing roundabout is already inadequate at handling the traffic of this volume and that the upgrade was sorely needed. At the last federal election, the Morrison government committed $14 million to support this project. And after last year's council election, the newly elected Logan City Council is also committed to contribute $8.3 million in this $41.3 million project. Mr. Deputy Chair, Rochdale Road is a local road of regional significance and forms part of State Route 30 connecting Linton, Linton to Waco via Springwood. And Priestdale Road is a suburban road connecting Rochdale to Burbank. The Rochdale Road and Priestdale Road intersection is currently a single lane roundabout located on the boundary of the Brisbane City Council local government area and Logan City Council local government area. The intersection carries approximately 19,200 vehicles daily and road users often experience congestion during peak hours, particularly at school drop-off and pick-up times. This makes it difficult for pedestrians to cross at the roundabout due to high traffic volumes and lack of safe crossing point in the area. As the sur surrounding suburbs continue to grow, traffic demand through the intersection is expected to increase. As the intersection caters for high traffic volume as high as 19,200 vehicles a day traveling through, the inter traveling through the intersection. In addition to the intersection's st strategic network importance, the upgrade will provide the connectivity to many local schools and education centers. That includes Rochdale State School, where there's approximately 950 students, Redeemer Lutheran Col College, approximately 1,000 students, Rochdale State High School, another 1,400 students, St. Peter's Catholic Primary School, another 400. Rochdale South State School, another 1,200 students. In, in addition to that, there's also Rochdale Kids Early Learning Center. The close proximity of the schools, as well as the early learning center, means the intersection needs to better accommodate the significant number of active transport users of school age. The plan upgrade will replace a roundabout at the Rochdale Road and Priestdale Road intersection with traffic signals, increasing capacity, reducing congestion, providing active tr transport facilities, and, pro and improving safety for all road users. The Rochdale Road and Priestdale Road intersection upgrade is jointly funded by Brisbane City Council as part of the Better Roads for Brisbane program, the Australian government as part of the Urban Congestion Fund program, and Logan City Council as part of the Major Roads Upgrade Program, and that the state labor government has contributed their lip service through their credit claiming program. <laughs> Mr. Chair, the upgrade of this critical intersection will involve installing traffic signals, creating four through lanes on Rochdale Road, installing double right turn lanes for westbound traffic on Priestdale Road turning north onto Rochdale Road, constructing off-road path bicycle lanes and prioritized pedestrian crossing on all approaches to the intersection, as well as constructing left turn lanes on all approaches to the intersection. 
In addition, they will be installing a U-turn facility at the northern section, providing motorists with the turning facilities, and also removing the existing zebra crossing south of the intersection on Rochdale Road and the unsignalized crossings east and west of the intersection on Priestdale Road. Also, you are converting the intersection of Rochdale Road and Netherby Street intersection to left in and left out only. You will also remove approximately seven formal on-street parking spaces and 29 formal on-street parking spaces to ensure all road users can travel safely and efficiently through the intersection. Some trees will need to be removed in the area. Um, that's unfortunate, but yep. But most of these are within the Brisbane City Council um, LGA, and uh, these trees I've, I have made with the council officers. They are removed for the right reasons. All trees removed will be offset and where possible replanting will occur within the project area. All replanting will be undertaken in accordance with Brisbane City Council's policies and legislative requirements. The project team will confirm landscaping details as the project design progresses. The procurement for construction was approved at a recent council meeting on 8th of June and we are expecting the construction will start towards the end of the year and have the upgrade completed in the second half of 2022. Mr. Deputy Chair, the Rochdale Road and Priestdale Road intersection upgrade is an important project for McGregor Ward. The good news for, however, the good news for McGregor Ward in the 2021-22 budget does not stop here. There are other projects I would like to raise as well. Mr. Deputy Chair, as we know, Rochdale is one of the new premium developing suburbs in Brisbane and the Shuna Council continue to support Rochdale with significant infrastructure investment. Garden Road is the main road currently connecting Mangrove Kapalaba Road on the north side of the suburb and Mouth Plating Road, which is the main road connecting Gateway, Southeast Freeway, Logan Road, and ML Plains Bus Interchange. The current and future extension will see this road go all the way through to Underwood Road, connecting Rochdale South and the neighboring communities. I would also like to mention about the corridor modernization with reference to Granadilla Street. This is an important corridor, connect, important corridor connecting Sunnybank and Garden City. The gradient and the bend on the road, plus increased local parking, do cause safety concerns for the motorists driving past this busy thoroughfare. The corridor modernization gives us an opportunity to revise and upgrade the current design of the corridor and improve the safety features that will benefit the motorists, pedestrians, and local residents. Mr. Deputy Chair, there are a lot more good news I can talk about in Program 2 in McGregor Ward, but we'll just stick to the main ones and then leave the others to other councillors to talk about the good news in their ward. I'll commend the program to the chamber. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Further speakers? Councillor Hutton. Thank you, Chair. I rise to speak uh, in support of Program 2, Infrastructure for Brisbane. Brisbane fu Brisbane's future is an exciting one, with our city growing every day. More people want to live and work here, more companies want to invest here, and more commuters than ever need to travel into and around our city. As the Lord Mayor mentioned in his budget speech, our city's economic engine is roaring back to life. Mm -hmm. A strong economy needs investment in roads, bridges and major transport hubs. Today, I wish to outline the Shrina Council's plan to secure our economic recovery and move our city forward through the infrastructure program. This plan proactively addresses the emerging challenges, opportunities and strategic direction to meet the needs of residents and industry now and into the future. This $755 million program is robust and responsive, delivering the basics through to the most complex projects for our city. It's a plan that supports our vision for a connected and prosperous, prosperous city, a plan that expands our active transport network to ensure kids like seven-year-old Lily can walk safely to school, a plan that enables businesses and industry to grow and prosper, like KS Easter Transport at, at Waco, a plan that improves your commute to work, whether it be through the smoother streets or transformational upgrades like the Indrapilly Roundabout. It's a plan that has all Brisbane locals at its heart, 
ensuring we get you home sooner and safer. Our record infrastructure investment plan has been made possible by our strong economic management and builds on generation-defining projects, including our green bridges, upgrades to Beams Road, our new Howard Smith Wharf ferry terminal, and as, as Councillor Huang just shared, the Rochdale Road and Priestdale Road upgrade, just to name a few. These projects are transformational for our city and are preparing us for the global stage in 2032. While these large projects are of strong interest, we continue to get the basics right. This budget will continue to maintain and resurface over 400 streets as part of our 5,800 kilometres of road network. The road resurfacing program will help make suburban streets smoother, safer and more enjoyable to use every day. Across my ward, 15 roads are being resurfaced as part of this budget. I won't name them all, but they cover the suburbs of Wacol, Cinnamon Park, Jindalee, 17 Mile Rocks, Westlake, Jamboree Heights, Middle Park and River Hills. In addition to smoother streets, I'm excited about this budget's investment in safer infrastructure for schools, supporting the most vulnerable users of our transport network. I was delighted to read that Jindalee State School is listed in this budget. With this news, I met with my local community policeman, Constable Ben Harm, who regularly runs a walking bus to Jindalee School. At the time, he was running a Learn to Ride program with the Year 4s at the school, teaching them the basics of riding, road rules and how to get to school safely. We shared the news with the kids, who were very excited about their new footpath and pedestrian ref refuge, which would not only help them get safe, safer to school, but easier to ride. It is all about getting the basics right and making sure we invest in the things that matter to ensure we deliver a better Brisbane. While I'm sure my colleague, Councillor Mackay, will focus on the Indrapilly Roundabout Upgrade, a $128 million project that will significantly improve peak travel conditions, not only for his residents, but my residents too. That's right. This budget outlines a fantastic upgrade for my local area too. I know I've spoken in this chamber before about the dangerous Monty Road and Bellwood Street intersection at Dara. Unfortunately, I have been to two accidents there in the past 12 months, so I'm delighted to see the installation of lights and improved pedestrian and cycling access through this corridor. Other major improvements for Jamboree Ward include the installation of a roundabout at Boundary Road and Skepper Street at Ellen Grove. This will be a welcomed investment by both locals and businesses in Ellen Grove, Wacol and Richlands. Crashes on our road have a terrible and lasting impact on individuals and their families, as well as the emergency service personnel and first responders. Our focus on ensuring locals get home sooner and safer is shared and supported by the Morrison government via the Black Spot program. Black Spot projects target the road locations where crashes are occurring by funding such things as traffic signals, roundabouts at these dangerous locations. Recently, I caught up with the member for Wright, the Honourable Scott Buckholtz, to announce $20.8 million from the Morrison government as part of the Black Spot program. Yeah. I'm pleased to see that the Morrison government continue to work in partnership with the Shriner Council to invest in improving safety on our roads, which has seen $1.9 million of this funding for the intersection of Boundary Road and Formation Street in Wacol. Thousands of trucks and vehicles transit through this hairy intersection on a daily basis. And sadly, there have been many accidents and fatalities. On this day, we were joined by local transport business owner, Ken Easter, and his son, Kenny, from KS Easter Transport, a phenomenal transport business in the heart of Wacol. Years of experience has seen them start with just a couple of trucks and transform into a sophisticated logistics business with a fleet of 126 trucks. Hauling time-sensitive freights along Australia's eastern seaboards puts demands on management, drivers and trucks. Time management is vital as part of any trucking operation, but when you're loading overnight interstate deliveries, every minute matters. 
Despite these pressures, safety is paramount to their business. They care about their drivers, they care about those who share the roads with their trucks, and they care about our council's investment and in infrastructure. The upgrade will include providing a larger diameter island, modifying splitter and island curbs, oh, sorry, modifying splitter islands and curb returns, regrading and resurfacing the area, revising curb ramps, ramps and footpaths, and improving pedestrian refuges upgrading line markings and revising street lighting. This roundabout will be used every single day by Ken's 126 trucks, whether it be a B-double, an AB-triple, a road train or a 12-axle B-triple. I got a very good truck lesson while I was there. <laughs> we all care about getting our locals home sooner and safer, and I'm thrilled to see that this budget invests in this vital infrastructure. We are making Brisbane better through this program by taking a coordinated action to ease congestion, make travel safer and improve connectivity for locals and businesses. This plan is ensuring hard-working Brisbane locals can spend more time at home with their families because that is what really matters. I want to acknowledge Councillor McLaughlin and his incredible team from across the department for their huge efforts in pulling together this comprehensive budget. It is truly a plan that has all locals at its heart, delivering for our communities and ensuring we get you home sooner and safer. Further speakers? Councillor Cumming. Thank you, Mr Acting Chair. Uh, I'd like to refer to Program 2, Infrastructure for Brisbane. And, uh, uh, firstly, on page 32, the uh, project Open Level Crossing Contribution. Uh, it's a major issue in my ward, is the Lindham Level Crossing. Uh, I noticed that the, uh, the funds uh, proposed under this item uh, in 21-22, this fin the following financial year that we're looking at, uh, capital proposed is $789,000. 22-23, $10.627 .10 23-23, uh, $24, million, and $24, $25, million. So substantial funds there. Uh, during the information session, I did ask Councillor McLaughlin what level crossing would the monies be spent on, because there's a few controversial ones, as we know, Lindham and uh, the Coopers Plains level crossing. And he said at the time, I'm not sure he was joking or not, he said the $40 million would be spent on whatever project went ahead first. And uh, well, I said, oh, well, make sure Lindham does, will you? Um, <laughs> But, uh, but it, it subsequently he said today that uh, it's, uh, it appears to be, uh, uh, he said also that now the Lindham Level Crossing, all three levels of government are working together to find a, pro a resolution, which is what should, should be happening, because it is an important issue. That wasn't what council said a little while ago. I think it was Councillor Murphy might have said, but uh, oh, we're gonna just, we'll fix the problems. We'll go with the federal government, use their money and fix the problem and the state government can go get lost sort of thing. So that was Councillor Murphy. So thankfully, Councillor Murphy's not in charge of that, uh, that uh, program and uh, Councillor McLaughlin is, uh, because Council I think Councillor McLaughlin's approach is uh, far more reasonable. Uh, the uh, the Lindham Level Crossing is in Winter Manly Ward, very close to the boundary with Doughboy Ward though, and I know Councillor Atwood uh, takes an interest in it as well. Uh, and uh, it's a complicated level crossing. It wouldn't be a simple matter to, uh, to solve the problem. Uh, it's got uh, four roads that lead into the crossing. The crossing is uh, three, uh, three railway tracks wide, two for the, uh, to the city train network, and the, the other one is the, uh, is the uh, port rail uh, line as well, goes through that area. So, so it, it is uh, not a simple area. There's uh, a lot of uh, commercial properties nearby, so if there was resumptions required, it would be quite an expensive ex exercise, and uh, so it's something that uh, a lot of work is needed. Well, I have recently received a note from, uh, from Council to say that they are doing some uh, preliminary work on the, uh, on the uh, area, looking, they're doing investigation works. Uh, they will be topographic surveys, service location survey and geotechnical inve investigations. And the briefing note says the investigation works will help inform future design options for potential road improvements. 
So I, it's good to see that some work has started, uh, even though it's preliminary work, got to start somewhere. And uh, I uh, look forward to seeing uh, uh, further uh, work being done in future and, and all three levels of government cooperating and ensuring that the project is, uh, is done, done in a timely manner and that the problem, the problem is fixed. The, uh, the other thing that uh, I'd like to talk about is the, uh, is the traffic calming. I don't know, I think some uh, councils were concerned about having missed out on traffic calming for their ward. Well, I've got a project in my area, Kamaran Street Precinct, $479,000. And uh, I might have a, a solution for some of those other councils that are worried about missing out on money because uh, I'm not convinced that the residents of my area actually want the project to go ahead. Uh, we've done a couple of lots of consultation, I know, I know, if anyone wants to put a bid in for 479, but uh, <laughs> somewhere down the track. Uh, we've done some several lots of consultation and I'd have to say uh, the response has been uh, not strong. Uh, the, uh, and it's, uh, we were actually going to knock it on the head a, a while ago and I said, look, give it one more lot of consultation. It picked up a little bit, but it's still under the council sort of guidelines for what level of, what percentage response you require and uh, from uh, the general public and also what percentage are in favour of the project. Uh, so it's really struggling. But as people know, if you've uh, been around for a while, the uh, traffic calming isn't always, you know, a bed of roses and some people love it, other people absolutely hate it. And, uh, and in some cases, and a lot of people don't care less about it. And my experience in the past is if you ignore the people who don't care less, if you actually go ahead and do start doing work on their street and, uh, you know, putting uh, speed humps or, or uh, traffic islands and everything, they get quite upset about it. They said, what's this happening? And they said, oh, we've, co we've consulted with you three times about this. And they say, well, I didn't know anything about it. So, and uh, you end up with more negative responses and positive responses, and you think, well, what a waste of time that was. But uh, anyhow, so, uh, so I'm concerned about that, and I'll be talking to uh, Charlie Johnson, who's been working, uh, the council officer who's been working hard with this project with me, and uh, I think I'll do another letter out saying, look, this is your last chance to, to uh, make a final decision on whether this is, should go ahead or not. And, uh, put it as nicely as I can and as positively I can and we'll just see what response we get. And uh, if, if it's a positive response, if it meets council guidelines, obviously it'll go ahead. But if, there's, uh, if it doesn't meet the council guidelines, I won't be uh, putting money in areas where people don't want it and I'll be, I'll be handing it back to council. Yeah, well, the, the department will decide, the chair will decide where the money should go. <laughs> But, uh, so that's, uh, I just thought I'd let everyone know about that one. So thank you. Further speakers, Councillor Mackay. Thanks, Chair. Earlier today, uh, I, I rise to speak about Program 2 uh, for the 21-22 Program 2 budget. Earlier today, I stood and said I was confused because this is only my third budget debate. I'll just clarify, I remain confused. On this side of the chamber, I hear wonderfully positive speeches from my colleagues, such as Councillor Hutton and Jamboree, with the bus. Uh, Councillors. Sorry, I lost my train of thought. So there's a, uh, a wonderful positive Apology attitude out there of the kids walking to school. Councillor Land is in the northern suburbs. It's fantastic. But I remain confused with a heavy heart because Brisbane's the 10th most livable city in the world. That's an official index now. But on the other side of the chamber, we hear, we didn't get enough money for this. We didn't get enough money for that. And then I hear, we got money and we don't want it. I just don't understand what's going on over there. Because Councillor McLaughlin works like a man, I was gonna say, I, I was gonna say that, but I didn't. <laughs> I just didn't want to push that boundary. I, I'm, I'm just going to be careful. I'm not going to call you delusional or possessed, OK? You're a man on a mission. You work hard. I thank you for your work through you, Chair, and to all of the Council officers in the uh, infrastructure area of Council, because they really do a great job. 
And an important portion of the works undertaken in the infrastructure for Brisbane is the planning and design of our road network. This financial year, Council will invest in the planning of key corridors and roads across our great city. It's work like this that will ensure our roads are able to handle the future needs of the city, including as we head to 2032. And there is a lot of planning and design that goes on in the background to keep our city moving. Each year, TPO, that's Transport Planning Operations Team, conducts a significant amount of traffic modelling to support future project design, coordinates the implementation of Council's transport plan, provides input into policies and plans by other levels of government, analyses neighbourhood plans from a transport perspective and assesses development applications. And can I put on the record my thanks to all of those Council officers. I do appreciate that the Walter Taylor area generates a lot of work for them and I thank them for their great work in handling those cases. Now, Councillor McLaughlin mentioned a few uh, road upgrades and I fully support major infrastructure projects that will help improve Brisbane into the coming years. There are large scale infrastructure projects that will undoubtedly have impacts on our roads. But like a dinner of Brussels sprouts and hot dogs, I'm leaving the best bits until the end so you can hear about the Indrapilly roundabout soon. I'm glad to see Council being the driver of a stakeholder group that will achieve our goal of better roads. I'm also glad to see important work, our planning work being invested in and around Walter Taylor. There are a lot of projects and I'm going to go through them. Congestion busting projects include on Moggle Road at Whitmore. And I'll tell you what, put it on the record, if the state government decides to put a school at uh, Perrin Park Precinct, that is going to provide a lot of extra traffic down Whitmore Street. So Councillor McLaughlin, I might come back and knock on your door again for further projects in that area. We're also seeing a congestion busting project at Turinga Parade outside the Indrapilly State School and we have a traffic management plan, and that school is particularly proactive with trying to get parents to do the right thing. We've got yellow line infringements and people going the wrong way down the road, et cetera, et cetera. It's not just happening in Indrapilly, but I do commend that school for taking such a proactive way of uh, handling it. And of course, they do have a stop, drop and go there, courtesy of council and the federal government. There's a major traffic improvement at intersections. We've got two line items. Um, Fig Tree Pocket Road and Kenmore Road is getting, is moving from the design to construction stage of traffic lights and I know my colleague Councillor Adaman is very keen on that because a lot of people from the western suburbs do travel down Kenmore Road and into Fig Tree Pocket Road and that is a particularly dangerous intersection. Jefferson Street and Sherwood Road at Tawong is getting a, uh, a major traffic improvement at that intersection because um, Tawong is a particularly highly trafficked uh, area and it's good to see the investment there. And I was speaking to my good colleague over here, Councillor Maddock, the Councillor for Paddington, about the major road network improvement design at Milton Road at the intersection with Croydon Street. And we agree that with the number of trucks that go down the Milton Road corridor, this is a long overdue uh, piece of infrastructure work and we're very excited to be able to see that delivered for the people of the Tawong uh, Orkin Flower area. Uh, Bridgets and Culverts uh, reconstruction and rehab. You'll be pleased to know that Campbell Newman's Eleanor Chanel Bridge is having the tower lights replaced. Of course, that was opened by Campbell Newman in December 2006. <laughs> And the Walter Taylor Bridge stair access is getting improvements under that same schedule. Crag Road in Turinga is getting curb and channel, and that's just another example of the Schrinner Council's commitment to curb and channeling around the city. Under the local access network improvements, Chapel Hill Road near Fleming Road on the boundary of Walter Taylor Ward and Pullenvale Ward is seeing some action. Now, Councillor Adaman and I did fairly large amounts of door knocking in that area last year, and overwhelmingly, the parents would say to us, our kids cannot walk safely to school because they can't cross <coughs> Chapel Hill Road. Now, we had a huge success, and thank you to the TNO TPO guys uh, for helping to deliver a speed limit reduction on Chapel Hill Road. We've seen it go from 60 to 50, it encourages people to get out and do active transport. And what we believe is going to be a pedestrian crossing across Chapel Hill Road, or at least a, a safe way to cross, is really welcomed. 
And it's a similar story on Swan Road in Turinga, where people are very, very keen on active and public transport in that area. And Swan Road, as you know, uh, Deputy Chair, has had a number of road safety improvements, anti-skid treatment, SAM signs, flashing signs, uh, the speed limit has been reduced from 60 to 50, and now, huge news. For the people of Turinga, it looks like there's a pedestrian safe way to cross the road with a pedestrian crossing on Swan Road at Turinga, and just up the road a little bit further, a preliminary road design to see what can be done with the intersection of Swan and Clarence Road. You remember that intersection, Chair, when you try and come up Clarence Road to turn right into Swan Road? You sort of, danger, danger, Will Robinson. The red lights flash and you get a, the hair on the back of your neck stands up, so it's great to see that something is being done to try and improve that dangerous intersection. Under the line item of local area traffic management, traffic calming, Carinia Street is moving from a design to construction process. As uh, the gentleman in the dashing blue tie pointed out, Councillor Cumming, sorry, I forgot your name for a minute then, uh, pointed out before a lot, <laughs> sorry, a lot of consultation goes into traffic calming. And uh, we're very happy to be able to say that the people of the Carinia Street precinct overwhelmingly support traffic calming to prevent road running through that area. Additionally, the people of Jane De Street, who have been campaigning, they tell me, since Jane Prentice was the councillor, for uh, traffic management and traffic calming in that street, are getting a study done and will begin initial consultation. So I'm very, very happy about that. Uh, another road safety improvement we're going to see in Walter Taylor this year is the intersection of Sir Fred Chanel Drive and Coldridge Street. Now, we have spoken about this in chamber before, and I know Councillor McLaughlin has spoken about this at great length, and this has been an ongoing project. The federal government announced some funding for this, and I'm thrilled to see that it's moving from design to construction in this financial year. That is great news, uh, because we're putting in a right, dedicated right turn lane so people don't cut across and cause the uh, silly accidents. Um, Okay, now onto the hot dog, the good bit, the Indrapilly Roundabout, $128 million project with $50 million contributed by the Morrison Federal Government. Thank you to Julian Simmons for his ongoing advocacy of this uh, project and thank you too to Councillor McLaughlin for pushing it. I know how much you care about the road safety of the Indrapilly road users, um, but do you hear that? That is the sound of cars travelling east and west without stopping at a traffic light. That is fast, uh, free-flowing traffic. So thank you to everyone who participated in the consultation for the preliminary design of the Indrapilly roundabout. It's fantastic for traffic movements for east-west. And we know from the uh, community consultation that access to local shops has been improved. And I know there are people watching this broadcast with bated breath. They already, they've already been let in on the secret. There is improved connectivity for cyclists and for pedestrians. And I know that certain people, such as Space for Cycling and the Bug West groups, have put particular emphasis on making sure that that's been improved. So thank you for that input and thank you to the guys for changing the design. I saw some surveyors out on the street the other day, Deputy Chair, and I can only assume that they're doing the services, uh, moving the services for the gas and the power and the plumbing and so on and so forth. So I am led to believe that construction is going to start in just a month or two, which is fantastic because... Councillor Mackay, your time has ended. Thank you. And thank you for the first. This is the first time I've ever, ever heard of an intersection being referred to as a hot dog and I'm sure it is the first time for the Chamber as well, so well done. <laughs> Further speakers? Thank you. Councillor Hammond. Thank you, um, Acting Chair. I rise to speak and support Program 2, um, and I really think it should be called infrastructure for the suburbs, not infrastructure for Brisbane, because there is so much happening in our suburbs. I'm going to start with the safer paths to school. Councillor Davis, I know it's technically your school, but my kids did go there and I can look across the road um, on Appleby Road to see Queen of Apostles. Um, Queen of um, Apostles Primary School is a beautiful little school. I can speak um, highly of the school two campuses. 
but it is becoming a more active school in the area. So I'm glad, happy to see, even though it's in Councillor Davis's side of the road, some improvements around Queen of Apostles. Um, Somerset Hills. Somerset Hills is a beautiful little school. It's got a soft spot for every elected member who's been representative in that area. Um, it's a school of just over 100 students. Um, their car park is amazing. It's a council car park. However, that school pours its, all its efforts into active school travel, and I'm so happy to see that we're including some of the safety paths to schools in that particular area. Now, road designs. Again, Councillor Davis, this is on our border. Oh, I have a little bit of this road, um, and you have the rest. It's Rody Road. Um, so the design from Rody Ro um, Payton Street, which is in McDowell Ward, up to Webster Road, which is in Marchant Ward, is getting some design work. This is very much welcome. It's a very busy corridor along that Rody Road, travelling east-west. Um, from Pat um, Parton Street, if I could say in Councillor Davis's area, goes from two down to one lane as you go down the hill past our beautiful Raven Street Reserve. And then, of course, up the hill to um, Appleby, Maundrell and Rody Road intersection into two lanes. You go across there. There's a busy shopping centre. And yes, Councillor Davis, your office is very welcome to be in my ward on that side of the road. But that intersection is the roadie shops there. It's exceptionally busy um, for people to cross. So I'm glad we're getting some design work along there. But about, probably about 200 metres further east, it does go back again downhill. It does go back down to the one lane until the work that we did a couple of years ago at the corner of Webster and Roadie Road, where we've included turning lanes um, and widened, not widened, but made that intersection more workable. So I'm delighted to see that we've got some money in there and very welcomed money um, to do some design work that helps not only the residents of Marchant, but also the residents of McDowell as well. The local asset network improvements, Kitchener Road, um, between Turner and Glentana Street at Kedron. Now, many of you will know I have been raving about the best park in Brisbane to be built for a long time at Bradbury Park. It's actually right near that particular intersection. So we've got the cemetery on one side, we've got the beautiful Bradbury Park, and then we go in down to our industrial um, area. So it'd be great to see some safety improvements, especially with the spend that um, this Shrina Council is spending um, at Bradbury Park to enhance the safety around that particular area. I hear Councillor Cumming talks about um, local traffic management. I couldn't agree with you more, Councillor um, Cumming. Uh, traffic calming is probably the, one of the most difficult things to do consultation on. Um, it heightens people's emotions about what we're doing. But these two streets in Chermside, they're a small spend, sorry, in Grange, one, they're both in Grange, actually. Chermside Street, Grange. Back in 2015, we did have some money to fund the traffic management in that particular street. It is a, it is a little bit of a rat run, because it comes off Raymont Road down to Blantford Street and then on to Grange Road there. Um, unfortunately, at the time, it was refused by the residents to get the traffic management into that particular street, which would mean some minor drainage works and everything else. So I share your pain, Councillor Cummings. Um, as people sold and new people moved in, it kept on getting investigated again. We need traffic management. We need traffic management. Um, I'm happy to say after all these years of doing consultation and only last year, we finally got 100%, sorry, 98% of the street to actually accept that they would need traffic calming in their particular street and support traffic calming. So with that, I'm happy to see that we've got the money in the budget to do the design there for Chermside Street. Also, Myrtle Street Precinct. Again, back in 2008, um, when I was a very fresh councillor back then, we got some money into the area to do some traffic management. Um, as we all do, we listen to our residents. Um, I've learnt from this mistake, um, Councillor McLaughlin, not to listen to my residents, because they come first, by the way, but we only put one traffic calming measurement into Myrtle Street. Um, Myrtle Street's pro approximately 300 metres long. The whole area in that particular Grange pocket, that beautiful pocket there, which is 40 kilometres an hour there, has some kind of traffic management. So the residents have been asking for the second 
platform to be put in. So thank you, Councillor McLaughlin, for putting that money in so we can write my error back from 2008. Um, congestion busting projects. Again, Councillor Davis, this is a shared one with you and I. It's Appleby Road and Jarvis Street. I think it should be called Appleby Road Wilgarning because that's Marchant Ward side, but it is a roundabout up the top of the hill there, um, which does cause some concerns and traffic problems in the morning and also pedestrian crossing at that particular intersection. Um, <coughs> Ellison and Kirby Road. That is one intersection that we did have money for back in the Jim Sawley era, actually, for lights, and it was rejected by the residents, or pulled, I think is more accurate, from Jim Sawley back in the day. Um, we've done some design work at that particular intersection. I can't wait to see them, and I can't wait to see this very... It is a dangerous intersection, because you go up a hill, it's on a blind hill, so you can't actually... Well, it's very nerve-wracking. Um, to turn right at the end of Kirby Road into Ellison. So we have done some minor works there in the past, but it'll be great to see what this Shrinar Council is going to deliver for the safety of people in the Aspley area, and not only the Aspley area, on the north side of Brisbane. The most exciting one I want to talk about, and I've got to thank um, Lord Mayor Adrian Shrinar and Councillor McLaughlin, and also the previous chair to that, Councillor, Amanda Cooper, um, is the Hamilton Stabe Road intersection. So we've loaded up in the budget, thank you so much, $17.8 million. But what worries me about this particular intersection is the state, it's right near the Prince Charles Hospital. The state government exempted themselves from any infrastructure, even though it was identified by their own traffic engineers. They pulled, they will not help. They exempted themselves from any infrastructure and further infrastructure. Now all I'm getting is games. I ask you this, how many times do you have to ask a state member to meet with you to talk about this very important safety issue? How many times do you think you'd have to ask, considering they only got elected last October? should only have to ask once. I've asked seven times this for a meeting. Nice. And the state member, I'm not sure if he's getting the messages from his staff, but, oh dear, his staff are actually saying, I'm refusing a meeting with him. That is simply not true. Jimmy, get meet, have a meeting with me. What are you scared of? This includes, you've got $1 million in that budget, Mr Sullivan, from the state government to improve that intersection. And that's to improve the bollards that the Labor state government put up to stop people from turning right outside the hospital. A million dollars to fix that after a nurse was killed. That was their fix to the project. I say to you, State Government, start working with Council, because I know Council's been talking with the State Government and Metro North for at least four years to try and get this project up off the ground. It's not only the State Government have, have, have said they're improving and expanding the Prince Charles Hospital. Well, this means more staff coming into that area. Remember everybody in this chamber, it was Paul Lucas that demanded that that particular area around the hospital gets upzoned. That's where our beautiful Weller on the Park is. He forced up to us to upzone, but then exempted himself from any infrastructure improvements in that local area. Shame. I call on you, Mr Sullivan, to actually meet with me and sit down and go through the designs with me and try and cut through the red tape. No more game playing, because I know that Stephen Miles um, took 11 months to get back to me. He does not want the lights there, Shame. even though they say to people in um, public that that's their priority. I took 11 months to get a... Oh, letter back from Minister Miles, and he said, no, his main improvement is well, where he wants the light is Webster Road. Now, you Northsiders will know Webster Road is the best flowing road north to south. To put a set of lights there just 200 metres away from a big roundabout that works beautifully would absolutely be disastrous for that intersection. Thank you. Thank Your time has expired. Further speakers? Point of order, Chair. Point of order, Councillor Landers. Mr Chair, I move that Council now adjourn for afternoon tea for 15 minutes, which commences only when all councillors have left the meeting. Seconded. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those against? The ayes have it. See you after afternoon tea.
Uh, welcome back, councillors. Um, are there any further speakers to the Infrastructure for Brisbane program? No further speakers. I will call upon David, uh, McGuire, Councillor McLaughlin, to respond. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello, opposition. Hello. <laughs> Uh, oh, Charles, thank you, for, thank you for joining us. Look, um, I'm uh, concluding um, the debate on, uh, on this program, which is, uh, as all councillors have contributed, is one of the, the great programs of the council. Um, I think sometimes we lose sight of the natural benefit that council has, Brisbane City Council has, looking after 1,400 square kilometres. It is unique in local government. Um, and it means we can do things which other local governments can only dream of. Local governments look at us in wonder and say, how could you do as a local council a project like the Kingston Smith Drive upgrade? Um, that, that is just one example of the benefit that we bring to the table because of our, our size. But it also means that, Mr Chair, we're looking after 5,800 kilometres of roads. Um, and it means we have a, a big task under this program to maintain those roads, to make sure they're fit for purpose, doing the things that they want, that people want and expect of council to provide in the way the road network works. But I said at the outset that you know, what we need out of, a road pro out of our roads program, out of our network program, is to deliver a road network that means we're fit for business, that we're providing the roads that meet the needs of our residents as they go about their daily, daily uh, routines, getting their kids to school, getting the kids home from school, getting to work, getting home from work, tradies going around the, the business of, of doing their work. So that's what the infrastructure program delivers for our city and it delivers it in spades, making sure that our roads connect the residents of Brisbane, our, our visitors, our tradies to their employment, to their recreational opportunities. So that's what the, the program delivers. Um, and I think uh, whilst there may be some quibbles about specific items that may or may not have been included in this budget, I think we all need to take a global position on what this budget is enabling us to do, and that is to build a better road network. I will go to some of the issues that were raised by the opposition. I note that uh, Councillor Johnson is taking on the role as being leader of the opposition over there, um, and we haven't heard from the supposed actual leader of the opposition in this debate. But um, to a couple of points, and I just want to, to, to respond to the issues raised um, on Cracknell Road, for example, raised by both Councillor Johnson and Councillor Griffiths, noting that Councillor Griffiths supported that project, a congestion busting project that Councillor Griffiths supported. Councillor Johnson didn't. Now, um, I think the officers explained to Councillor Griffiths, and I'm pretty sure he understood that this was funding that was provided through the uh, Transport Infrastructure Development Scheme. Point of order. A point of order. Um, Councillor Johnston. Claim to be misrepresented. Uh, I'm not sure you weren't in the room at the time the, the speech was, but that speech was occurring. Uh, Councillor McLaughlin. Point of order. Point of order, Councillor Johnston. Um, we already have established that the rule is if you feel your speech was um, misrepresented in some way. I did speak on this program earlier. I do feel my speech has been misrepresented and I am claiming misrepresentation. Uh, fine. Councillor McLaughlin. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Chair. Look, the, the, the work that was being um, proposed for Cracknell Road was a congestion busing project with funding provided through the State Government's Transport Infrastructure Development Scheme, which obliges Council to complete a project uh, for which funds have been allocated in the financial year for which the money is provided. If a councillor says, I don't like that project, um, fine, the, pro the, the monies will be reallocated elsewhere because the obligation we have to the state, the funder of that project, is to provide to do that work within the financial year for which the, the monies have been provided. Uh, Councillor Johnson believes that there's more comprehensive work that needs to be undertaken at that intersection. That's fine. That is her right to, to represent what Councillor Johnson believes through you, Mr Chair. Councillor Johnson believes should happen at that intersection. Uh, Point of order. Point of order. Councillor Johnson. The claim to be misrepresented. Yep. Councillor McLaughlin. Uh, so, I mean, Councillor Johnson rejected the original proposal for the Cracknell Road fix-ups. The project funds were reallocated elsewhere. But if Councillor Johnson wants to uh, uh, increase the scope for that project, that's entirely within her right to argue the case, to represent her constituents in this regard to the, the transport operation, the transport planning operations officers, and see if the, the, if the project can be funded by another mean, with the uh, by other means, with the significant increase 
in the scope that uh, Councillor Johnson suggests is needed there. Um, and I look forward to that being in a future budget submission, whether it was in this current budget submission or not, I don't know. But uh, if, if there's uh, an appetite for that to be in a future budget submission, I'm sure it will come forward for, for future consideration. Look, um, in regard to some of the other points that were being made in debate from the other, from others and all of us on this side as well, um, I wanted to go to the uh, recognition of the, app, the uh, funding that's been provided for the Walter Taylor Ridge Feasibility Study, um, which is a budget allocation um, for, uh, to continue work that's underway to uh, look at what can be done there. Um, I'm not too sure whether Councillor Johnson is aware of the um, motivation of the member for Miller uh, in this regard, who wants a local only bridge at Walter Taylor, at Walter Taylor Bridge and the duplication. I'm not sure how a, a locals only bridge would work. Um, uh, so if, if the member for Miller is suggesting a toll bridge uh, with a discount or a or fee free for local residents, let him be the advocate for that. But that's, uh, that's what he has said publicly. He wants a locals only bridge, which would be interesting. Um, um, but uh, and uh, in response to that suggestion, in others I saw the, that he also wanted Oxley Road to, be, to stay as it is. Well, um, as has been observed by others, this would make the only approach to, to a new uh, Walter Taylor Bridge would be on Honour Avenue with additional lanes, which would be uh, an interesting outcome. But these are the things that will be looked at in terms of the pre-feasibility study works which are underway and which will be taken out for uh, public consultation in due course when the officers working on those options have finished their work and uh, brought it through in the first instance, instance to City Cabinet for consideration. There was discussion about Ipswich Road and Venner Road. Look, um, none of us in this place I'll put it the other way, everyone in this place wants to improve road safety. That's what we're all here for. Um, I know that councillors Johnson and Griffiths are strong advocates for changing the road network in their wards and good on them for that. Um, but as all of us are, I see those, uh, those requests coming through all the time. Uh, those councillors Johnson and Griffiths through you, Mr Chair, are like all the other councillors in this place strongly advocating on behalf of their residents in this place to, to, to make things better, which is great. And I appreciate that they make those suggestions. Uh, the, the issues that need to be attended to at Venner Road are uh, that to do the sorts of things that I've seen being advocated for would require a significant contribution of land around the intersection. In other words, resumptions. Um, if, if, if and when there's available budget, for undertaking those road resumptions required to make a change to Ipswich and Venner Road work. Uh, that, that will be something that be, can be attended to in a future Councillors. budget, but there is no quick fix there at that intersection within the existing road geography, within the existing road network. So the only fixes that would fix the sorts of things that are being talked about there with extra lanes uh, would be through property resumptions. Um, there was discussion about open level crossings um, and Councillor Cumming, thank you for your contribution in that regard in relation to uh, Lindham crossing in particular. Uh, look, I, I, it would be fantastic if the state government here adopted the state government uh, program for open level crossing replacement in Victoria, where they're doing them in job lots. Everybody knows that open level crossings are state government responsibilities. Railways are their responsibility. The, the rail lines are their responsibility. They cross our road network, but, and the council is prepared and happy to contribute to open level crossing fixes as the state government Point of order, Mr. Point Chair. Point of order to you, Lord Mayor. Will Councillor McLaughlin Councilor take a McLaughlin, question? Will you take a question? I think I'm obliged to, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Lord, <laughs> Lord Mayor, please proceed. When, um, when uh, Victoria went ahead with their record replacement of open level crossings, not just one or two, but something like 40 of them, was it the local councils that funded that? No. Oh, thank Councilor you very McLaughlin. much for that question, uh, Lord Mayor. Indeed, all the projects that were undertaken to replace open level crossings in Victoria were undertaken by the Victorian state government. Uh, looking, looking ahead, knowing that the network had to, had to be fixed and, and putting out to tender at least 40, and I think it's gone up since then, open level crossing replacements, and that's a fantastic model. However, we know that the state government here is eking them out. If you want to see what their program is, it was announced in their budget, that's, go and have a look. Um, they've got three open level crossings that they talk about there. Um, and they are at um, Lindham, at uh, Beams Road, and where else are they talking about? 
Beams Road, um, a couple of times at Beams Road, and Cooper's Crossing. So they're, they're the three crossings that are recorded in here as priorities, but nothing with an extensive program starting immediately. They're all planning stages, interim, interim uh, budgets being allocated in forward years. So we're not seeing anything significant come forward. Uh, but it's there. Uh, in terms of Lindum, we are working on some solutions Councillor Cumming, happy to share those uh, suggestions with you. I think there's some early fixes uh, that we can implement there uh, while we look at the longer term solutions. The, longer the real longer term solution will be a difficult and expensive project and that will require contributions from the state and federal government um, and Council is happy to contribute to uh, a fix there at Lindham Crossing as well. Uh, there was discussion about uh, Council local area traffic management Council plans. Councillor McLaughlin, your time has expired. Thank you. Uh, I will now, uh, Councillor Johnson. You had some misrepresentations. Yes, on the first point of sorry, on the first point of misrepresentation, uh, Councillor McLaughlin said that I did not support the project. Um, that is untrue. I offered constructive feedback about pedestrian safety that had okay. been compromised Thank by you. the project and design. There was another one. On the second uh, point of misrepresentation, uh, Councillor uh, McLaughlin said um, that I was advocating for more comprehensive work to be undertaken on the project. In fact, I was only asked to consult on the design, and if they've just put the turning lane in like they were proposing, there wouldn't Thank be you, a problem. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. That's, that's argument now. All right, we will now uh, proceed to a vote. All those in favour of uh, the adoption of the program infrastructure for Brisbane, please say aye. Aye. And those against, please say no. The ayes have it. There is no division called. We'll proceed to clean, green and sustainable city. Councillor Davis. Mr Chair, I move that for the clean, green and sustainable city program, the services of council, the allocations for the operations and the projects and total project expenditure are set out on pages 41 to 63 for the years 2021 to 22 through to 2024 to 25, so far as they relate to program three, be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Davis, seconded by Councillor Mackay that the, the clean, green and sustainable city program, the services of council, the allocation of the operations and the projects and total project expenditures is set out on pages 41 to, 40, to, 41 to 63 for the years 2021-22 through to 2024-25. So far as they relate to program three, be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor Davis. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. It gives me great pleasure to present to the Chamber the annual budget for program three on behalf of the Lord Mayor and Councillor Cunningham. Brisbane is in the top 10 most livable cities in the world, Mr Chair. It hasn't happened by accident. And many of the reasons so many people want to call Brisbane home relate to this program. Our parks and playgrounds, our walking tracks and lookouts, our urban forest and natural habitat areas, the famous brown snake and our network of meandering creeks. The Schrinner Council is relentlessly focused on making Brisbane a better place to live and our clean, green and sustainable agenda is creating better suburbs right across Brisbane. In this year's budget for Brisbane's environment, parks and sustainability, we are investing in our city's clean and green future. Mr Chair, the Lord Mayor has a bold vision for Brisbane, a vision for our city, a vision for our suburbs and a vision for our environment and public spaces. While we see many just talk about the environment and climate change, it was this side of the chamber that actually took the bold step to make Brisbane City Council Australia's largest carbon neutral organisation back in 2017. And Mr Chair, we have maintained carbon neutral status every year since. It was this Lord Mayor who in 2019 saw a 45 hectare golf course in a growing precinct with significant public transport investment in the pipeline and said, let's create Brisbane's biggest new park in 50 years. Mm -hmm. Mr Chair, that park opens to the public next Thursday. Well it is his vision and the continued strong leadership of the LNP that is making Brisbane even better. We rightly talk about roads, bridges and public transport when we think about infrastructure. But for families, having close access to a playground in such, is such a key part of the social fabric of their community and is certainly part of the infrastructure that the Schrinner Council wants to deliver more and more of as we build better suburbs. We have some significant playground projects in this year's budget. In Tigham, there is $700,000 to deliver a new playground at Fernwood Place Park. 
We have similar investments for new and improved playgrounds in Wynnum, Richlands, Murray, Windsor, Anala, Rochdale and Nudgee this year. Our award-winning scooter track at Kedron has been a huge success, so we'll be rolling them into every region in the city, with 800,000 to deliver tracks in Hemant, The Gap and Richlands over the next two years. For the older kids, we're investing $650,000 across two years in new Ninja Warrior style fitness courses to complement the course we delivered at Guyatt Park, St Lucia. These will be in Camp Hill, Callanvale and Mr Chair at Taralba Park in Everton Park on the boundary of our wards, which will be very, very popular with families in our area. Also starting soon is the start of construction on the exciting and innovative new play space at Bradbury Park at Kedron. With a potential home games on the horizon, the Schrinner Council is backing budding sports stars with a range of investments to help residents of all ages get active. We have over a dozen park exercise equipment projects, five skate park projects, and well over $1.5 million for new and improved basketball courts. This year, construction will be complete on our major district sports facility at Wally Tate Park, and work will get underway at the Nudgee Recreation Reserve, which will have sporting fields uh, catering, for, catering for multiple sports, including touch football, cricket and soccer. We're also gearing up for the delivery of a new international standard wheeled sport precinct at Murray Recreation Reserve. The Lord Mayor has allocated $1.2 million over three years for the refurbishment of Chelmer Oval to support cricket and AFL. As I mentioned before, Mr Chair, next Thursday sees the first major step in the delivery of the Victoria Park vision. The 1st of July 2021 will be a momentous day for Brisbane with the 45 hectare golf course to become new parkland for residents and visitors to enjoy. We have our award-winning city parklands team ready to go. And even before significant works commence, Victoria Park will be an amazing space to explore and have a picnic with the city skyline framed by trees and rolling green hills. There is $15.8 million in this year's budget to progress work on delivering the Victoria Park vision including funding to maintain and activate the park. There is also an early works program to bring in additional amenities, improve the pathways and fill in the bunkers. Mr Chair, another exciting initiative announced by the Lord Mayor in this year's budget is the establishment of the Brisbane Sustainability Agency. Mm -hmm. The agency will bring together the expertise and experience of City Smart and Oxley Creek transformation to collectively supercharge the Schrinner Council's long-term plan for a clean, green and sustainable Brisbane. The Brisbane Sustainability Agency will accelerate the delivery of projects, services and key <coughs> environmental initiatives that produce sustainable and livable outcomes for Brisbane. These will include the enhancement of some of Brisbane's unique public spaces and natural assets, while protecting the city's rich biodiversity and improving waterway health through key projects such as the $100 million transformation of the 20 kilometre Oxley Creek Corridor. This year, the focus of our Oxley Creek transformation moves to the Archfield Wetlands Precinct. In the coming months, construction will start on the new 2.7 kilometre shared recreation trail, which will unlock access to the 150 hectare site. This year, we will also progress with the Archfield Wetlands Parkland project with construction to commence as early as next year. And these projects will be led by the new Brisbane Sustainability Agency. Our focus on unleashing the environment and social potential of our waterways doesn't stop at Oxley Creek. This year, we will complete two landmark projects at Handlam Park and at 7th Brigade Park. The first stage at Handlam Park opened last month and it is really something to be seen. This financial year, there is $8.7 million allocated to complete the final stages of this flagship project as part of the Norman Creek Master Plan. We also have funding this financial year to complete the Downfall Creek Restoration Project at 7th Brigade Park at Chermside. These works will stabilise the creek landscape to reduce sediment loss and erosion, stopping up to 7.5 shipping containers of sediment from moving downstream each year. 
Brisbane has over 4,000 kilometres of waterways and the Shrina Council is committed to working with the community and stakeholders to preserve and improve waterway health. One such partnership is with our creek catchment groups across the city. In this year's budget, we're pleased to announce that we will be moving to a system of allowing these groups to apply for longer term funding agreements to support their administrative costs and reduce the need for repetitive annual grant applications. By reducing this burden, our creek catchment groups can spend more time on the ground and less time filling in paperwork. Brisbane is already Australia's most biodiverse capital city, but we are not resting on our laurels. The Shrina Council has an ambitious target to reach 40% natural habitat cover in our city by 2031. Between 2016 and 2020, we took decisive action to supercharge our bushland acquisition program with a 10-year investment program delivered in just four years. Over 780 hectares were acquired, and that's more than a dozen Victoria parks. We continue to invest in preserving our bushland through both acquisition and on-ground works. Our environmental offsets program sees us restore habitat areas every year. Since 2016, we have established over 250 hectares of restoration works at 39 sites across Brisbane. In the coming year, the Shrina Council proposes to deliver another 47 hectares of restoration work at nine sites in Chandler, Carina, Wakeley, Mansfield, Currabi, Doolandella, Acacia Ridge, Stretton and Mogul. The Lord Mayor is committed to making Brisbane the koala capital of Australia, and this year we are investing over one half of a million dollars in groundbreaking koala research projects and continuing to manage our koala fodder plantation at Wakehole. The Shrina Council believes that the best way to help our community value our natural areas is to share it with them. We have continuing investments in improving access and recreation opportunities in our conservation reserves, building on our popular lookout projects like Milne Hill Lookout in my ward. Last year, we released the draft off-road cycling strategy for consultation. We want to support sustainable, active recreation in our city. In this budget, the Shrina Council has allocated an additional $500,000 in support for trail care programs, trail planning and delivery, environmental and safety assessments, compliance and education. This is in addition to the annual funding in our conservation reserves program. There will be further announcements about the outcomes and potential projects in coming months as the review of the draft strategy is finalised. Mr Chair, this budget reaffirms the Shrina Council's commitment to carbon neutrality and emissions reduction. We proudly purchase 100 per cent renewable energy and from Australian renewable energy generation. And despite what you might hear from those opposite, 67 per cent of the Shrina Council investment in carbon offsets and renewable energy certificates is in Australia. Yeah. This year we will continue to fund LED lighting upgrades and solar installations on our council buildings and community lease sites to support continued energy efficiency improvements. We will also continue to engage the community on our journey to create a cleaner, greener future. The Brisbane Carbon Challenge is part of our goal to help households reduce their emissions by 50% by 2031. We will also be working with the community to help create greener suburbs. This financial year, we will hold community street, tre uh, street tree planting events in Nunda, Deegan, Dara, Ellen Grove, Anala, Eight Mile Plains, Carina Heights and Manly West. This is in addition to our projects to create tree-lined subtropical boulevards in suburbs across Brisbane. A key focus of this program is to create a resilient city. Earlier this year, we marked 10 years since the 2011 floods. The policies and actions we have implemented since then are all about making sure Brisbane is safe and ready for severe weather and also to be able to bounce back. Our Flood Resilient Homes program completed its 100th home retrofit in the past financial year. This program has been recognised nationally as one of the top flood risk management projects in the country. This financial year we're expanding the program and will start working with residents in West End and Capera. Mr Chair, this year the Shrina Council is investing over $40 million in managing Brisbane's flood and climate hazard risks, minimising impacts and delivering stormwater and drainage solutions. We are looking to the future and delivering the infrastructure our growing city needs. 
In the rapidly emerging community of Pallara, the Lord Mayor has allocated $15 million over the next four years to deliver stormwater drainage projects and pro provide open space for the community. In this year's budget, the Shrina Council has also committed to funding ongoing works to manage coastal erosion at Cowan Cowan. Mr Chair, we support the residents of Brisbane, no matter where they live. To conclude, after a challenging year in 2020, Brisbane has bounced back, and this budget is testament to that. We can only deliver budgets like these with careful financial management, and with the ratepayers and residents of Brisbane knowing that they can rely on the Shrina Council to responsibly manage Australia's largest local government. Whether you live in Tigham or Pallara, West End or Wynnum, Capera or Cowan Cowan, the Shrina Council supports you and your community and the investments in this program will help make your area a better place to live now and in the future. I commend the Program 3 budget to the Chamber. Yeah. Further speakers? <coughs> Councillor Johnston. Yes, thank you. I rise to speak on Program 3. Um, firstly, I will just start by saying <clears throat> I'm sorry I didn't get to attend this session. I was in the um, uh, community, uh, oh, Councillor Marx's committee, because I'm on that committee, so I had to city stand. It's got such a long name now, it's very hard to keep track. At least Councillor Howard's is Kane, it's easy to remember. Um, so I'm sorry I didn't get there. It does not mean I'm not interested, but I did have commitments on the committee that I was on um, uh, for Councillor Marks. Um, I have had a good look through uh, this uh, program item, and it is a very important part of uh, the budget because um, we have a huge amount of green space in uh, Tennyson Ward, and we have numerous creeks, including the Brisbane River's largest tributary, Oxley Creek, uh, and obviously a huge chunk of the Brisbane River is the border. Um, so uh, environmental issues are very significant in the ward that I represent. Um, I just want to start with a few things that are in the budget. Um, firstly, uh, I know that the Lord Mayor has now uh, given $2.1 million to uh, the Chelmer Sports Club, um, which is to go to the three organisations that lease that, and they always leave off the private school, but Ambrose Tracy, um, uh, West Cricket and um, the Kenmore Bears uh, AFL Club. And, you know, they build a giant sports field out there at Mogul, and if the Kenmore Bears, no offence to Peter, but if he wants to go back out to his natural home, he's welcome to. Um, uh, look, I am, you know, what I don't understand is that um, council officers who work very hard behind the scenes have identified um, that the Walter Thompson um, uh, Reserve at Chelmer um, which has been closed now and unable to be used for any kind of sport for seven years. Um, it's been fully costed and designed and it is sitting there awaiting funding. Um, and it is not being funded. The Oval needs remediation. Um, and it is incredibly sad that junior sport, which has been played there for generations, cannot be played there. Um, and it is just, it's unclear to me um, why the Lord Mayor is not funding this project, because that would increase the capacity of sport um, to be played. This investment at the Chelmer Sports Club is going to put in new facilities to an existing sports club. Now, that's great. They're getting new cricket practice nets. Uh, they're getting a new clubhouse. Um, they're, they're, all, they're all wonderful things, and I'm, I'm very happy that they're getting it. But I do not understand why this council is not investing in restoring sports fields that councils had to close because they are unsafe. And it's seven years now. And I know that the work has been done by the officers and that project is at the top of the list to be delivered, yet this administration refuses to put the money in. Um, and I, I, I think that is really despicable. Um, I just want to comment on a couple of other things that are in the budget as well. Uh, the Oxley Creek Transformation Project. Uh, firstly, there's some odd things happening. Um, this year, the funding for the Oxley Creek, Creek Transformation Company has been slashed. So when this project was announced, it was going to be five million a year for 20 years. Um, and up till now, roughly, it's been five million a year that councils put in. Uh, this year, they're only putting in sort of two and a half million dollars. And there's a five million dollar grant coming, presumably, I believe, from the federal government. 
Beyond that, there is only $2 million a year coming for the Oxley Creek Transformation Company. So in very real terms, this council is cutting the funding that it promises and has promised for the Oxley Creek Transformation Project. That is clearly in the budget and in the forwards for the next uh, three years beyond this year. And there's been no explanation about why. Um, I have an idea as to why many of the projects they've been talking about cannot be delivered. They're extremely complex because of um, the creek itself. Uh, and it, it's very clear that um, despite all the grand promises, there's, there's a lot of things that can't actually be delivered here. But this administration is still claiming that they are funding this project. In fact, this budget cuts their funding this year and for the next three years. In addition to that, um, there's this weird switch out going on. So the Oxley Creek Transformation Company Proprietary Limited I think is being dissolved and a new company called the Sustainable Agency Proprietary Limited is being created and we just heard a little bit more um, from Councillor Davis that it's going to include Greenheart City Smart um, and some other things that will go in there. Um, so not only are they cutting the funding for Oxley Creek Transformation, they're cutting its importance by building it into some other organisation with multiple priorities. So I think Clearly things are starting to go wrong there um, and I'm very disappointed. We are yet to see a single thing in my ward um, be delivered uh, for the Oxley Creek Transformation Project. They're talking about a lot of things but we've not seen a single thing delivered. And I have the mouth of Oxley Creek all the way up to uh, Oxley um, where the Ipswich motorway is that's in my ward and we're not seeing a sausage. So that's a real concern to me and I'm not sure how the Sustainable Agency Proprietary Limited, um, which is a secret company, again, it's not transparent to us, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not a division of council where we can uh, make file requests, it's set up as a separate corporation um, and it, it's not accountable to us. Now, Councillor Davis, if she wants to, Mr Chair, could stand up and offer to table their annual reports. That would help increase transparency. Um, perhaps she'd like to do that. Um, that would be a very good outcome of what I'm saying here today. But at the moment, um, these companies are not transparent. They are not accountable to us in the chamber here in the same way that divisions of council are, and that is a problem. Very briefly, um, there's no money for playgrounds in my ward. There's no money for tree planting in my ward. There's no money for drainage in my ward. There's no money for black, uh, backflow valves in my ward. Um, there is a little bit of money for the Sherwood Arboretum. Um, and uh, most of last year's money wasn't actually spent, despite the fact that there are so many projects that needs doing. They didn't get done, so that money's rolling over. Um, so there's a problem with delivery. There's no amenities being delivered, no loos, no barbecues. There's no Ninja Warrior courses. There's no scooter tracks. Um, so certainly I'm a little bit concerned um, that this budget does not put the necessary funding in uh, that is required for my ward. And that's why I moved the following amendment. Um, I move that this council transfers $2 million from service 3.4.4.1, stormwater maintenance and renewal, operating expense to a new project in 3.4.3.1, flood resilience planning and delivery backflow valves, to build the backflow valves identified in the AECOM report undertaken by council following the January 2000 and flood in flood prone areas of the south side. Seconded. I have an <coughs> amendment motion proposed by Councillor Johnson, seconded by Councillor Griffiths. Uh, Councillor Johnson, I trust you'll be distributing that to the uh, CCLO team so that we can be passed around. Um, thank you. You have 10 minutes to the amendment, please. Uh, thank you, and I'll be as quick as I can here because this is a um, regular amendment that I move. I have structured it a little bit. I am being a little bit proactive for the south side, but I don't mean to exclude any other councillors, and I would support any north side councillors calling for their backflow valves to be delivered as well, but uh, I know there are quite a lot on the south side that are waiting funding. So, um, what I'm proposing with this amendment is that funding that's allocated for the purpose of stormwater drainage maintenance is uh, actually allocated to a specific purpose, and that is to build the backflow valves that are identified in the AECOM report um, undertaken by Council after the floods. Now, this was an independent engineering report um, undertaken at Council's request to identify how flood mitigation measures could be undertaken um, to protect flood-prone suburbs of Brisbane. 
um, and it was an, a recommendation of the review that Council did. Um, the report is very useful. It outlines numerous suburbs around Brisbane, particularly on the south side, where backflow valves would benefit homes and communities. Now, this is the kind of flooding that comes up stormwater pipes um, prior to the river breaking its banks and causing river flooding. Backflow valve um, help uh, stop that water charging back up the drains. In my area, that gives people more time to evacuate, um, and that will mean the difference between water in their yards or their downstairs, um, and it would be a significant improvement for people in Tennyson Ward. There are numerous sites in my ward that have not yet been funded. Um, and that includes in Chelmer, in Tennyson, in Yoronga and in Fairfield. And there are multiple locations in each of those suburbs. Um, these uh, should all be on Council's Capital Works list and in Council's LGIP. Um, but it was confirmed to me by the LGIP team that there are no backflow valves in either the LGIP or the LTIP. So this Council has no intention of doing any further backflow valves despite it being a recommendation after the floods and despite an engineering report being done saying how important they are. Um, it is important to me uh, and it is important to the community that I represent. The LGIP debate that we're having in my community at the moment is, is illuminating. Um, there have been dozens and dozens of submissions made um, calling on council to restore the stormwater drainage funding uh, for Yoronga. Um, residents there are very upset uh, that Council uh, has cut their stormwater drainage um, funding. They cut it in 2018 and they've cut it again now in 2021. Um, and this is a suburb where there has been a huge amount of development. This is a suburb that would also benefit from backflow valves. So all I'm saying here is that money that is not currently allocated to a particular stormwater project be allocated to fund uh, the AECOM uh, recommended backflow valves uh, on the south side of Brisbane, including in my ward, including in uh, Councillor Shree's ward, including in Councillor Cook's ward. Um, I'm not sure about Councillor Strunk. I know Steve, or Councillor Griffiths doesn't have any. So there are several locations here that could be done. Um, I believe this is an important amendment. Council does not spend enough money generally on drainage. We have a $3.6 billion budget and there's only $30 or $40 million every year that's put into drainage. It's just not enough. Um, and we need to um, assist residents to live safely in their communities, to not experience flooding all the time. And that's what's going on in Yoronga. Every time there is heavy ra rain, major roads are cut because the drains can't cope. Um, so there's a capacity problem, which the LGIP projects would help fix. And two, um, there is a problem with backflow valve uh, flooding from uh, the drains and the rivers and the creeks. So this is an important project. Um, it is something I think our community expects from Council. Uh, if we uh, go to the effort of conducting a review uh, into the floods and then conducting a technical review into what will help mitigate flooding, uh, then Council uh, should be delivering on the recommendations of that review. Now, I say to my residents all the time, nothing will stop a river flood. If it comes over the top of the banks, um, you know, we're in a very low-lying part of Brisbane, parts of my ward, and the river flooding is devastating to the community. It's something I will never, ever, ever forget. It was distressing and difficult, um, and it's something I would not wish on anybody. Um, so I want to do everything in my power, whether it's through the LGIP, whether it's through the amendment process of the budget, um, to make sure that both drainage and backflow valves are delivered for those suburbs that deserve to have their infrastructure properly funded. So I urge all councillors to support the amendment. Further speakers to the amendment? Any further speakers? Councillor Johnson, five minutes. Okay. Three and O. I, I kind of hoped Councillor Davis, being a newer councillor, might have the courage to stand up and say something. I mean, even if she just stood up and said, I'll have a little bit of a look at it. I'll see what I can do. I'm only filling in for a few months. That would have been something useful. But no, she's got the LMP disease, which is just pretend that there's not a proper amendment put to the place. 
with a genuine issue of concern to our local community um, that deserves to be debated and discussed in a democratic place. Um, all of our oaths say that we should stand up and we need to represent not only our wards but the whole of the city. It's clear that the LNP councillors simply refuse to do that because they vote against motions in my ward all the time. In 11 years, there's one they voted for, um, and that's probably because the state embarrassed them into action in the end. Uh, so, you know, it's just not good enough when councillors who are elected in this place to discuss and determine how funds should be spent, rate payers' funds should be spent. Um, how, um, you know, not to even say a single word about it. Um, now, I've heard what the Lord Mayor said in the past. Um, he claims that there won't be many houses protected by these backflow valves. Um, you know what? Uh, just recently, in I think it's the Gap, Hilda Street in the Gap, uh, Council is installing um, new street drainage for residents because their footpath is lower than the road. First time I've ever seen council say they'll do something like that. Um, and it's a specific solution tailored to help two or three residences in a street. Um, yet an independent review of council after the floods and an independent technical report by engineers um, calling for uh, these improvements to be implemented. And this council ignores it. Why? Because quite a lot of them are in my ward. There are a lot in other areas as well, and obviously some have already been funded, um, including some in my ward. Uh, but I won't rest until they're all funded. So I just say to the LNP, it is gutless when you do not stand up and contribute to the debate on genuine issues of concern to our community. Um, it reflects poorly on you, and I'm sorry that Councillor Davis has got LNP disease, um, which appears to be uh, say nothing. We'll now put the amendment. All those in favour of the amendment, please say aye. Aye. Those against, please say no. No. The noes have it. Division. Division. Division called by Councillor Johnson and Councillor Griffiths. Please ring the bells. Councillors, all those in favour of the amendment, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. And councillors, uh, those against, please say no and raise your hand. No. Clerks, please read the results. Mr Chair, the noes have it. The voting being five in favour and 16 against. The noes have it. We'll return to substantive debate. Are there any further speakers? Councillor Huang. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. I rise to uh, speak in support of Program 3 of the 2021-22 budget on clean, green and sustainable city. Mr Chair, a recent Global Livability Index has placed Brisbane in the top 10 of the world's most livable cities. Can I, can I say this is a remarkable achievement, something we should be proud of, but we should always aim to make Brisbane an even better place. Mr. Chair, Program 3 of the uh, Srinath Council budget is laying the foundation to continue to invest in Brisbane's sustainable future. Brisbane has a strong record in investment in our environment. We are the first and the biggest carbon neutral government in Australia. We have continued to increase our green space coverage through bushland acquisition. And we have a budget program to facilitate the best outcome for our city. Mr. Chair, Program 3 has placed strong focus on de delivering sustainability and resilience initiatives for residents and businesses. 
implementing management and preparedness strategies to reduce natural hazard impacts, improving Council's environmental practices, maintaining Council's carbon neutrality, preventing and reducing pollution, protect, enhance, and restore Brisbane's natural assets, plan for, acquire, and develop our parks and natural areas, maintain the health of our waterways, river, and bay, also maintain, rehabilitate, and enhance stormwater drainage system. Mr. Chair, whilst we are all cheerful about Srinath Council's achievement and the continued investments in our city, I would like to place more focus on the investments that will be made in McGregor Ward. Mr. Chair, in 2021-22 budget, there are a number of significant park investments in McGregor Ward. In this budget, we will start a community consultation and concept design of new local recreation park Bessar Street Park, McGregor, following planning undertaken in 2020 and 21. Also in Springfield Street Park, McGregor, we will provide a picnic table improvements of the riparian vegetation and visual amenity of the park following planning and design undertaken in 2020, 21. And in this year, we will also see Blackwood Street Park, somehow it's commonly known as Major Drive Park in Rochdale, start the procurement and construction of a new local park in this place with signature playground and park facilities following community consultation planning and design undertaken in 2020 to 21. And I have handed in a petition um, on behalf of the Fisher family who was one of the original landowner of the area to name it Fisher Park when it's ready to launch. And we'll also progress with um, stage two of DM Henderson Park in McGregor with detailed design of the car park. We are also re replacing and upgrading aging park facilities in parks like Bolton Street Park in ML Plains where we will upgrade playground to current standards. And also in Macy Dixon Park in ML Plains, we are going to relocate and upgrade fitness equipment. Mr. Chair, over the years, I have placed strong focus on the waterway vegetation management in McGregor Ward. I believe everyone remembered the 2011 flood and the damage it has done to our city. But to McGregor Ward, flash flooding has done more damage than the 2011 flood. Since then, I have in every budget submission put in re requests to address the waterway vegetation management. Thanks to both Quirk and Shina councils, I was able to improve the waterway health section by section. This year, a number of priority sites have been selected in this program in conjunction with the locations identified as flooding hotspots via investigations. The proposed works involve vegetation management within major waterways to restore flood conveyance capacity and enhance the environmental values of the waterways with the introduction of native vegetation instead of weeds. Works will be carried out in selective flooding hotspots, hotspot sites along various creeks and its tributaries, including Pedestal Road, that is Bilimba Creek in ML Plains, and Thermal Street, that is Mimosa Creek, McGregor. Mr. Chair, these two hotspots are where Bilimba Creek meets Mimosa Creek. I remember after the 2013 overland flood, I did a site inspection with the officers, and I was told that because this is where the two creeks meet, whenever there's a heavy rain, there will always be a chance of flash flood. Since then, I have year after year put waterway management on my budget wish list, and I can report to the chamber with the support of the ad administrations, there was no overland flood, even when we had a number of, of severe weather conditions in the past few years. Mr. Chair, Brisbane is a city on the floodplain, and it is important that we be resilient, resilient and sustainable and provide as much information to the residents as possible. In this year's budget, Council continued to provide information to residents to help them be resilient, adaptable and prepared when faced with adverse natural events. In 2020 to 21, Council has optimized the floodwise information system to further improve council's ability 
to quickly and effectively respond to flood events. Council's floodwise information system is a web-based portal that provides real-time rainfall and water level data. Council uses this data to respond in the areas of disaster management, flash flooding response, and landfill management. The system also issues automated flood alerts via SMS email to internal council officers and externally to weather zone as part of the public early warning creek alert service. And we saw more than 732,000 floodwise property reports were downloaded by residents and industry. Council's floodwise property report are for residents planning to build on their property. The report shows the risk and the type of flooding at the specific property and include information to ensure future building and developments are in accordance with council building requirements. Council's flood awareness map were viewed more than 602,000 times. Council's flood awareness map helped residents and businesses, uh, business owners understand the likelihood of flooding to their property. And Council also provides information to help residents prepare for flooding and to minimize the impact flooding could have to homes, properties, and businesses. And we have also upgraded stream and rainfall gouges at Camo, Pijara Hills, Acacia Ridge, and Camo Hills as a new gouge at Enerly. Council's telemetry gouge gouges, measures, and report stream height and rainfall intensity information. This enables Council to improve our flood products and business operations. And there are 132 water quality results from recreational waterway sites reported to the public. Council monitors water quality at 11 sites in the Brisbane River and sections of Morton Bay, which have high rates of recreational value monitoring results are published online and warning signs are put in place when and when required. Mr. Chair, we cannot defy nature. We cannot defy the weather. But as a city government, it is important for us to keep the residents fully informed and prepared for the extreme weather. Through Program 3, I see that efforts by the Srinagar Council to make our city resilient and sustainable and now I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate Councillor Davis in uh, chairing the, uh, the, the committee whilst Councillor Cunningham is away. And you've done a fantastic job and congratulations to you. And Mr. Chair, I commend the program to the Chamber. Thank you. Further speakers, Councillor Griffiths. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, it was, uh, I, I rise to speak on clean, green and sustainable um, program. It was uh, interesting before when Councillor Johnston moved her amendments that the Lord, Lord Mayor and none of the LNP wanted to, um, wanted to debate that, and yet the Lord Mayor wants to get rid of urgency motions um, because he thinks there should be more debate in the chamber. So I just find it a bit ironical that, um, I find it a bit ironical that none of the LNP will debate these motions and a bit arrogant, probably. But uh, I, look, for me, this program, and I know there'll be a litany of um, LNP members uh, standing up and going through all the wonderful things they got um, from this program and how wonderful the Lord Mayor is for giving them all these things. Uh, I want to present the other side of the story is from a ward that misses out or has missed out. And in particular, there's a few items that are really um, quite upsetting for me because it's, it's a consistent pattern from the LMP uh, in their delivery. And um, I remember the last speech that Councillor Quirk gave in this place for his last budget. Um, he made an announcement about two sporting precincts being done up. One was on the north side, one was on the south side. And this was to increase the amount of sporting fields that we have and the use of those areas. And he named Nogra, and I thought, great, good, Nogra. And he also named Rockley. Well, one of them, there's been a proposal for tens of millions of dollars to be spent on that sporting precinct, and that is the one at Nogra. Mm -hmm. And it seems to have become a very difficult um, sporting precinct to work with. Rockley has never seen any money put into it. So those fields there are barren. Nothing has happened, no planning has happened. Um, and for me, that typifies how this administration works. 
Uh, and also, it's a missed opportunity. I know, like, there's political, you know, you're in Labor area, you're a Liberal area, but this is a missed opportunity uh, being so close to the city uh, for, for so many residents to have good sporting fields. Anyway, but the, uh, another point that I'd like to follow on from, and that is, uh, similarly, a master plan was done for the Acacia Ridge Mortem Road Sports Precinct, and it's been costed. My understanding is it's about $7.5 million to do this sporting precinct. Now, this is in a lower socioeconomic area. Uh, it is, we have a high number of refugees, a high number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, we have uh, a large multicultural population and we have a lot of kids in care and protection. And yet that sporting field, uh, which would benefit th that community so much, also just continuously misses out on funding. And I must admit, when I keep seeing and hearing, oh, we're spending $70 million on this new grand spanking in a city park, I think, well, what about $7 million for these people in a poorer community who don't have all the advantages of those people in the inner city. So we are spending $70 million in Victoria Park. We're spending $1 billion on tunnels <laughs> for, for Metro. And we're spending $500 million on, essentially, bike bridges. Um, so I just keep seeing this big wad of money being spent on infrastructure in the inner city and there's no expense spared, but when it comes to suburbs that actually need, uh, need services, we're failing there. And just to also um, <clears throat> draw, draw your attention, uh, another area, and I won't name the suburb this is in, but we have another area where we have a high crime rate in a park. Now I'm working with the, or council's working with the YMCA, we're also working with the police, a number of community agencies and a number of multicultural agencies. People feel unsafe in this park. They are unsafe in this park. There have been violent events in this park. And yet, can I get any funding to light the pathway through this park? No. No. And time and time again, um, I put it up, and time and time again, I can't get funding. So I don't know how we are meant to respond to these issues of crime and violence and working with other levels of government when our own council ignores these issues. And I'm not saying it's totally our issue, but that's something practical that this chamber could be, and this administration could be deciding to do, but instead they turn their head. Now, uh, one thing I, I found really interesting was there's money there for the off-road cycling strategy. Half a million dollars. There you go. So we went out, we had consultation with groups, and now Council will deliver what we're always going to deliver, and that is more trails in conservation areas. And that is, a, is distinctly at odds with the feedback from, from the conservation groups environmental group. It is distinctly at odds. And strangely enough, it's funded, it's funded under environmental areas of our city. So here we have environmental, sensitive environmental areas of our city, and we're seeing funding for this program put in there for trail bikes, for off-road bikes to be using those environmental areas. We know the damage that these bikes do when they get into sensitive areas. And um, unfortunately, we seem to have made, or this administration seems to have made, a decision about what it will be doing with that money. So I'm very... Point of order, Mr Chair. Point of order to you, Councillor Davis. Claim to be mis misrepresented. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Griffiths, please continue. I am very concerned. I am extremely concerned. I know when I've spoken with the environmental groups, they are extremely concerned about this $500,000 that's been put aside to run this program out. And it's almost like they haven't been listened to. It's almost like we did a consultation. We did a, sh we did a sham consultation, but we're going to do this anyway. Um, and disappointingly, I know there were a number of people on the other side of the chamber who were actively uh, supporting, actively supporting the bike groups and telling the bike groups, uh, the off-road cycle groups, get your numbers in because the environmental groups are getting their numbers in. So um, 
That's the sort of consultation that this administration is doing. Now, another point uh, that, that we raise consistently, and I think it's really important the residents of Brisbane know it, and I certainly repeat it when I'm speaking to environmental groups, but only 18 per cent of the bushland money that people collect is spent on bushland. Only 18 per cent. It's a sham. It's one of the biggest shams in the city, uh, other than what happened with the money in Councillor Adams' area. But it is a sham how we're using that money. And it's a sham that we're not buying more bushland with that money. In fact, we're using it for core services. And I know I heard even earlier today the Lord Mayor or, or someone talk about Brisbane being a koala capital. Well, I've uh, met with the chairperson. We've done a visit to a university, that's Griffith University. We've done a visit to the Environment Hub out there. We have car parking, we have a bus route there, we have enthusiasm, we have students, that's, and we have koalas dropping out of the trees virtually there. Dropping out of the trees. We, <laughs> we could literally, you walk along and you see koalas in the wild there. We could be using that as a spot on weekends. The university said work in partnership with us. We could be using that as a spot on weekends for residents to go and look at koalas at seven kilometres from the city. Now, I've spoken to the environment chair, and she's been very um, previous environment chair, and she's very open to the idea. And uh, I think I will continue. I will continue to pay for, uh, for groups to, to provide lead, lead walks through to look at the koalas. But I actually think for our city, this is an opportunity that all the resources are there. We just have to fund some staff to be there and we have an opportunity to really expand the magnificent work Griffith Uni is doing in terms of their environmental work and so forth. Uh, so, and, and we have this amazing opportunity to showcase, seven kilometres from the city, showcase koalas living in the wild, uh, actively sort of being happy and living and having a great life. So I think living their best lives in, in the bush in, uh, at Tarragini. So I will continue to push for that. I believe in that and I believe that's something as a city, it's an opportunity we should follow. Finally, the Brisbane Sustainability Corporation. I understand the logic of combining two of council's businesses. I am concerned about the funding that's being slashed through that program. We were committing $5 million. It doesn't look like we're doing that now. Um, I understand it as in terms of delivering infrastructure. Unfortunately, what I'm not seeing is the delivery of Councillor Griffiths, your of time has expired. Thank you. The further speakers, Councillor Hammond. Thank you, um, Mr Chair. I rise in support of Program 3. And first of all, I find it ironical, I suppose the word was from over the other side, um, that he's against Metro He's against green bridges. He's against cyclists. He's against park upgrades. And he's also against off-road cycling. Now, I understand that there's a balance between off-road cycling and also a conf um, conservation groups. And it is really, really important. And I'm, I'm sorry that there's so many drop bears on his side of town. Thank you, Councillor Owen. Um, <laughs> Off-road cycling is a growing sport across the world. There's other states, I'm not saying we're going to be like Tasmania or Rotorua or anything like that, but it is really important that we actually do the, um, the off-road cycling program to manage properly our conservation areas. Because what was happening, there was no strategy for off-road cycling. What was happening, there was illegal park, um, paths being put in through our area. There was trees cut down. Some of those paths were dangerous. They were illegal. We didn't know about them. We've had somebody who unfortunately had passed, um, who was killed on one of these um, off-road cycling because it was an illegal pathway. What the off-road cycling is, is about managing the use. So we're not cutting up our conservation areas, working with them so there isn't any more illegal um, uh, paths put in through these vital areas across our city, Mount Cutha to name one. Um, I know we see it um, on the north side as well, some of these pathways going through our areas, and this has to be managed. It's not easy to manage, but this administration, the Schrinner administration, is not about taking the easy pathway. 
It is about going out there and doing what's right and managing our areas. I understand that Councillor Griffiths says that we don't spend money on um, bushland acquisition. Well, I think there was over 750 hectares of 780, sorry, hectares of land um, bought in Brisbane in a four-year period. I know Councillor Griffiths always likes to get his mates and George Street out of trouble, and he wanted us to buy land to protect it from the state government or the drop bears, as he says, which I find offensive to our koalas, because seriously, they are the most beautiful animal and an icon of this city, and we are serious about protecting them. Working closely with the universities, not only to track our koala movement, but also to track the diseases, unfortunately, that our koalas have. So I commend the um, Shrina Council for doing the work they do for, counts, um, for our koalas across our city. And I say shame on you, Councillor Griffiths, of still trying to push the fact that we're not buying these habitats. So still pushing to save your mates down in George Street, to buy land that they already own. We know there's pegs in the ground. We know they want to sell this off. They're itching to sell it off. Instead, the state government could take their own responsibility and manage their land and protect the koalas that is on their land already, without the expense of the ratepayers of Brisbane. Now, Program 3 is again all about our suburbs, and I'm so happy to be part of the Schrinder administration. Let me go through some of the wonderful things that are happening in my part of the world in Marchant Ward. 7th Brigade Park, the exercise equipment is getting upgraded um, for um, $211,000. This uh, exercise equipment was the first in Marchant Ward. Um, and it was put in in 2009-2010 budget, and it is time, because it's so loved, it's time for this to get upgraded. Rainbow Lorikeet Park, a hidden treasure in Aspley area, is getting some money spent on barbecues to further enhance this beautiful parkland for the families who live around there. WA Jolly Park in Lutwich is have some money in there for a barbecue. Marchant Park, the the beauty of the Marchant Ward, um, thanks to George Marchant and his family for giving it to us. Um, we're spending some money to upgrade the roadway in through that park, um, and we will be looking at upgrading the gates there that have all our Boer War um, soldiers um, recognised there. Emerson Park Grange, I know that those opposite, Councillor Griffiths, is against park upgrades. Um, and enhancing our local green space, because he's already spoken against that. But can I say, Emerson Park is the home of Valleys Rugby League Football Club. Valleys are the most, their fields are the, the best in our city. We gave them extra land that used to be for the Grange Arches back in 2010. Um, and this money in the budget here is to actually upgrade and further enhance those fields. It is a strong juniors club, which is growing. It also has a senior team. They missed out on the weekend by a couple of, couple of tries, unfortunately. But they also have the women's team there now, representing um, uh, NRL, which is something that we all should be proud of, that women are getting um, more and more recognition for the wonderful sport they play. Bradbury Park, an iconic park. Um, I have spoken about this a lot, but it would be amiss of me not to recognise Andrew Ensby and his hard work. Because did everybody know or hear that the Magic Forest won an award, a landscaping award? Um, the runner-up, of course, was the Scooter Park, which was also highly recommended. Both of these projects, can I say, were designed by Andrew Ensby. So, Andrew, thank you for your ded um, dedication to our parks across our city, and I'd like to recognise your talent um, in this process, in the budget debate. Keep up the good work, because there is more and more parks to come across the area. Chalk Street Park, a brand new park for Lutwich. Um, this should be finished about August, September this year. Um, and again, I'd like to thank the council team um, for their hard work there to bring this park to life. I will give, we have been doing some consultation about names of the park, but um, following on from Councillor McLaughlin, that will be saved to the unveiling of the park. Um, there was three very, very special names put up. 
um, and there is one clear winner. Um, waterway um, Rehabilitation, 7th Brigade Park, another gem for the Marchant Ward, one of our biggest parks on the north side, um, is getting some work done on Downfall Creek. One of my residents, Cynthia, I'd like to thank you for the work that you're doing talking to our residents, because if there is a lizard or even an ant or a bird that she doesn't know about, it doesn't exist in that park. She's got everything mapped out, and I thank her for her dedication and passion for the local area. Frederick and Anne Park will be receiving some toilets. Um, as we all know, um, toilets are a little bit controversial when it comes to doing the consultation, but I'm here to say that we had clear um, support for the parks and look forward to going out and showing the residents of Chermside West the results um, or what the toilets are going to look at. For everybody here, the results were 66 um, people were in support and 18 people were not in support of the parks. Um, Mr Chair, this is the most wonderful budget. This is where our residents get to enjoy our beautiful green space. And again, I'm disappointed that Councillor Griffiths is against the Metro, against Green Bridges, against cyclists. They stand here all the time and tell us how supportive they are of our cyclists. But you heard him over there. He actually clearly said that he did not support the cycle work that we're doing in this city. Um, again, Point of order. I am this Point is, of order uh, to you, Councillor Grivers. Uh, yeah, just claim to be misrepresented yeah. grossly. Councillor <laughs> uh, 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 Hammond. Um, and again, it is disappointing that he is not supporting um, the off-road cycling. Um, it is a difficult um, uh, consultation that um, was led by Councillor Davis and Councillor Cunningham um, in this area, but it is very important to work and protect our native areas as best we can, and recognising that people actually want to go out there um, in a controlled way now that we can move forward um, for, for them to enjoy this sport that is, in, is increasing and that people actually travel all around the world with their hideously expensive bikes to actually enjoy this sport. Thank you. Um, I have a misrepresentation from Councillor Griffiths, but I realise that I actually forgot Councillor Davis a moment ago, so I'll call Councillor Davis and then I'll call yep. Councillor Griffiths. Councillor uh, Davis, uh, very quickly, please. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Chair. With regards to uh, Councillor Griffiths' comments around the $500,000 that was allocated for off-road cycling, uh, and that there is nothing there at all that will uh, benefit anything environmental in that space, had he listened to um, my contribution earlier, he would know that uh, this money is across a range of things. It's finding a balance between Th thank conservation. You, thank you, Councillor Davis. Thank you. Thank you, and Councillor Griffiths. Yeah, I, I don't uh, think, just in uh, response to um, the councillor who just spoke, um, I was going to say, yeah, I was going to say Councillor King, sorry, but Councillor Hammond, yes. Um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> my brain's a bit fried. fried. Um, I just want to say, I don't think at any point I actually said that I'm against uh, Green Bridges, that I'm against Metro. I just said how much is being, I'm against how much is being spent. For, uh, further speakers to the substantive matter, please. Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I rise to speak on this program, Program 3, and um, uh, I you know, want to put on, on record my disappointment for um, this uh, amazing lack of investment in uh, not just our suburbs here in Brisbane, but also, also the future of Brisbane uh, and how Brisbane will look uh, in, in the decades and generations to come. A couple of uh, local items um, that I think is particularly egregious that, that they haven't been funded, uh, and they're important ones and councils would know all about them uh, after hearing me for the last five years bang on uh, in this place about them, but they are extremely important. And the first of those is the Iron Bump and Lagoon, which, which should have been uh, funded under maintaining lakes and lake systems in parks. And uh, an enormous amount of work has gone into getting community support for a plan to uh, fix the water quality of that heritage-listed park and lagoon in the, in the heart of Sandgate. Uh, and an enormous amount of work then went into developing a plan, developing a management plan that was funded over the last couple of years. Uh, and council officers worked very hard uh, to come up with a plan uh, to make sure that the long-term health of that lagoon can be maintained. It's a uh, fairly closed 
um, system uh, right in the heart of Sandgate. If you go back uh, pre-development and pre-European uh, colonisation, uh, it was one of uh, four lagoons that were connected um, out, to the Morton, out to Morton Bay. Um, as development occurred and new roads were put in and drainage uh, was put in, it became a very closed system and over the last uh, couple of decades has been afflicted with um, terrible blue-green algal blooms uh, and a, a plan was developed over the last couple of years which would have made sure that uh, it is an asset for our community, not just in the Sandgate community but the broader north side who uh, like to come down to my community and, and enjoy its uh, enviable uh, bayside living uh, and, and weekend and uh, weekend culture down there. It, it is a broader Northside asset. It's heritage listed by council. Um, but unfortunately, what, what we've seen over the last uh, month or so is that that project now has blown out from the uh, expected around $1 million um, to be complete to, to the several million dollars. Now, I get that that's um, a big investment in our suburbs and a big investment in an important park and lake in a park. But it is about uh, ensuring that does have a great future and um, our outer suburban communities are well served by a council that uh, continues to raise their rates and continues to take more and more from those residents. Uh, and now are talking about, and in the latest Sandgate draft neighbourhood plan, talking about increasing densities uh, in and around Sandgate. The, the latest draft from this uh, LNP administration is for five storeys. Uh, in the Lagoon Street precinct, which is um, all around, all around the Iron Bump and Lagoon, so they're talking about increasing density uh, and putting more people living there, but not putting in the investment in our in our infrastructure and in our um, open spaces and our green spaces and, our, and in in our heritage spaces. So that is a particularly disappointing outcome for our community because uh, they are on board. The community are crying out for something to be done there. Uh, and it is so disappointing that it is falling on deaf ears when it comes to this Lord Mayor, Adrian Schrinner. And the other one, which is, um, I think, a, a no-brainer, that it should receive funding, and I'm, I'm sure uh, people would agree that the Brighton foreshore um, has been forgotten about by this LNP administration. Back in 2008, uh, an original commitment was made uh, to fund the upgrade of the Brighton foreshore. In 2011, when those floods came through, I've heard a bit about that today, that funding was set aside. It was in the budget. It was in the budget to be de delivered uh, in that financial year, and that money was set aside to, um, uh, to be spent on flood recovery works, and, and people were OK with that, because it was always a commitment that when that work was complete, that that project would be funded. So in 2012, the LNP promised that in that term, the 2012 to 2016 term, uh, that uh, that project would be funded, and it wasn't. And in 2016, the LNP committed once again that that project would be complete in the 2016 to 2020 term, and it wasn't. Uh, and again at the last election, this Lord Mayor, Adrian Schrinner, promised that the Brighton foreshore would be upgraded in this term, uh, and we are now on to that, onto the second budget being delivered by this Lord Mayor, and again, there is no money for a comprehensive upgrade. There is some money for further path works. It's not even the whole footpath. That whole shared path along the Brighton foreshore is not to Australian standards. Uh, it is not to any standards in council. It is crumbling. It is dangerous. There are no facilities along there. Uh, it is one of only two places in our city, along with uh, the rest of the foreshore there at the Sandgate Shorncliffe foreshore, one of only two places in our city where people can directly access Moreton Bay. There's the Wynnum foreshore and the Sandgate Brighton foreshore. But again, year after year after year, the LNP continue to ignore my community and they won't invest in those basic upgrades that people expect. They continue to pay more and more rates and they're getting less and less for it. And the most that this LNP administration can muster up is a bit of a bit of footpath work when a comprehensive upgrade is required there. And it's something that every LNP Lord Mayor in this place is committed to, but has failed to deliver. They have continued to fail um, to deliver. I'm not even sure uh, I would gladly welcome the Lord Mayor to come for a walk with me along the Brighton foreshore because I'm not sure he has even been there uh, ever. 
uh, full stop. I suspect he hasn't, because if he would actually go out there and actually see the state of that path uh, and see the injuries that people are sustaining, uh, talk, to, uh, talk to the old lady that came into my office bloodied and bruised because she'd been taken out uh, by a passing cyclist on that narrow path down on the Brighton foreshore, he might actually finally do something about it. But I'm not sure whether he goes out into the suburbs on the north side. I'm not sure. I, I suspect... Oh, he, he goes out to... I'm sure he sure didn't, um, sure didn't, I'm sure he didn't uh, attend uh, with the local councillor out there. No. No, Councillor Johnston. But uh, this is a great example, a great example of that suburban neglect we talk about. Uh, it, it's not a great outcome for the community, but I think it highlights that suburban neglect perfectly. And we've heard a lot of councillors uh, today get up and talk about Brisbane is now in the top 10 in terms of livability. Uh, and if they actually went past the headline, uh, that, um, that, 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 that um, top 10 uh, category that we have now joined uh, is specifically because of the state government's COVID response. Uh, it is specifically because it is, Brisbane and Queensland generally are open for business. And that's what, that's what that ranking actually talked about. It actually said because of the Queensland government's response in closing borders uh, and in keeping our city and our state safe, that we are now one of the most livable cities in the world today. Today, we are now one of the most livable cities. But will we be a livable city in the years to come when we continue to have underinvestment in our suburbs while we have record rates takes from uh, this LNP administration? Will we be a livable city when, when bushland acquisition is being starved? Will we be a livable city in the future when only 18 per cent of that money that this LNP administration is taking from ratepayers is actually spent on buying new land? We know why, over the last couple of years, that program has been so anemic is because it's been misused out in, out in the Holland Park ward uh, as an LNP slush fund. Exactly, uh, Councillor Johnson. We know it's been used to purchase cleared house blocks that have a couple of cocos palms on them uh, and allegedly, and, and a tennis court, and allegedly, and, and piles of rubble uh, from memory, and allegedly um, had koalas on site. Uh, and when we have, we have um, genuine bushland that is going begging, uh, like out at uh, 415 to 427 Beckett Road in the uh, acting environment chair's own ward, uh, that is a critical link, a critical link in the mountains to mangroves corridor that it, if it is developed, if it is developed, all of that wildlife that currently relies on it uh, will be done and dusted. And what kind of livable city will we have then, Chair, uh, when LNP councillors would rather misuse that, that bushland acquisition fund for their own political purposes than for genuine bushland purposes? And on carbon offsets, we had the acting chair say that they're really proud of purchasing 60-something um, percent of, of carbon offsets here in Australia. Well, the single biggest thing uh, that this council could do to uh, not only purchase and use local carbon offsets and get us to 100 per cent, 100 per cent local carbon offsets, will be to introduce FOGO, introduce a genuine food organics, garden organics system. Brisbane is ready to go. It is the single biggest thing a council can do to reduce dangerous carbon emissions, not just to make a council carbon neutral, but to make a city carbon neutral chair. Uh, and again, we see, we see this LNP administration rather, rather you, you buy a third of those carbon credits easily and cheaply from overseas instead of investing uh, in the kind of, of local investments that would drive jobs, would drive down carbon emissions and drive back revenue to this council. Further speakers? Perhaps Councillor Landers might. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Point, point, point of order, order Councillor Adams. Uh, adjournment. Yes, motion. please. Um, I move. Sorry. <coughs> excuse me, Mr. Chair. I move that this meeting of Council be adjourned until 9 a.m. Thursday, the 20. I'm getting excited. Fourth of uh, June, 2021. <coughs> Excuse me, it's been moved by the Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councillor Landers, that this meeting uh, now adjourn until 9am tomorrow, the 24th of June. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 All those against, please say no. The ayes have it. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>